Honourable Members, the Speaker. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations, the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The clerk. Government Business Notice No. 1, Broadcasting Legislation Amendment, Digital Dividend and Other Measures Bill 2011. The Minister for Infrastructure and Transport is the Minister representing the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I present the Broadcasting Legislation Amendment, Digital Dividend and Other Measures Bill 2011 and the Explanatory Memorandum. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Broadcasting Services Act 1992 and for other purposes. Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And I move that this bill be now read a second time. The Broadcasting Legislation Amendment Digital Dividend and Other Measures Bill 2011 introduces <coughs> amendments to the Broadcasting Services Act 1992, the Radio Communications Act 1992, the Australian Communications and Media Authority Act 2005 and the Copyright Act 1968. These amendments introduce measures to effectively implement a reorganisation of digital television channels to realise the digital dividend and to improve the regulatory framework for free-to-air digital television services provided on the vast satellite service and the switchover to digital-only television. On 24 June 2010, the government announced that 126 megahertz of broadcasting spectrum would be released as a digital dividend. The digital dividend will be released as a contiguous block of spectrum in the upper ultra-high frequency, or UHF band, in the frequency range 694 to 820 megahertz inclusive. This spectrum will become available as a result of the switch to digital-only television and the release of spectrum currently used for analogue television. Digital switchover will be completed in Australia by 31 December 2013. The spectrum, a UHF spectrum currently used for broadcasting services is highly valued for delivering wireless communication services including superfast mobile broadband. The government aims to auction the digital dividend spectrum in the second half of 2012, allowing successful bidders ample time to plan and deploy the next generation networks that are likely to use the spectrum. In order to release this highly valued spectrum, broadcasting services will need to be relocated out of the identified digital dividend spectrum and organised more efficiently within the remaining broadcasting spectrum. This process is known as restacking. On 9 July 2010, the Minister for Broadband, Communications and the Digital Economy made the Australian Communications and Media Authority realising the digital dividend direction 2010. The purpose of the direction was to provide the Australian Communications and Media Authority with policy guidance on the Australian Government's digital dividend objectives, to assist the ACMA to plan and implement the restack of broadcasting services as efficiently as possible, the Government proposes amendments to the Broadcasting Services Act and the Radio Communications Act to modify the existing planning process for television broadcasting services. 
The amendments will provide the ACMA with greater regulatory flexibility during the restack process and also enhance the ACMA's enforcement powers in relation to television broadcasting planning. The ACMA will also be given the power to make new planning instruments called Television Licence Area Plans for television broadcasting services. During the restack process, the flexible planning powers in these new instruments will allow the ACMA to plan a sequential restack timetable in a licence area. They will also allow temporary digital simulcasts, which may be necessary in metropolitan and larger population centres, where a significant number of television antennas may need to be reconfigured over a period of time. There will be a legislative deadline of 31 December 2014 to be known as the designated restack day for restack to be implemented in a licence area. This is one year after the completion of digital television switchover nationally. Provision will be made for the minister to extend the designated restack day in a particular licence area beyond 31 December 2014, but only where this is necessary for unavoidable technical or engineering reasons. From the date of the commencement of these amendments and until the designated restack day, the amount of consultation the ACMA has to undertake in respect of television broadcasting services will be reduced. This will allow the ACMA to focus its consultations on the criteria relevant to the restack and with those stakeholders directly affected by it. After the restack is complete, the broad planning and consultation requirements that apply in relation to all other services operating in the broadcasting services bands would apply again to the planning of television services. <coughs> The amendments would also give the minister the power to direct the ACMA by legislative instrument about the exercise of its powers to make or vary a television licence area plan. This power would enable the minister to give further policy direction and clarification to the ACMA in relation to restack if required. This specific direction's power will cease to have effect on the designated restack day for a licence area. The bill also introduces a number of amendments to the legislative framework for the new VAST satellite services licensed under section 38C of the Broadcasting Services Act. Proposed amendments to the conditional access scheme governing access to the VAST service in remote Western Australia will mean that viewers who reside in the larger television markets can only apply to access the VAST service if their reception of local, terrestrial, commercial, digital television services, once provided, is inadequate. This provides the remote commercial broadcasters in Western Australia with the opportunity to roll out their terrestrial digital television infrastructure and means that viewers in these areas would not need to purchase satellite reception equipment unnecessarily. But at the same time, the VAST service remains available for people in digital television black spots, ensuring they are able to receive the full suite of digital television channels. The bill also inserts provisions for determining whether de digital terrestrial television services in a particular area of Australia are deficient. The ACMA will be able to declare an area service deficient if, after a specified time after switchover, the number of terrestrial commercial digital television services, including digital multi-channels, is less than those required to be provided on the VAST service. Viewers in declared service deficient areas will then be able to access the VAST service to receive the full suite of digital television channels if they choose to do so. The bill would also introduce measures to make sure that viewers who have already purchased and installed satellite reception equipment and legitimately obtained access to the VAST service in a particular location because of digital television signal deficiency cannot subsequently lose that access at a later date if terrestrial digital television reception is extended to their location. The bill also introduces other minor amendments intended to improve 
the ACMA's oversight and administration of the conditional access scheme. The bill makes a minor amendment to the Copyright Act to clarify that, where a Section 38C licensee retransmits a broadcasting service other than the services the licensee is required to provide, that retransmission would be subject to the general broadcasting retransmission provisions of Part 5C of the Copyright Act. The bill makes a number of minor amendments in relation to the provision of digital television services and the digital switchover process. These new measures include assisting remote commercial broadcasters to provide the full range of free-to-air digital television services, including digital multi-channels such as Go, GEM, 72, 7 Mate, 1 and 11. In recognition of the significant costs of terrestrial transmission in remote markets, the new measures are intended to allow remote broadcasters to provide all of their digital multi-channels in standard definition before the end of switchover, although they may still elect to provide high-definition services. After digital switchover, television commercial broadcasters in these markets, like all other commercial television broadcasters, will have the option of providing any combination of standard and high-definition channels within their allocated spectrum. There may be circumstances where it is not feasible for some broadcaster transmission sites to be converted to digital. This will especially be the case where sites only serve very small communities or do not or will not transmit all of the commercial and national broadcasters' services in digital. The bill proposes amendments to the Broadcasting Services Act, under which commercial or national broadcasters may apply to the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy for exemption from converting these transmission sites to digital. Before granting the exemption, the Minister would consult with the ACMA and would need to be satisfied that viewers currently served by these analogue transmission sites would have access to alternative digital television options such as the VAST satellite service. Broadcasters would not be permitted to make an application in relation to digital terrestrial services that have already commenced transmission. In addition to these exemption provisions, the bill inserts new criteria the minister must consider when deciding to approve or reject an implementation plan to establish a new digital television service when a plan is submitted by a national broadcaster. The minister would be required to consider whether there are other means by which people in the area can view an adequate and extensive range of national broadcasting services, including by satellite, and whether other broadcasters operating in the area have or will be converting their terrestrial services to digital. The bill would make amendments to address regulatory issues that may arise where, for broadcast planning or other technical reasons, specific analogue transmitters may need to be switched off earlier than the switchover date in a licence area. The current power that enables the minister to determine digital-only local market areas does not have the flexibility to allow a commercial or national broadcaster to stop analogue transmissions in small geographical areas without technically breaching its digital conversion obligations under the Broadcasting Services Act. The bill would repeal provisions in the Broadcasting Services Act and the Radio Communications Act that require the Commercial Television Conversion Scheme to deal with the regulation of digital transmissions by commercial television broadcasting licensees from former analogue self-help retransmission sites. The issuing of licences for the transmission of digital services from former analogue self-help retransmission sites can be achieved through other regulatory mechanisms available to the ACMA, making those, these provisions redundant. Finally, the amendments in the bill would address an inconsistency between the Radio Communications Act and the Broadcasting Services Act in relation to licences for the transmission of commercial and national television broadcasting services after the end of the simulcast period in a licence area. The amendments to the broadcasting legislation introduced by this bill 
will progress the government's digital television switchover program and the restack of digital television channels to realise the digital dividend. The amendments will give further scope for the rollout of all digital television multi-channel services to all Australians, bringing truly equal television services to viewers in regional and remote areas for the first time, and will give the ACMA the tools necessary to successfully plan and implement the digital channel restack in cooperation with the broadcasting industry. And I commend this bill to the House. Ordered. The debate must now be adjourned. The member for Casey. I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Notice number two, Migration Amendment, Complementary Protection Bill 2011. The Minister for Immigration and Citizenship. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I present the Migration Amendment Complementary Protection Bill 2011 and the explanatory memorandum. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 and for related purposes. Minister. Mr Speaker, I move this bill now be read a second time. The Migration Amendment Complementary Protection Bill 2011 amends the Migration Act to eliminate a significant administrative hole in our protection visa application process. Under the Migration Act, as it currently stands, only those fleeing persecution for one of the five reasons outlined in the Convention relating to the status of refugees—race, religion, nationality, social group or political opinion—are eligible to receive a protection visa through the usual process. Applicants who fall outside these categories are not considered refugees and consequently their applications must be rejected by the Department of Immigration and Citizenship and also by the Refugee Review Tribunal. But some of these people are fleeing significant harm, be they women fleeing so-called honour killings or, in some certain circumstances, depending on the nation, people fleeing persecution on the basis of their sexual preference. These people can fall outside the categories recognised by our current protection visa process. So these, their applications will be rejected at the first instance and again at review, even where Australia's non-reform obligations and other international treaties ensure that we cannot and will not send them back to their countries of origin. And I agree with the honourable member. These treaties are the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhuman and Degrading Treatment of pu or Punishment, the CAT, and the Convention on the Rights of the, of, of the Child, the CROC. Protection from return in situations that engage our non reform on obligations under these treaties is known as complementary protection, in the sense that it is complementary to the protection given under the Refugees Convention. Under the current system, these people, who have often fled their countries in fear of their lives, must go through our administrative processes knowing they are going to be rejected. But at the present time, we make them go through a process of applying, failing, seeking review, failing again, just so that they are then able to apply to the Minister for personal intervention. As things stand, the decision to grant a visa in such cases may only be made by the Minister personally. The Minister cannot be compelled to exercise this power, and there is no requirement to provide reasons if the Minister does not exercise this power, and there is no merits review of the Minister's decision. As a result, as you can understand, the current lengthy process is a very time-consuming and extremely stressful one, Mr Speaker. So what this bill does is align our protection visa process with our international obligations and practices. In 2009, a previous bill, the Migration Amendment Complementary Protection Bill 2009, was introduced into the parliament and was considered by the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. That bill lapsed when the parliament was prorogued for the 2010 election. The present bill is based on the 2009 bill and incorporates certain changes to address matters raised in the report by the Senate and Legal Constitutional Affairs Committee. The introduction of complementary protection into Australia's protection visa process is supported by domestic and international stakeholders. It has been recommended by the Australian Human Rights Commission and several parliamentary committees. The 2009 bill received positive feedback from external stakeholders, including the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the Refugee Council of Australia and leading academics. 
The bill also brings Australia into line with many like-minded countries, including New Zealand, Canada, the United States of America and many European countries. Let me run through, Mr Speaker, briefly some of the key aspects of the bill. Protection visa applicants will continue to have their claims first considered against the Refugees Convention-related criteria set out in Australia's migration legislation. Applicants who are found not to be refugees under the Refugees Convention will have their claims considered under new complementary protection criteria. This approach recognises the primacy of the Refugees Convention as an international protection instrument and is supported by the UNHCR. The bill establishes a new criteria for the grant of a protection visa in certain circumstances that engage Australia's non refoulement obligations under the human rights treaties other than the Refugees Convention. Australia will not return to a place where there is a, a real risk that a person will suffer particular types of significant harm contained in the relevant human rights treaties, namely the arbitrary deprivation of life, having the death penalty carried out, being subject to torture, being subject to cruel or inhumane treatment or punishment, being subjected to degrading treatment or punishment. The prohibition of these types of harm are found in Articles 6 and 7 of the ICCPR and the second optional protocol to the ICCPR. non refoulement obligations may also be implied under the Convention on the Rights of the Child to the extent that the CROC contains obligations in the same terms as the ICCPR. In addition, an express non refoulement obligation in relation to torture is contained in Article 3 of the CAT. The bill defines many of these concepts to assist in assessing officers to assist assessing officers to interpret and implement these international obligations. These definitions will enable Australia to meet its non-refoulement obligations without expanding the relevant concepts in a way that goes beyond current international interpretations. Non-refoulement obligations are not engaged in every case in which a person claims they will suffer some type of harm if returned to another country. In each case, there must be substantial grounds for believing that, as a necessary and foreseeable consequence of being returned, there is a real risk that a person will suffer significant harm. The risk of significant harm must go beyond a mere theory of suspicion to give rise to a non refoulement obligation. A real risk of significant harm has been found in instances where there is a personal or direct risk to the specific person. This is opposed to a general risk faced by the population of a country that is not faced personally by the person claiming protection. A personal or direct, direct risk can be found in instances where the significant harm is faced by a broad group, so long as that harm is personally faced by the person seeking protection. The risk must also be a real one that the person would face throughout the country. If a person can reasonably be expected to relocate within their own country to access protection, then international protection is not required. Similarly, Australia's protection will not be necessary if the person can obtain protection from the authorities of their own country, such that there would not be a real risk of significant harm occurring. Australia's protection will also be unnecessary if the person can safely relocate to another country where they have a right of entry and residence. This legal threshold for Australia's non refoulement obligations is to, be to be engaged is reflected in the bill. The bill contains provisions to ensure that only applicants who are in need of Australia's protection will be eligible for a protection visa on complementary protection grounds. Unlike obligations under the Refugees Convention, Australia's non refoulement obligations under the ICCPR, the CAT and the CROC are absolute and cannot be derogated from. While Australia accepts that this is the position under international law, the government is committed to maintaining strong arrangements for protecting the Australian community. The bill is specifically designed to ensure Australia does not become a safe haven for persons who have committed war crimes or others of serious character concern. For this reason, specific provisions have been included in the bill to refuse the grant of a protection visa where there are grounds for considering that the applicant has committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, serious non-political crimes or other particularly serious crimes, or where there are grounds for considering that the applicant is a danger to Australia's security or the Australian community. These provisions mirror the existing exclusion provisions under Articles 1F and 33.2 of the Refugees Convention, which apply to refugee claims. By incorporating these exclusion provisions into the Migration Act, Australia will be following general international practice, particularly the European Union 
where similar clauses have been incorporated into most countries' respective legislative versions of complementary protection. International law does not impose an obligation on Australia to grant a particular type of visa to those people to whom non-reformal obligations are owed. In the small number of instances where non-reformal obligations would, would arise for persons who are excluded on security or serious character grounds, determinations as to post-decision case management will remain with the minister personally. In all circumstances, Australia is committed to meeting its non-reformal obligations in a way that best protects the Australian community. Where a person's protection visa application has been refused, including on the new complementary protection grounds, that person will be able to seek independent merits review of the decision within the existing merits review framework. There are a range of consequential amendments throughout the Migration Act that are, be, that are to be inserted into the bill. Amendments to the Migration Regulations 1994 will also be required to complete implementation of complementary protection in the protection visa subclass. Moreover, once this bill comes into effect, assessments under the protection obligations determination process for offshore entry persons will also take into account complementary protection. The Gillard government is proud to introduce this bill, which will provide a protection visa decision-making process that is more efficient, transparent and accountable. It does so by enabling claims raising Australia's protection obligations under the Refugees Convention and claims raising Australia's non-reformal obligations under the ICCPR, CAT or CROC to be considered under a single, integrated, timely protection visa process. Australia has a long and proud tradition as a protector of human rights and this bill presents us with an opportunity to continue in this tradition. I urge everyone in this House to support it. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The member for Sturt. I move the debate be adjourned, Mr Speaker. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order today for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister for Resources and Energy. Mr Speaker, I present the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage regulatory levies legislation amendment 2011 measures number one, bill 2011 and explanatory memorandum thereto. The clerk. Thank you. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage safety levies act 2003 and for related purposes. Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, this bill amends the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Safety Levies Act 2003, the Safety Levies Act to impose levies on offshore petroleum type titles to enable the National Offshore Petroleum Safety Authority NOPSA, to recover the costs associated with undertaking the regulatory functions in relation to the integrity and safety of wells and well operations conferred on NOPSA by a combination of amendments to the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006, which came into force in November 2010, and regulations made under the Act. Honourable members will recall that last year Parliament passed legislation augmenting NOPS's functions to include the functions conferred by the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act and its associated regulations with respect to the non-occupational health and safety structural integrity for facilities, wells and well-related equipment. The amendments gave NOPS regulatory responsibility for all aspects of structural integrity of petroleum facilities, wells and well-related equipment. The amendments also clarified that occupational health and safety duty of care applies to title holders in relation to wells and well-related equipment. NOPSA has responsibility for monitoring and enforcing the title holder duty of care. Following on from the legislative changes to NOPSA's functions and responsibilities, Part 5 of the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Resource Management and Administrative Regulations will give full effect to these changes by transferring regulatory functions and powers relating to the management of well integrity and well operations to NOPSA. NOPSA is funded on a full cost recovery basis with levies raised from the offshore petroleum industry. It is crucial that NOPSA is resourced adequately to undertake its functions. The uncontrolled release of hydrocarbons from the Montara platform in August 2009 
demonstrated that the regulator of offshore wells and well operations must have sufficiently skilled and experienced staff available to effectively and diligently discharge their regulatory responsibility whenever, I should say, wherever well operations are taking place. The levies that are currently imposed by the Safety Levies Act are facility-based, payable by the facility operator and confined to occupational health and safeties. These levies do not extend to funding NOPS's regulation of wells and well operations of title holders under the Offshore Petroleum Greenhouse Gas Storage Act and Part 5 of the Resource Management and Administrative Regulations. These new levies imposed by the Bill will ensure that NOPSA is able to recover costs associated with undertaking the extension of its regulatory functions. These new well-related levies, an annual well levy, a well activity levy and a well investigation levy are imposed by this bill. The annual well levy will recover NOPS's general regulatory costs associated with undertaking its functions in relation to the integrity of wells and well-related equipment. It will also cover NOPS's general costs associated with monitoring and enforcing compliance with the title holder, title holder occupational health safety duty of care in relation to wells. The well activity levy will recover NOPS's, associate, NOPSA's costs associated with the assessment and approval of specific well activities under Part 5 of the Resources Management and, Resource Management and Administrative Regulations. The well integrity levy will cover excessive regulatory costs reasonably incurred by NOPSA in, investiga in investigating well related incidents. It will also apply where NOPSA's costs when conducting an inspection in relation to a breach or suspected breach of the title holder duty of care in relation to wells exceeds $30,000. In light of the issues arising from the Montara incident, the Australian Government is committed to ensuring that NOPSA has sufficient powers and capability to effectively regulate all aspects of well integrity and well operations pending the establishment of a single national offshore petroleum regulator. Collection of these levies from title holders who carry out well operations will ensure that NOPSA is adequately resourced to fulfil its well-related responsibilities under the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act and associated regulations. The title of the Safety Levies Act will change to the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Act 2003 to reflect the expansion of its content to include levies relating to wells. Um, Mr Speaker, on that basis I move the second reading speech and commend the bill to the House. The question is that this bill be now read. You've got to put the sorry. The debate must now be adjourned. Sorry, I'm just making sure that we move the question. <laughs> Manager of Opposition Business. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is the question is that the resumption of the date be made an order of the day for the next sitting. The clerk. Notice number three, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Consequential Amendments Bill 2011. Madam Minister. Madam Deputy Speaker, I present the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Consequential Amendments Bill 2011 and the explanatory memorandum thereto. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to deal with consequential matters arising from the enactment of the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Legislation Amendment 2011 Measures No. 1 Act 2011 and for other purposes. The Minister. Madam Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. This bill amends the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 to deal with the consequential matters arising from the enactment of the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Legislation Amendment 2011 Measures No. 1, Bill 2011, Regulatory Levies Amendment Bill. The Regulatory Levies Amendment Bill amends the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Safety Levies Act 2003 to impose levies on title holders to allow NOPSA to recover costs associated with undertaking its augmented regulatory functions in relation to wells and well-related equipment. The consequential amendments to the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act in this bill will enable effective calculation and collection of the new well levies. In particular, the bill provides for application of a late payment penalty where either a well investigation levy, annual well levy or well activity levy remains wholly or partly unpaid 
after the day becomes due and payable. The penalty, is, the penalty is designed to ensure that levies are paid on time. Given the importance of NOPS's functions in regulating safety and integrity matters for the offshore oil and gas industry and the fact that it is funded through levies, it is critical that it is adequately resourced through the timely payment of levies by industry. Madam Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. The debate must now be adjourned. The Manager of Opposition Business. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is that resumption of the debate made in order of the day for the next sitting. The clerk. Tax Laws Amendment 2011, Measures No. 1, Bill 2011. The Assistant Treasurer has the call. I present the Tax Laws Amendment 2001, Measures No. 1, Bill 2011, an explanatory memorandum. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and the First Home Saver Accounts Act 2008 and for related purposes. The Assistant Treasurer. I move that this bill now be read a second time. This bill amends various taxation laws to implement recent disaster-related initiatives and improvements to Australia's tax laws. Schedule 1 makes exempt from income tax the disaster income recovery subsidy payments made to victims of the recent floods in Cyclone Yazi. The payments provided much-needed financial assistance to employees, small business owners and farmers who experienced a loss of income as a direct consequence of the flooding that commenced on or after the 29th of November 2010 and which affected Queensland, New South Wales, Western Australia, Victoria and South Australia, as well as Cyclone Yazi, which recently devastated Queensland. Schedule 1 also exempts from income tax the ex gratia payments to New Zealand special category visa holders who were affected by disaster in 2010-11, but due to their visa status were ineligible for a tax-exempt Australian Government disaster recovery payment. These ex gratia payments were made for disasters where the Australian Government disaster recovery payment has been activated and are of an equivalent amount. By exempting these disaster relief payments from income tax, the maximum amount of assistance is provided to affected individuals. A tax exemption for these payments is also consistent with the exemption provided for equivalent payments made in response to other disasters, such as the devastating Black Saturday Victorian bushfires. Schedule 2 provides an exemption from income tax for Category C payments made to flood-affected small businesses and primary producers under the Natural Disaster Relief and Recovery Arrangements. This measure recognises the hardship suffered by small businesses and primary producers in affected areas and provides certainty for recipients in terms of tax treatment at a time when they shouldn't have to worry about these tax matters. Schedule 3 increases the flexibility of first home saver accounts. M money in a first home saver account will be able to be paid into a genuine mortgage after the end of a minimum qualifying period should the account holder purchase a home prior to the release conditions being satisfied. Currently, if a first home, a first home is purchased before certain minimum release conditions are met, the first home saver account must be closed and the money in the account must be paid to the individual account holder's superannuation or retirement savings account. First Home Saver accounts are designed to encourage individuals through tax concessions and government contributions to save for their first home over the medium to long term and have been available since October 2008. The new law will allow the money in a First Home Saver account to be paid to a genuine mortgage after the end of a minimum qualifying period should the account holder purchase a dwelling in the interim. This change will further assist aspiring home buyers by increasing flexibility through allowing people to purchase a home earlier than planned and still be able to put the money towards their new home should their circumstances change. This measure will apply for houses purchased after royal assent. Full, full details of the measures in this bill are contained in the explanatory memorandum. The question is the debate must now be adjourned. The Manager of Opposition Business. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. All those of the opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is the resumption of the debate be made an order of day for the next sitting. The clerk. Notice number four, Therapeutic Goods Legislation Amendment, Copyright Bill 2011. The Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker. I present the Therapeutic Goods Legislation Amendment Bill 2011 and the explanatory memorandum. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Copyright Act 1968 and for related purposes. The Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you. I move that this bill now be read a second time. 
When prescription and other high-risk medicines are approved for marketing in Australia by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, a document known as a product information is approved for the use by health professionals. The bill amends the Copyright Act 1968 to ensure the long-standing practice of the TGA of approving product information that is in a similar form for all brands of a registered medicine can continue. These amendments reflect the government's concern that the important public health objectives of accurate, consistent information for prescribers and consumers might be jeopardised if some pharmaceutical companies claim infringement of copyright in the approved product information of their registered medicines in an attempt to delay market entry of their competitors' generic versions of those medicines. While this is only a recently emerging phenomenon, the use of copyright for this purpose has been identified as an issue that needs to be addressed. Product information contains technical information about the medicine, such as the characteristics of the active ingredient, its indications and contraindications, a description of clinical trials that support the indications, precautions, possible adverse reactions, dosages and storage, and other information relating to the medicine's safe and effective use. Its purpose is to assist medical practitioners, pharmacists and other health professionals to prescribe or dispense the medicine appropriately and safely, and to assist them to provide pa patient education about the medicine in support of high quality and safe clinical care. It is critical that doctors and pharmacists receive the same information when prescribing and dispensing all brands of the same medicine. It is therefore the Therapeutic Goods Administration's practice to approve a text for the product information of a generic medicine that is in a similar form to that approved for the product information of the original medicine. This avoids any perception that differences in the text of the approved product information for the different brands of a medicine reflect clinical or pharmacological variations in the medicine itself. Brand substitution policy was introduced in Australia in 1994 to encourage the use of generic medicines. The policy makes it possible to substitute where appropriate the prescribed drug brand at the time of dispensing in the pharmacy. This practice is a vital component of pharmaceutical policy in Australia as it contributes directly to improved access and affordability of pharmaceuticals to both the government and, more importantly, to health consumers. Timely availability of generic medicines is an essential feature of this policy. Any barriers that have the effect of preventing or delaying market entry of new brands or medicine, of medicines will have significant financial implications for both government and consumers by reducing the effectiveness of the, of the further reforms to the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme implemented under the National Health Amendment Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme Act 2010. Members will be aware that under these reforms, the first listing of a generic version of a medicine now triggers a 16 per cent reduction in the price the Commonwealth pays for that medicine. The reforms will provide an estimated $1.9 billion in savings to government and an average savings of ten, over 10 years to consumers of $3 per general PBS prescription. These savings will contribute to the sustainability of the scheme and maintain access to quality medicines at a lower cost to the taxpayer. Action by pharmaceutical companies based on a claim of copyright in product information can substantially delay savings to the government and Australian consumers because the price reduction trigger of the first listing of a generic version of a listed medicine on the PBS is absent. It can also artificially prolong any market exclusivity that the company may have had under the patent law. Recently, a number of pharmaceutical companies have taken or have threatened to take legal action alleging that the use by another company of product information approved by the TGA for a generic version of a medicine is an infringement of copyright. In 2008, an interlocutory injunction was granted by the Federal Court to a pharmaceutical company sponsor of a registered medicine partly on the basis of an argument that copyright is the in the approved product information for that medicine would be an infringement by a competitor's use of the approved product information for a generic version. The Federal Court hearing on this matter is scheduled for early March this year and will consider the issue of copyright in the approved product information of a registered medicine will be considered for the first time by an Australian court. In December 2010, in an apparent attempt to avoid the risk of similar litigation, the first generic version of a medicine was marketed without its approved product information being made available. 
Whilst this is not a breach of any existing requirements under the TGA Act, it is not conducive to the quality use of medicines and is not a desirable outcome for public health. If the marketing of this medicine had been prevented by an injunction, the PBS statutory price reduction would not have been triggered. Pharmaceutical companies currently receive appropriate patent protection for their medica medica medications under Australian law. Apart from the market exclusivity conferred under the Patents Act, the Therapeutic Goods Act includes measures that require a person applying to register a generic medicine to certify either that they believe on reasonable grounds that a patent will not be infringed by the marketing of the medicine or that the relevant patent holder has been notified of the application. Data protection provisions also prevent information provided to the Therapeutic Goods Administration in relation to a medicine containing a new chemical entity from being used to evaluate a generic product for a period of five years from the day on which that medicine was registered. The government believes these measures safeguard a fair return for the efforts of companies bringing medicines to market. The use of copyright injunctions to prevent generic medicines being marketed has the potential to provide the patent owners with a substantial additional period of market exclusivity after the patent has expired as copyright has a duration of at least 70 years from publication. This issue is not unique to Australia. Similar issues have arisen in the United States in relation to Federal Drug Administration's same labelling requirements for medicines under the Hatch-Waxman amendments in the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. These amendments were designed to facilitate the introduction of generic competitors once the originated drug patent term and exclusivity periods ended by allowing the generic producers to piggyback upon the originator's successful FDA application. The same labelling requirement was upheld by the Second Circuit United States Court of Appeal in 2000 in the Smith Klein Beecham consumer health care case, in which the court commented that the purpose of the Hatch Waxman amendments would be severely undermined if copyright concerns were to shape the FDA's application of the requirements. The court found that, as a consequence, that the same labelling requirements prevailed over copyright laws. I want to now turn just briefly to the actual amendments themselves. The bill will insert a new section 44BA into the Copyright Act 1968. The effect will be that actions under the Therapeutic Goods Act for the purposes of approving product information for the prescription and other high-risk medicines or of approving variations to approved product information will not be an infringement of copyright subsisting in any product information previously approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. This will ensure, for instance, that an applicant for the registration of a generic version of a registered medicine will not infringe copyright if it provides a draft product information document that contains text similar to the product information already approved for that medicine. This exemption would apply irrespective of when the product information was approved, that is, whether it was approved before or after the amendments come into effect. Secondly, the supply, reproduction, publication, communication or adaptation of any approved product information of a registered medicine will not be an infringement of copyright in any other approved product information where such an act is done for a purpose related to the safe and effective use of the medicine concerned. This exemption would apply to such acts irrespective of when the product information was approved. It would cover, for instance, the acts of the Commonwealth including by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, pharmaceutical companies and healthcare professionals and all those involved in making product information available to health professionals. The infringement exemption will only apply to acts done after the commencement of the amendments. The bill includes a so-called historic shipwrecks clause, which ensures that if the amendments would result in the acquisition of property from a person otherwise than on just terms, the Commonwealth must pay reasonable compensation to that person. This provision has been included as a precautionary measure to ensure constitutional validity and does not indicate that such a result is likely. Exempting particular acts from infringement action under the Copyright Act is not done lightly. The proposed amendments reflect the importance the government places on ensuring the highest level of health consumer safety through the provision of accurate information to prescribers and other health professionals about higher risk medicines. The only other exemption of this kind in the Copyright Act relates to the use of approved labels on containers for agricultural and veterinary chemical products. The amendments go no further than is necessary to ensure that the TGA can continue to approve product information that is in a similar form for all versions of the same registered medicine. 
The government believes that these amendments will restore the appropriate balance between ensuring safe and timely access to medicines for all Australians and encouraging research and development in the pharmaceutical industry through appropriate protection of intellectual property. I commend the bill to the House. And I commend the Parliamentary Secretary for Health and Ageing for getting through that with everything else going on around her. The debate must now be adjourned. The manager of opposition business. <laughs> I move that the uh, debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. All those that opinion say, ah, oh, to the contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. The question is that resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The manager, the leader of the house. Thanks, uh, Madam Please Deputy see, Speaker. Please. I ask the leader of the house to move a motion to suspend so much of the standing session orders as was as would prevent the Paid Parental Leave Reduction of Compliance Burden for an Employer's Amendment Bill 2010 Private Members Business to report, be reported from the main committee and considered immediately. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There is no objection. The Minister. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Paid Parental Leave Reduction of Compliance Burden for an Employer's Amendment Bill 2010 Private Members Business to be reported from the main committee and considered immediately. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I have to report that the paid parental leave reduction of compliance burden for employers' amendment bill has been considered by the main committee and has been returned to the House for further consideration. I present a certified copy of the bill. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Dunkley. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Um, in summing up the debate on the Coalition's private members' bill paid parental leave reduction of compliance burden for employers' amendment bill 2010, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of all members to the debate. I particularly want to recognise the contribution of the members for Farrah and Forrest for their very clear articulation of the Coalition's clear desire not to in any way delay or impede eligible recipients accessing the government paid parental leave payment entitlements. Coalition members reiterated how this bill is solely about reducing the compliance burden on employers in the processing and delivery of those payments. The member for Forrest highlighted the great the demands Barker, on employers in her electorate, particularly on small business people. Ms Marino spoke about how employers already face challenges in replacing a valued staff member who is absent on maternity leave, and how the last thing a workplace facing this change and adjustment needed was additional and unnecessary red tape and compliance burdens. The member for Farrah emphasised how the government's current arrangements has the Family Assistance Office administering the payments in a more user-friendly process that is, in fact, the very administrative arrangements that has supported the government's boast about the success of the paid parental leave scheme. Ms Lee correctly identified the central role of the Family Assistance Office and how it will continue to play a role in receiving PPL applications, handling queries, resolving eligibility concerns and making payments to employers simply to have the employer on pay what the FAO determines to be the correct amount. The bill simply seeks to retain the Family Assistance Office as the government payment agency for the government PPL payments and not have the PPL pay clerk role and all of its associated costs, risks and compliance burden handballed from the Commonwealth to all employers from 1 July. Employer organisations, the small business community, payroll professionals, business advisers and managers are deeply concerned about being forced to be the pay clerk for the government's paid parental leave scheme because of the costs, the red tape, the compliance burden and risks this will impose. These unnecessary and avoidable costs and risks include the need for employers to become familiarised with their obligations and responsibilities under the government scheme, to make necessary changes to payroll and accounting systems, to undertake staff training, to seek advice, to receive, handle, process, account for and pay instalment amounts in a timely way, to attend to the compliance, verification and reporting requirements, and to absorb the opportunity costs of all of this displaced effort and resources that take people away from the business of running their businesses. The government brushes away concerns. It simply brushes away these concerns as yet another layer of compliance and yet more government-imposed things on a small business owner that they need to do, distracting them from nurturing their businesses, creating employment opportunities and contributing to the economy and their community. 
The Gillard Labor government sees these genuine and legitimate employer concerns as unimportant and unsubstantial, suggesting they represent a very little imposition on businesses. The government says all that is needed is for an employer to make payments through their normal payroll system. Yet it ignores the impact and complications of its other arguments about other aspects of its paid parental leave scheme, such as no superannuation being paid on PPL payments, how amounts paid aren't to be included in pay payroll costs for payroll tax and workers' compensation purposes, how only the processing of PPL payments is expensable. Little wonder many businesses report that their payroll and accounting software providers have yet to come up with systems changes to accommodate this whole new arrangement of money coming in from the government just to be passed on and the complex reconciliation tasks that sit around it. Despite all of these real and quantifiable impacts on employers, the government continues to defend its decision to impose this PPL pay, pay clerk burden on employers on the basis that forcing its bureaucratic arrangements onto employers will help employees stay more connected with their workplace relationships. As Amy Linden, respected advocacy advisor for the Australian Business, Network, Business Women's Network, pointed out in her February 16 analysis, and I quote, depositing money into one's account does not constitute a relationship. Only an out-of-touch Labor government would claim that forcing employers to spend scarce time and money changing systems and passing on government-funded payments that appear as an anonymous electronic transfer amount in an eligible recipient's bank account helped women to, quote, to remain connected to their workplace. The government falsely uses return to work data that shows a person is more likely to return to work after an addition to the family to back its scheme as employers paymasters as uh, would, sorry, to back its scheme suggesting that employers as paymasters helps return rates. What nonsense. It is not who undertakes the keystrokes to see payments appear as an electronic payment entry in a bank statement that influences return to work rates. It's the family-friendly nature, the size, the flexibility offered by the overwhelmingly large and government employers, fortunate to be able to offer voluntary PPL benefits that supports a higher return to work rate. Another argument advanced by the government for relieving the government fa family assistance office of its current payment processing responsibility and forcing employers to take on this bureaucratic burden is it will somehow help to image the payments as something other than a government-funded family support payment. The government has given this dubious rationale no prospect of credibility as it spends extensive taxpayer money on its extensive government-funded advertising campaign to make sure everybody knows that they are government-funded PPL payments. The government can produce no evidence no evidence to support this impost of yet another new red tape burden on employers and simply dismisses legitimate costs and compliance concerns as unimportant. This is yet another example of Labor's indifference to the legitimate concerns and interests of the small business community. This indifference has seen 300,000 jobs lost in small business since the election of the Rudd-Gillard Labor government, according to the most recent ABS figures. I've heard some commentators simply parrot on about the Productivity Commission as justification for imposing the PPL pay clerk burden on employers. For those time-poor crossbenchers, none of whom are here today, but for those time-poor crossbenchers with many issues on their plates and government briefings designed solely to advance the government's interest and agenda, let me recap some of the issues the Productivity Commission actually considered. Interestingly, the ACTU, in its Productivity Commission submission, page 33, May 2008, stated that, and I quote, the simplest administrative system would seem to be that the government provides the safety net component to all new mothers via the existing welfare system as it does with the baby bonus. Employers would, need it, would provide any additional top-up payment to employees as per their usual methods. That seems to back the coalition's position. In its final report on the productivity from the Productivity Commission, it recognised that the staying close and signalling benefits argument that the government's offering are hotly contested by employer groups. On page 8.34 of the Commission's final report, it is very cautious, very cautious and very qualified in concluding that, and I quote, benefits from assigning payment responsibility to employers are sufficient to favour the approach over direct government payment 
in most cases. The Commission recognised that small businesses would be burdened most by the imposition of the PPL pay clerk role, but comforted itself by suggesting there's only a small percentage of small businesses that might have an employee eligible for PPL and that that somehow made it less of a concern. This does not negate the need to prepare for this PPL pay clerk role, and the significant proportion of potentially eligible PPL recipients that work in sectors where the majority of employers are in fact smaller businesses. This issue and the government it won't happen much argument have been strongly challenged even in Centrelink's own implementation consultation processes where the data they relied upon has been challenged time and time again. If a very contested, qualified and cautioned on balance view from the Productivity Commission is thought to be persuasive on how a crossbencher might vote on this issue, then an adamant, forcefully put view by the Commission must be a knockout and give all members the opportunity to vote in favour of this bill. And guess what? The Commission has offered that knockout conclusion that I draw the crossbench's attention to. We know the government's failed to provide any and the, government, <laughs> the, the manager of government business quite rightly notes there's no crossbencher here. So we've sought to inform them about these things and we'll wait to see if it's persuasive. The government's failed to provide any persuasive justification or considered account of the likely benefits, yet there are clear and uncontested costs and risks of its approach. There's not a single credible reason to impose this pay clerk burden. And when the Senate originally amended the paid parental leave bill to embrace the measures contained in this private member's bill, the shrill and over-the-top government response gives us something to think about. The government said that if the Senate insisted on protecting cash-strapped and time-poor businesses and guarding against a further risk of discrimination against women of reproductive age in the workforce, it would delay the entire introduction of the paid parental leave scheme. Correcting this bureaucratic nonsense from the government the government threatened to delay the entire paid parental leave scheme. I cautioned at the time that there must be more to this when the government was prepared to reveal at the time, given the shrillness and its insistence. At the time, I argued there was another motive. The government failed to rule out the imposed employer as the pay, PPL pay clerk burden as the enabling machinery to change what is currently an encouragement for employers to top up Labor's deficient scheme to fitting them up with the tools needed to oblige them to top up the taxpayer-funded minimum wage payment. And it has emerged that I was right. The gov this government-imposed PPL pay, pay clerk burden is just the start, the thin edge of the wedge, of the costs and obligations employers will face under Labor's deficient and flawed paid parental leave scheme. A secret internal union circular reveals the true reason behind the coordinated Labor and Union attack on this common-sense private member's bill that the Coalition has proposed that would see the Family Assistance Office continue to implement the government scheme. In that circular, it said we must oppose Bilson's bill. And it went on to say, and I quote, because it would, I quote, restrict unions' capacity to improve and enforce PPL in the workplaces. It is now clear that the government's motive for imposing the paid parental leave pay clerk responsibilities on employers is to assist a union campaign to force employer co-payments to top up the deficient government scheme to full replacement wage levels plus superannuation. This is confirmed by a subsequent ACTU release. The release said it's time to unite against, plan against plans to undermine paid parental leave scheme. That's what our bill is supposed to be doing, apparently, and it attacked my bill. Where the, but the union movement conceded that its agenda is indeed to campaign for, and I quote, to achieve full income replacement, adding that many enlightened employers are already topping up the scheme to full income replacement, but where they do not, unions will actively campaign through collective bargaining to achieve that goal. Now, co-payments co -payments is the purpose behind fitting up employers. Cross members Cross members who are not here today, so persuaded by the most ambivalent and inconclusive, on balance, cautious, hesitant conclusion of the Productivity Commission, I invite them to consider this. The Productivity Commission has warned, and I quote, 
the biggest dangers of employer co-funding of paid parental leave is discrimination against women of reproductive ages and, in the shorter term, the financial pressure on cash-strapped employers. Nothing could be clearer. The Productivity Commission is absolutely clear on that as a concern. That alone should be enough for all members in this House who are concerned about small business viability and concerned about women's work opportunities to vote in support of the Coalition's bill. But what we see is the Gillard Labor government and union <coughs> pact, a self-serving pact about helping along an industrial campaign to force on and up employer co-payments, despite the clear warnings from the Productivity Commission that this will harm cash-strapped small businesses and workplace opportunities for women. Now, Labor seemed to be alert to this when they were in opposition, and they sought to provide some comfort for people who were legitimately concerned about this. In a joint 13 July 2007 media release, Maternity Leave was what it was titled, with Jenny Macklin, Tanya Plivacek and Julia Gillard, they stated, and I quote, Labor will not support a system that imposes additional financial burdens or administrative complexity on small business or in any way acts to discourage women, the employment of women. Now, Labor is doing exactly what they promised it wouldn't do. The Queensland state Labor government has written to the Gillard government stating, and I quote, mandating employers to take over paymaster function after the six months period is a costly and time consuming administrative issue for employers, particularly those who operate small business. And the, and the Queensland government urged the Gillard government to change its ways. Every member in this House should be voting for the Coalition Private Members Bill. If they were listening to the small business community, respected the wishes of the Queensland government and wanted to help the Prime Minister, Minister Macklin and Minister Plibersep keep their promises, they need to look after the interests of the small business community. All members should be supporting this Private Members Bill in the House. I commend the bill to the House and I'm confident right-minded people will vote for expired. it. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. All of those of that opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. <laughs> the ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
<coughs> Order. Lock the doors. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Barker and Parks tell us for the ayes, and the members for Fowler and Shortland tell us for the noes. and the member for Werriwa. Member for Robertson. It would assist the tellers if members would face the front. Thank you.
Order. The result of the division is I 69, no 70. The question is therefore negatived. Would members please return to their places or leave the chamber quickly and quietly? Can I just point out that I'm actually standing on my feet because I actually have to read something? I know I'm short. I actually accept this, but could people either sit or move out really quickly? Sit down. <laughs> sit down. No, it's a lesson we all need to learn. On behalf of the Committee of Privileges and Members' Interest, I present the committee's report entitled Report Concerning the Registration and Declaration of Members' Interest During 2010. I move that the report be made a parliamentary paper. The question is that the report be made a parliamentary paper. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I thank everyone for their assistance. The clerk. Business notice number five, fit out of new lease premises for the Attorney General's Department at 4 National Circuit, Barton, ACT. The Special Minister for State. Speaker, I move that in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Committee Act 1969, it is expedient to carry out the following proposed work, which was referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works and on which the committee has duly reported to Parliament. The proposed fit out of new lease premises for the Attorney General's Department at 4 National Circuit, Barton, Australian Capital Territory. So, Speaker, the Attorney General's Department proposes to undertake a fit out of new lease premises at 4 National Circuit, Barton, in the Australian Capital Territory at an estimated turnout cost of $18 million plus GST. The National Office of the Department is located in the recently completed building at 3 to 5 National Circuit, Barton. The Department still occupies five leased properties, three of which are over 20 years old and require major refurbishment to meet Commonwealth environmental efficiency and space utilisation standards. The new building will be constructed on the southern portion of the former Robert Garron Office's site. The Patents Office building, which is located on the northern portion of the site, is heritage listed and has been recently refurbished. The development will provide approximately 29,800 square metres of high quality office space, of which the Attorney General's Department will occupy approximately 8,000 square metres. In its report, the PwC recommended that these works proceed, subject to parliamentary approval and to the satisfactory pricing of the tendered trade packages. The fit out will be undertaken concurrently with the base building construction which commenced in September 2010 and is scheduled for practical completion in June 2012. Occupancy is expected to occur in July 2012. Current leases have been structured to expire no earlier than mid-2012 to avoid the risk of penalties associated with short-term holding leases. On behalf of the government, I would like to thank the committee for its support and I commend the motion to the House. The question is that the motion be moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Notice number six, fit out of new lease premises for divisions of the Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research at buildings two and three, Precinct Corporate Centre, 105 Delhi Road, uh, North Ride. The Special Minister for State. Speaker, I move that in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Committee Act 1969, it is expedient to carry out the following proposed works, which was referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works and on which the committee has duly reported to the parliament. Proposed fit out of new lease premises for divisions of the Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research at buildings two and three, Precinct Corporate Centre, 105 Delhi Road, Riverside, Corporate Park, North Ride, New South Wales. The Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research proposes to undertake an integrated fit out of a new leased facility at North Ride, Sydney, to accommodate fully serviced laboratories, testing and analytical facilities and support office space. The fit out will ensure the building is appropriately tailored to the scientific and operational needs of the department and will allow three leased Sydney properties to be replaced with a single new fit for purpose facility. The proposed development will confirm to all relevant building sorry will conform 
to all relevant building and laboratory codes, including compliance with laboratory occupational health and safety requirements. The facility will accommodate about 240 staff. When complete, the building will have 10,270 square metres of floor space, including offices, laboratories and sample receipt areas. The total estimated cost of the proposal is $25.66 million plus GST. It is proposed that the building be fitted out to accommodate the activities of the National Measurement Institute, the Australian Astronomical Observatory and an Enterprise Connect Manufacturing Centre. It is subject to parliamentary approval. Fit out, customised to the department's specific needs, will continue as the building construction progresses. Occupancy of the building is scheduled in two stages, with stage one commencing late May 2012 and stage two in August 2012. In its report, the Parliamentary Works Committee has recommended that these works proceed. On behalf of the government, I'd like to thank the committee for its support, and I commend the motion to the House. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Tax Laws Amendment, Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill 2011, Resumption of Debate on the Second Reading. Before the debate is resumed on this bill, I remind the House that it has been agreed that a general debate be allowed covering this bill and the Income Tax Rates Amendment, Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill 2001. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. If I don't have a speaker, I'm the member for Wentworth. Speaker. Oh, you are of great assistance. <laughs> You're always happy to oblige uh, the chair. Uh, this, uh, this bill is presented, or this measure is presented, as an effort in friendship, in mateship, the Prime Minister has described it as. But what it represents is nothing more than an admission of the failure of this government to exercise the necessary and appropriate fiscal discipline that confronting a natural disaster like this requires. It is perfectly plain that the government has more than enough capacity to rearrange its priorities so as to be able to fund the entirety of the forecast $5.6 billion of reconstruction funding without having the need to impose this additional tax. And indeed, it is for that reason that there is not, to my knowledge, one economist, financial commentator, or expert in public finance that has not condemned the flood levy. Now, we understand, of course, why the government has sought to impose this levy. It doesn't need to financially. It can find other savings, and I'll come back to those in a moment. It is done so for a purely political purpose. It is done so for the purpose of enabling the Prime Minister to say, look, I took a tough decision, an unpopular decision about public finances. I was prepared to impose an unpopular tax uh, on the Australian public in order to defend the budget. And that is the, the brownie point, the, the, the fiscal gold star of good uh, public finance governance that she's seeking to establish for herself. But all of us recognise that this levy is about politics, it's about image, it has got nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do, with good public finance, with the responsible management of Australian taxpayers' funds. Madam Deputy Speaker, the government focuses on the budgetary outcome, and indeed everybody does. Uh, but in the real world, uh, the, the world of the private sector, while 
companies do focus naturally, and accountants do, on accounting profit and loss—the sort of the equivalent of of what the budget outcomes are here. Uh, good managers are most focused on cash flow, on how much cash, free cash, is available to a business, and what the requirements on a business, uh, cash requirements on a business are, whether they are for operating expenses or for capital, they all require funding, they all require resourcing. Now, the cost, the very substantial cost of the construction of the national broadband network is presently not going through the budget. It's not going through as expenditure because we are presented with the myth that this is simply taking one asset, cash, which of course is funded by borrowings, and turning it into an asset, uh, which, so the myth goes, is worth the same amount that is being spent on it. Now, at some point, uh, hopefully not too long, the Australian National Audit Office will have a close look at this and will conclude that the asset that has been created in the NBN for tens of billions of dollars is not worth anything like that which has been spent on it, and an appropriate write-down write will have to be taken. But for the time being, this uh, expenditure, funded by borrowings on the NBN, is not being seen, is not being recognised in the budget uh, as an expenditure and therefore is not contributing uh, to the deficit. However, it is all cash. It is all cash. And the truth is that the government could, if it were, uh, if it were minded to live up to its own principles and its own rhetoric, if it were minded to undertake a cost-benefit analysis on the whole issue of providing universal affordable broadband, the billions of dollars it would save as a consequence of that exercise would be a multiple many times of the $1.8 billion proposed to be raised by the flood levy. My recollection, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, is that the, NBN's, the combination of the NBN's capital expenditure and operating losses over the next two years is in the order of six and a half or seven billion dollars. A slight rescheduling of that, even if, for example, a Productivity Commission cost benefit analysis study were undertaken and were only to make a minor, a small adjustment uh, to that expenditure, you can readily see that we would be able to find the $1.8 billion in savings. So there is ample scope, ample scope, to fund uh, this flood levy. Now, the recourse to taxation is, of course, a a, uh, a reflex uh, of this government. We're facing, at the moment, uh, the prospect of the mining tax, uh, which the design of which uh, appears to be even more incompetent or inept than its predecessor the uh, resource super profits tax. This is a government that is addicted to taxation and unable to exercise the fiscal discipline that is required of an Australian government. Nas apart from national security, which of course is the highest responsibility of any government, there is no more important responsibility of any Australian government than managing the public finances of the nation. Now, we are a remarkably fortunate country in the sense that we were able to come through the global financial crisis with, uh, with, with relatively, relatively uh, little negative impact on employment and economic activity compared to other countries. We had a, we had a couple of bad quarters, uh, but overall we came through it very well. And the conclusion, the, the, the universal uh, a conclusion of why that was so, is basically down to three factors. 
one of which was the first one was that we went into the crisis with no public debt, no government debt at the central government level. In fact, we had cash at the bank. That was entirely due to the fiscal discipline, the sound financial management of the coalition under the leadership of John Howard, entirely due to that good economic management. The second factor was that our banks were not imperilled by imprudent lending. There was no subprime mortgage phenomenon in Australia. They did not engage, uh, they did not invest, as European banks did, in the high-risk uh, subprime securities uh, issued out of the United States, and they were well regulated. Uh, even at the, the depth of the crisis, uh, defaults, uh, housing defaults, mortgage defaults in Australia remained at very low levels. Now, that is a con now I, I take nothing away from the good management of the banks and the bankers themselves. They, they, they steered their institutions through difficult times very well. But nonetheless, the regulatory framework that ensured that the risky activities seen in the United States and Europe did not occur here was one that was set up under the coalition, under the supervision of our then Treasurer Peter Costello. So there are two of the three factors that I'll come to the third in a moment that were, on any view, entirely a consequence of responsible economic management by the previous government. Now the third factor, which is a very important one, is that China <coughs> uh, continued to grow strongly uh, and continued to provide uh, you know, strong, strong demand uh, and growing demand for our natural resources, in particular iron ore and coking coal, metallurgical coal. Now, that, uh, the, the China relationship is one that uh, the previous government put a great deal of effort into and certainly was never warmer or stronger than it was under the leadership of John Howard. But I don't seek, uh, Mr Speaker, to take for the, our side of politics to take all of the credit or indeed most of the credit for the uh, good trade, good terms of trade uh, prompted by the China boom. That's largely an external factor. But nonetheless, two of the three reasons why we came through the GFC so well are very are fundamentally the responsibility and the consequence of sound economic management by the previous government. By contrast, when this government came into office, it immediately began to recklessly spend and dissipate the benefit, the bounty that it had received from the Howard government. The, uh, the cash handouts were an example of reckless spending. The building the education revolution, the Julia Gillard Memorial School Hall program, is now a byword for recklessness. The, the tragically incompetently managed Pink Bat program that uh, the member opposite presided over not only cost lives, young lives, but cost billions and billions of dollars. And we, we have to say uh, the clean-up of that, the rectification of those problems is going to cost more billions and will take many years. These measures have all contributed to the level of public debt that we now have and to the recklessness, the financial recklessness of this government that stands in contrast to that of its predecessor. So it is no wonder that Australians are appalled by the flood levy. Australians are very generous and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars have been given uh, voluntarily to support the victims of the floods in Queensland and New South Wales and Victoria. And I want to commend the generosity of those Australians that have, been, that have done that and, of course, the aid agencies, the Red Cross and the Salvation Army and so many others that are working so constructively in those communities using those funds. 
But when they see this government that has been so reckless in its expenditure in the past, so wasteful, refusing to exercise any financial discipline at all, and going off and raising another tax, they say, here is a lazy, wasteful government, a lazy government that is not prepared, that has never been prepared, not in the first term nor now in the second term, to exercise financial discipline. They look at the national broadband network and, like us, agree that all Australians, wherever they live, should have access to fast broadband and at an affordable price. We all say amen to that. But common sense says, common prudence says, that having made that political commitment to universal, affordable, fast broadband, there should be a study to ascertain the most cost-effective way of delivering it, the fastest way of delivering it, and the way of delivering it that imposes the least cost on the taxpayer. That is common sense, and indeed it's common sense that was not lost on the former Prime Minister, Mr Rudd, because when he came into government he said not one major infrastructure project would be, con would be established or initiated without a rigorous cost-benefit analysis. A penetrating glimpse of the obvious, you might think, but one that has been completely ignored in respect of the largest infrastructure project in our country's history. So Australians whose hearts are filled with compassion and generosity towards those in need, and of course we will be generous again to those to our New Zealand brothers and sisters who have suffered so grievously in Christchurch. But we look at this government and we say, why can't you keep your house in order? Why can't you manage your finances prudently? Because yes, we want to help, but you have to do your Order. part. You have the to manage the public finances of Australia. Expired. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for New England. Well, thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker, and I was, it was a great pleasure to be in the chamber uh, to hear the member for Wentworth uh, speak so eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak, Mr Acting Speaker. And in my maiden speech, and I think I was standing in this very spot, I made the point that Australia should have a national natural disaster scheme of some sort. And I think one of the lasting legacies of this debate and the recent spate of disasters and the fact that we're even talking about constructing a levy uh, to assist in the payment of uh, overcoming that, uh, d the disaster, particularly in Queensland but also in Victoria, indicates that the preparation for disasters hasn't been adequate. Now, I don't lay that blame at the, the incumbent government. I think governments generally have uh, uh, relied on these things not happening too often and having the wherewithal to actually accommodate them when they do. But I think the fact that the floods occurred and there was uh, recognition of uh, a large expenditure being required, then the cyclone occurred and a revisiting of that expenditure uh, was required, then other events occur and a revisiting of that expenditure is required, indicates to me that any uh, prudent government, particularly uh, in light of uh, the prospects of more extreme events under the climate scientists' uh, uh, views of the world, that indicates to me that uh, there should be some sort of sovereign fund or an arrangement put in place which could involve uh, reinsurance at a state level, and I think that's one of the question marks that particularly lingers over Queensland that doesn't uh, impact as greatly on other states. Uh, but we do require some sort of long-term arrangement where uh, disasters of this magnitude are catered for uh, and not at the whim of the political cycle. The, uh, the uh, expenditure needs to be available uh, at the time of the disaster. 
because as sure as the 1974 Brisbane flood occurred and the 2011 flood occurred, there will be another Brisbane flood. Reco you know, suggesting that a dam of that size, as good as it is, and, and the work that it did, and there's debate over that, of course, uh, but human beings will never get it completely right. But human beings allowed those people in Brisbane particularly to build in an area where there'd been decimation and disaster before. And I think some of the people that have been involved in that sort of planning process need to actually revisit some of their decisions. It is pointless spending six billion or whatever the number's going to be, uh, a large proportion of which would be in the Brisbane area potentially, and then the event happens again in two years' time and we do it all again. I think we have to learn from this and there may be other mitigation uh, issues that could be addressed particularly in some of the other the smaller towns. Uh, but to, to have allowed the proliferation of uh, homes in, that, in the Queensland Valley in the full knowledge that a disaster of that magnitude could occur again, because it did historically, uh, I think uh, uh, needs to be questioned. Prior to my maiden speech, which was 10 years ago now, but. Uh, uh, in the State Parliament of New South Wales, I often raised this issue of the need for a national scheme of some sort so that the, the events that occurred weren't assisted on the back of the political cycle, the seat that it in, occurred in and the budgetary uh, uh, significance of the government of the day. And I think there's some interesting, and I've uh, listened with some interest, even though, well, with interest to the member for Wentworth because of the issues that he raised in terms of the budget recycle. But I think there has to be recognition that something needs to be uh, put in place for the long term. The planning processes, as I mentioned, need to be reviewed. The way in which Queensland ensures itself or doesn't ensure itself needs to be reviewed and I think the government uh, is moving down a pathway to actually examine some of those issues, the reinsurance issues, the costs, uh, but there's going to be a massive uh, expenditure cost come out of the taxpayer in one form or another. Uh, the flood levy may or may not uh, be part of the, uh, that funding arrangement but irrespective of whether it is or it isn't, the money will be found somewhere. I would suggest that it's time that governments and oppositions got off this horse of the only way that you can be considered an economically efficient manager of the, the nation's money is to run a surplus budget. And we've seen this issue over and over again, and the, the member for Wentworth related to it again, uh, go, crawling back through the, the current government's response to the uh, uh, global financial crisis. I think we were very fortunate, and I support Ken Henry in the, in the design of that package. The administration of it uh, does leave question marks. And I think it's, it's easy in hindsight to look back and say, well, we could have done it for about 20 billion less or 15 billion less. The fact is that we did get through that crisis, global crisis, and a lot of people can, can take credit for it. I don't want to take any credit for it, but a lot of people can. Uh, we did get through it, and we are in very good shape as an economy. We are the envy of most economies in the world, which le leads me to this particular issue that we're debating today. I can't see why one of the best economies in the world has to strike a levy to find funds to actually assist people in a natural disaster. And I won't be supporting the legislation that's before the House today. I think given the economy that we've got, given, given the, uh, the way in which we've been able to come through the global financial crisis, uh, that 
either through the, the budgetary process that some have indicated, and uh, I'd, if, if everybody's putting in their bid, the member for Wentworth suggests the broadband uh, network should be obliterated and the money uh, and the money poured into Queensland reconstruction. I, I wouldn't agree with that, uh, uh, as he wouldn't agree with the baby bonus being thrown out and poured into the reconstruction. Uh, many, a lot of people would. A lot of people uh, would, and I'm sure we've all got ways in which we would address uh, any budgetary difficulties that the government uh, may have. But I think the Treasurer has put himself in a difficult position with this legislation because he's argued and the opposition have trapped him in a sense in the politics of surplus and deficit budgeting. He's trapped in this scenario that on his own admission now that unless he's in, a surplus, in surplus he will be judged as a poor economic manager. I think that that is not the correct way to look at our economy. And I think over the last decade we've had this, uh, these machinations around surplus and deficit. An economy of our size and scale and the, the health of it, there is nothing wrong with being in deficit uh, for a relatively short period of time. We did it to overcome a crisis. We can argue about the administration of some of those, those monies, but the fact was that was the, the whole intent uh, of the massive amount of money that was spent was to keep the economy pumped up when the private sector had left the building for, uh, for a short time. And it achieved that end. The private sector is back, the economy is running again. Uh, we did that through uh, deficit budgeting. No one suggested that that was the wrong thing to do at that time. There was a crisis. Well, there has been another crisis, a crisis in one of our states. I don't see why the same logic doesn't apply again and that the government either... There's a number of ways of doing this. One that they're suggesting is that they impose a levy to pick up part of the bill. If there's another disaster tomorrow, do we strike another levy to pick up part of the bill? I think not. Uh, the other ways of doing it, of course, are to run a deficit or to pick it up in the budgetary process. And I uh, would have opted for the, the last two rather than the levy. Uh, and as such, uh, I won't be uh, supporting the legislation before the House today. But I would suggest, and I know members of the government and various ministers uh, are going to look at this, but I think the parliament should have a good close look at it. I don't think it's... it's, it's uh, it's good enough to say, as some have suggested, that uh, you know, if you've got a healthy budget you can deal with any of these disasters. If you look back over the various disasters that have occurred, there have been different responses. Different responses. And in the north of my electorate there's a very small valley, in a sense, uh, in terms of New South Wales, which is right on the Queensland border and some of the properties are either, either side of the river on the, the, the demarcates the Queensland border, where they had 22 inches of rain in 24 hours. It, an extraordinary disaster for that particular valley. And uh, I've been asking the uh, Minister of Agriculture, who uh, took the time to come up and have a look, and virtually new bridges washed away and blown apart, uh, a mini Grantham in a sense, without the loss of life that went through that particular area. The only part of my electorate, and I think New South Wales, that can really say that it had an extraordinary event occur. And that event, those people should be treated as the Queensland people should be uh, treated in, in terms of any assistance uh, uh, that is available. We have uh, farming interests and we were flooded twice. Uh, my son lost uh, uh, a large area of crop, probably about half a million dollars worth of uh, income. But he lives on a floodplain and we bought the land because it was a floodplain. If people live on floodplains, it's good land because it floods. And I think we've got to be very careful that we don't start extending some of these arguments that any event of nature that occurs uh, is treated in an extraordinary way. I, I'm quite happy to treat exceptional events, absolute disasters, uh, 
uh, with some form of assistance. And I don't argue about money being spent, but I just argue about a flood levy being struck. But I would argue, and some farmers would disagree with me too, I would argue that every time a flood occurs on a floodplain that there's suddenly some sort of recompense uh, made available to those people who happen to live there. Uh, the beauty of a floodplain, as I said, uh, agriculturally, is that it tends to have the best soils. And that's why people pay more money for it. And it gets wet occasionally. And that's why <coughs> there are risks in terms of, uh, of being there. The final thing I'd like to say, Mr Acting Speaker, is that the people of Queensland do need assistance. The governments of Queensland and local government, in my view, probably didn't do their jobs correctly in, in the past in terms of preparing for a disaster. There's been arguments about the, the rate at which you could insure against particularly cyclone damage because of, uh, that part of the world is very prone to cyclones. Uh, but I think we've got to make sure that when we work through this process, and all the state governments will potentially have to be involved, or the, the, the national government can strike a national scheme, which where there'd be some degree of cross subsidisation in terms of the uh, risk assessments of disasters in various states. But I think it is important that at the end of this process, that we, we're not back here next year having this same debate about whether we strike a flood levy to fund a disaster. I think we've, uh, we've got a actually define what an, uh, an extreme, extraordinary event is and then have a set of guidelines that actually uh, kick into gear on day one uh, that assist with the, whatever it is, the reconstruction process or the assistance uh, to individuals or what, whatever under the, the, the guidelines that are struck. But to have the sort of ad hoc uh, arrangement that we've had in place in the, in the past, I think is something that uh, uh, does need to be redressed. And uh, in conclusion, Mr Acting Speaker, uh, I just uh, uh, announce again that I will not be supporting this legislation. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the member for line. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I certainly support Commonwealth engagement in natural disaster relief uh, through natural disaster relief and reconstruction agreements with states, local councils and communities. Uh, I also certainly acknowledge the, the, the human tragedy of what happened uh, throughout December, January and February in Australia and also what is happening right now uh, in our ne near neighbours in New Zealand. In regard to the Queensland floods in particular, uh, some of the uh, stories that made their way through to communities such as mine really did uh, uh, ripple deep in the hearts of uh, communities that are a long way away from the affected areas. Uh, the story of the four-year-old boy lost at the point of rescue with the life jacket on, uh, the older brother asking for his younger brother uh, to be saved first, are uh, both tragic and heroic stories uh, all at once. And uh, we in this chamber must never forget uh, these children and others who were lost uh, as we try and work out uh, both the short-term uh, payment structures in, in reaching agreements with the states and the best funding model, uh, but also the longer term issues around how we uh, insure properly in this country, both for uh, mitigation works and emergency works uh, in, in the future. So, having said that, uh, I also acknowledge uh, the uh, uh, natural disasters over the Christmas period have to be paid in some way. Uh, but I do not, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, support uh, this process on the grounds that I do not think it is the right way. Uh, I do, uh, without sounding too much like a policy wonk, believe in the budget process. Uh, and I do think uh, the opportunity for uh, affected groups and bodies who uh, had a surprise thrust upon them the day after Australia Day uh, with uh, significant savings cuts in a number of areas is not the way a government should do business in Australia. I think those saving measures deserve to have engagement with the affected parties through a budget process uh, and 
uh, that the opportunity to argue the merits or otherwise of various cuts uh, should be allowed. The decision today, therefore, is specifically about the levy. Uh, and again, I don't think in a modern economy like Australia uh, we should go down the path of one-offs uh, and should do as much as we can to fight one-offism uh, in Australian public policy. Again, uh, from my perspective, uh, I would have thought a more sensible uh, and sustainable approach would be to combine it into the full context of the budget cycle, which is really only asking for uh, six to eight weeks and for the full consideration in uh, the full story that is uh, the full budget. Um, it is important for uh, people such as myself to see uh, the flood package in context with the full reform agenda before Australia. And anyone who is watching public policy closely at the moment will know the dance card is full. We have um, some significant public policy issues, whether they're Cooper, FOFA, superannuation, the Henry Tax Review, um, the future of nation building funds, whether we should create new nation building funds, uh, along uh, whether they're emergency and or mitigation funds to deal with issues uh, such as what we're talking about. Uh, we have uh, some fascinating work in the tax field, whether it's the tax expenditure statements that have been put out by Treasury, whether it's the uh, offset arrangements that uh, Ken Henry has been talking about in his final days as Treasury Secretary. <clears throat> All of these uh, uh, will be on the agenda in the next six months, and all of them interrelate with uh, the, the flood package in some way. And we can only go to the well of community sentiment so many times. And if someone does, uh, such as myself, believe in a reform agenda and the long-term uh, uh, tax arrangements in this country, uh, it should be seen as uh, an, a negative that we uh, are throwing one-offism into uh, the tax uh, debate in this country. So it's for that reason that I don't uh, support the levy. It's not that uh, it is going to community with a levy. I am more than comfortable with that, and even if necessary, a bigger one. But I do uh, uh, not agree with it being outside a budget cycle where the full context of savings measures uh, is uh, considered. Uh, and the Australian community sees the full story of the reform agenda of government alongside uh, both an increase in income tax through the flood levy, but also the sig significant savings cuts that were proposed the day after Australia Day. Two other points that uh, I just wanted to uh, raise quickly that I do hope in the long term come out of this debate regardless of uh, whether it is successful on the floor of the House or not. Uh, the previous member, and I know many other members, have talked about uh, longer-term natural disaster funds. I support that uh, direction and hope that good work is done by government to progress that. Uh, it is, as I've mentioned before, an opportunity for nation-building, either through emergency or mitigation works. But there is no question that, uh, as night follows day, uh, we will be in this position again, where Australia is confronted by another natural disaster in some form, and this parliament will be dealing with a significant cost as a consequence. We need to be building uh, a government insurance scheme against that now and start that hard work of uh, preparing for the worst uh, and hoping for the best. As well, I think we uh, uh, also need to work through, and I know this conversation is happening with government but also with members such as uh, Senator Xenophon in another place, this issue of uh, 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 language and semantics in the issue of insurance and reinsurance, definitions of floods, <clears throat> I think do need to be resolved and the help of government will do that. Issues of insurance and reinsurance. Uh, or, or uh, self-insurance uh, on all government entities does look to be a mess. Uh, it is, uh, I think, to the credit of only the ACT and Victoria that they have full coverage. Uh, every other state in, and the Commonwealth uh, have 
uh, chosen to go uh, different directions. And I think there is some enormous inconsistency in this area of self-insurance and reinsurance. And this is the opportunity uh, for the parliament, I hope, to do some long-term, sustainable, consistent work in, uh, in, in working on that. So I certainly concur with the concerns that Senator Xenophon has been raising yeah, yeah. and hope that uh, that can be uh, that process of resolving that issue uh, can begin as a consequence of this tragedy. I also hope that it, it is not only about uh, a work that is about uh, government infrastructure. I do uh, uh, go to the level of both commercial and residential. There are other models in the world. New Zealand uh, does uh, have uh, a program where uh, the residential um, does have some coverage. Uh, and there are other examples, such as through uh, local government notices, where we could get broader coverage of residential insurance uh, through the, the method that we use uh, to get uh, people uh, insured for their own property. Now is the time to start that conversation and hopefully see uh, if there is a better way and if we can find it to chase it. Uh, and so certainly hope again that either through the Assistant Treasurer or through other ministers that we don't shirk that responsibility in trying to build a better, more sustainable insurance model for the future. So I, uh, in conclusion, certainly acknowledge uh, the, the human tragedy and the natural disaster and natural disasters that have occurred over the Christmas period. I thank those who acted responsibly through that process. I was amazed uh, on Cyclone Yazi that uh, uh, the the way that communities behaved uh, in such a sensible way uh, in response to the imminent threat. They deserve to be congratulated for uh, taking that threat seriously and, uh, and uh, for um, doing the right thing by all of us. Uh, as well, uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank those who have made personal donations uh, to emergency relief efforts and the various uh, lamington drives and tin shaking ex exercises that have gone on around Australia. Uh, I've played in a couple of cricket matches to raise money for uh, 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 the flood victims, uh, but every community, and I'm sure every local member, has been engaged in some form. Uh, this is the opportunity to say thank you to those that have organised those and thank you to everyone who has contributed. Uh, I would hope, uh, if this gets through, that the money is spent wisely. Uh, and I think everyone in Australia will be looking for that. And if it does not get through, that there is some reconsideration of my views that this should be combined into uh, the budget cycle. And uh, then we get the full context of uh, the uh, savings measures and the uh, tax changes alongside uh, the full reform agenda of government. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Groom. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it's now more than six weeks uh, since the devastating floods of January 10 in Toowoomba, and the damage is still evident in my electorate. The creek beds still carry the scars of the force of water. Some businesses remain closed and will be for some time, and affected, land, uh, affected homeowners are working their way through a myriad of issues arising from the repairing of re or rebuilding of their homes. But over that period of time, we have also witnessed the gradual but steady progress of the reconstruction phase. Whether it is a, a business or a home, people are finally seeing things get back to normal. Through the construction tape and the road diversions, we, sorry, I'll start that again. Though the construction tape and road diversions are likely to stay in place for some time yet, it is reassuring and heartening to see how far we have actually come in six weeks. I would like to take this opportunity to put on the record my thanks to the volunteers and the community leaders who have devoted so much time in our community over the last six weeks. Whilst the task that still confronts them in, uh, in the electorate of right, or the Lockyer Valley held by the member for right, uh, is enormous. Their work in Toowoomba has been important and, and has been a major part in the healing process of our city's pain. My thoughts still go out for the people of, uh, of the Lockyer Valley. I, 
waited an appropriate time before driving through that area just a week ago to personally inspect the damage in Grantham, and the task there remains enormous. The stories of tra tragedy are still raw, but the people are showing the immense courage that we know all Australians have as they start to put their lives back together. I urge all members of parliament to continue to keep the victims and of this flood in the forefront of their minds as we go forward. These people will need our help for a long time. And when the media blaze moves away and our heart goes out to those people in, in New Zealand at the moment who are suffering an enormous tragedy. But as the media blaze moves away from the floods in Queensland or Victoria or, uh, or in Western Australia or the bushfires, we in this parliament need to keep our minds very much focused on helping these people recover. Can I also record my thanks to the insurance companies who've settled claims in my electorate, and I speak only in my electorate. Uh, some of them did need a little bit of encouragement, and uh, I appreciated their willingness to engage on claims that were outstanding. But can I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, by last Saturday I'd settled the last of the outstanding claims in my electorate from insurance companies, and to the best of my knowledge, all insurance claims in Groom, in Toowoomba and Oakey in particular, are being settled 100% uh, of insured value. And that's, that's a great outcome and one uh, which, which I hope is replicated, particularly in the seat of right. Uh, once, once those claims are settled, the, the stress associated with the flood starts to ease because the financial burden, in one case a woman I helped in Oakey uh, changed the insurance company's mind, was facing a, a loss of over $100,000, which she had no hope of, of uh, recouping over the, over the balance of her working life. And her gratitude was obvious in her eyes when I saw her on Saturday. For people who've lost their lives, their, their whole life's work, or seen their homes ripped apart, dealing with the complexities of an insurance claim is often the last thing they felt like doing. And so it's, it's been an honour for me as the local member to have been able to assist them and to use my experience both as a parliamentarian and before that as an industry leader and before that as a businessman uh, to be able to uh, get a good outcome for them. We now move, of course, to the fact that it is unthinkable that those people who are confronting this enormous challenge to rebuild their businesses are facing the prospect of a tax being imposed by this government. On top of a carbon tax, a mining tax, soon an LPG tax, followed by an ethanol tax and a compressed natural gas tax and a liquefied natural gas tax and an increase in the price of petrol and interest rates, it seems unbelievable that we have a government who now plan to put in place a flood tax on businesses who are trying to recover from the direct or indirect effects of the floods that we've experienced in Queensland. It is simply not correct for the Prime Minister to say these people will be exempted from the tax. These people, in most cases, had no damage at home in their homes and therefore do not qualify for the exemption clause. Their businesses may have been destroyed and they may be in the process of rebuilding them, or they may have merely, and I say merely, with, with, uh, with, 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 a, uh, with a slight cynical perspective, their businesses may have merely been out of action for two or three weeks. But the fact remains that they face an enormous challenge to get their businesses back on their, on their feet. And to, for them to now face this tax is a, a, a complete contradiction of the Australian way. We're meant to help our mates in times of trouble. We're meant to help our mates in times of disaster. We're not meant to tax our mates, as this government is planning to do with this tax. The Coalition and I remain firmly of the view that, that the rebuilding program should not be completed at the expense of subjecting Australians to another tax. And can I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, any suggestion that this rebuilding process will not occur without a tax is a travesty and a lie. 
We didn't need a tax to waste $2 billion on pink bats. We didn't need a tax to go $2 billion over budget on the BER Schools Hall program. We didn't need a new tax to pay for the interest bill on the $45 billion national broadband network. And we don't need a new tax to rebuild Australia after this flood or fire or natural disaster. This is just a government who cannot miss an opportunity to apply a tax any time it sees the chance, any time it saves it from having to do the hard task of managing its budget properly. We think it's wrong to, to target people yet again just because the government has mismanaged its budget and failed to show any financial rigour. The Gillard government has said that the ultimate risk has said that it cannot manage its budget without this levy, but it has the ultimate responsibility as a government to manage its budget. To do anything else is an abdication of its responsibilities, and we on this side of the House will not accept that proposition. We need to also, in this rebuilding process, as we look forward into the, uh, into the future, ensure that we not only replace the damaged infrastructure as it was, but we actually take the opportunity to improve on it. And of course, the case in point in my electorate is to realise from this disaster that simply patching up the existing Toowoomba Range crossing is no, is no solution. We need to make sure that we take this time to reflect on the fact that Toowoomba was cut off by road for four days the Toowoomba still has only one lane going east from it servicing the whole of Western Queensland. And with the rail line out of action, we are suffering from an extra 1,500 trucks a day travelling through the main street of Toowoomba. That is simply not acceptable. Just as it is no longer acceptable for this government to ignore the need for a second range crossing in Toowoomba, to bypass those trucks around the town. And I'm um, I'm pleased that the Prime Minister has extended the invitation for me to meet with her on, that, on the matter relating uh, to the Toowoomba Range crossing, and I hope I'm able to do that before the Parliament rises in the next couple of weeks. So as we rebuild Australia, as we take the opportunity to put the infrastructure back better than it was, we need to be mindful that we need to do it in a way that doesn't hurt businesses and doesn't hurt communities. And if we are going to do that, we need to do it without imposing a new tax. There is simply no justification for this tax. There's no justification on the basis that you shouldn't impose a tax anyway. But there's no justification when the people of Australia in these disaster-affected regions are doing it so tough. There's no justification to say to people that without this tax we can't rebuild Australia. Of course we can. We've done it before. We'll do it again. And under a coalition government, we do it with lower taxes. Mr Deputy Speaker, this tax is an insidious tax. It shows the ill-discipline and mismanagement of this government, and I oppose it entirely. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Dunkley. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy Speaker. I too rise today to uh, oppose the, in the, this bill, which seeks to enforce uh, a tax that's applied indiscriminately, uh, without justification and without a compelling case that the government's actually done the hard work expected of a government uh, in living within its means. The tragedies that we've seen over, over this summer, the disasters <coughs> that have seen uh, households, livelihoods, peace of mind destroyed, crops and, and communities flattened. Um, terror that will last long with people affected by these natural disasters, uh, emphasise just what a challenge many communities and many individuals face. And I can assure them of the coalition and wherever I'm able, my support in that recovery operation. And I think it would be unfair, as some on the government side have done, as su to suggest that the coalition's opposition to this flood tax somehow reflects a, a diminished commitment to the recovery effort. That is patently wrong and completely untrue. Our issue is the way in which the resources are being brought to this task. Our issues are that uh, natural disasters are challenges nations as vast as our continent will face each and every year. The La Nina weather system has 
certainly contributed to a, a greater frequency of those tragic events that have really had an enormous impact on, on some communities, in, in some cases more than once. But this won't be the last time we have a La Nina. Um, perhaps we may have grown more familiar with El Nino, where, where the patterns uh, and the droughts that tend to accompany them, but La Nina weather cycles will be a part of our future, and we again will see um, the challenges that La Nina has produced for our continent again, as we've seen it this year. The, my thoughts are very much with those that are in that difficult phase now of recovering. My earlier role in the Howard government uh, had me as an integral part of the tsunami relief and other disaster response exercises. And the key thing, the key learning that came out of that was the importance of people being able to constructively engage in their recovery and the re-establishment of their circumstances as best they're able, the recommencement of their livelihoods, um, how important that is as a tonic for their emotional and mental well-being, and that that is a constructive thing that people can do after these extraordinarily destructive natural events. So our thoughts are very much with those communities as they embark on that uh, reconstruction recovery exercise. This flood levy isn't needed to help that work. This flood levy is a opportunistic grab for more cash by a government that just can't manage a budget. This is a flood levy that has, well, to use the term, a transaction cost, the cost of collecting it from the deals that have already been done that are now 25 per cent. 25 per cent of the 1.8 billion said to be collected by this, this tax, this flood tax, this natural disaster tax, um, has already been given away in wheeling and dealing to gain support of uh, the minor parties and the crossbenchers. So a 25 per cent collection cost of this tax on a tax where the exemptions are broad uh, and, and yet to be tested. Um, it's hard to know quite how much money it will raise. On the expenditure side, the government's conceded its estimates of the cost may, may well be out, and that that would represent you know, quite, a, uh, quite a challenge for them in how to deal with additional costs, but they'd find that, that extra money by additional savings in the budget. Coalition's position is they should make that effort now and find those savings now and live within their means, and that's a challenge the government's failed to respond to. It's interesting as well that many Australians who may have been able to um, access some of the flood, flood relief payments have reflected on their circumstances and thought others more needy of that support. A perverse incentives created by this, this bill where uh, those that uh, obtain that benefit will get some exemption from the need to pay the flood tax. So people that uh, in their own good conscience felt they couldn't and didn't need to and that there were more deserving and, and, uh, and worthy uh, recipients of government support and they therefore didn't take full advantage of the uh, assistance that's available because they perhaps felt they were somewhat inconvenienced but not facing the enormous challenges of others. They'll now be penalised for not taking up that opportunity to access those benefits by having to pay this tax um, if they're in those income brackets. And that's a, a perverse incentive that uh, uh, is a very interesting characteristic of, of this legislation before us. And I say to the, the crossbenchers, after you know, being somewhat uh, disappointed and underwhelmed by a, a lack of support for a a bill that Parliament's recently considered, um, why they're not focusing on the package that this flood levy is supposed to be supporting. Uh, instead, we've seen wheeling and dealing about certain expenditure items that were going to part fund the government's disaster response and putting those expenditure items back in the books of the government, putting further pressure on their budget. We've seen that discussion. What we haven't seen and what's desperately needed is a discussion about whether the government's response is adequate. Coalitions clearly articulated that the flood levy is not needed to finance a government response and the support that's needed for reconstruction and recovery of flood-affected and disaster-affected and cyclone-affected communities. What the discussion needs to move to, though, is whether that toolkit of support is adequate. And I want to share with the Chamber my personal and direct uh, experiences in discussing that very matter with, with small businesses in these uh, areas that have been affected by the natural disasters over summer. 
I think first of the, uh, the floods uh, from that storm event in Western Victoria and my journey to Skipton, they're a small community very dependent on a handful of businesses for livelihoods and to support the local community. The food works operators, they're great, great people, lovely people with a, a deep passion for their community and much support from within the community were concerned that one of the eligibility criteria said that if you were a business seeking recovery assistance, this business needed to be your predominant source of income and where you spent your predominant time. Well, Russell and Beryl Adams operate a number of food works across that broader district and without some kind of support, they're genuinely concerned about their ability to, to fully recover and get engaged in providing their supermarket services um, for the immediate township and those further beyond. And that the application of those rules might see a uh, strict okay. application of those we'll support rules might see that vital business supporting the Skipton community not able to recover. Now, surely there should be some scope for examples such as Russell and Beryl Adams, where the importance of the enterprise they operate in not only supporting the community of Skipton, but also the livelihoods that it supports and the need for people not to have to travel great distances to Ballarat just to go grocery shopping, surely that should factor in the considerations of the support package. Other examples um, relate to the tragedies that I saw in businesses in Queensland. Um, uh, there's a uh, Impulse Entertainment operates a uh, uh, a CD uh, movie and music distribution business where uh, uh, they work very closely with retailers right across Australia. Now they suffered uh, losses of about half a million dollars in stock and plant, but because they have more than the, the maximum amount of employees, they're deemed not to be a business eligible for concessional loans. Now, if I, th I would have thought the, the objective was to help livelihoods recover and in their case, there's about 60 to 65 people part of that business, most of them at the head office and warehouse facility that was inundated with two metres of water, but others sprinkled right across Australia to support the distribution business that they operate, one that's grown very successfully, one that's very, very, very much supported by a committed family with a very deep commitment to their workforce. Well, they were told, too bad, you employ too many people. But when they look at the eligibility criteria for business recovery with, say, Cyclone Larry, for instance, under the Howard government, they would have been able to access recovery assistance. They are a viable business. A concessional loan for that business is all that is needed for them to get back on their feet and to make sure they are not facing the risk of closure. Yet under the funding criteria and the support package that the government's introduced, they are not eligible. Had they been affected by Cyclone Larry, they would be. And these are the kinds of issues I hope the crossbenchers that perhaps haven't formed or settled on a view might take up with the government. While there's wheeling and dealing about putting other expenditure back into the government's budget, uh, not specifically related to uh, the disaster response, and in fact uh, flood mitigation works and the like on the Bruce Highway, which is directly related to these disaster events, that's been cut, but we haven't seen that put back in either. Maybe some of the government and crossbencher discussion could go to whether the package itself is adequate to ensure that small and medium-sized enterprises, crucial to the well-being and livelihood of affected communities, crucial to letting people's uh, capacity to support their own recovery get going again, whether it's adequate, because I believe it is not. It's not in a number of ways, and the coalition's provided a number of, I think, very constructive, very practical suggestions about what the government can do around GST and PAYG holidays, waiving the penalties uh, for PAYG variations where a business might in not precisely uh, forecast the impact on their business as a consequence of these events, and also extending the assistance to those businesses affected but not directly impacted physically by these storm events, these are all very constructive proposals that I urge that the government take up and I urge that crossbenchers, as they wheel and deal and negotiate with the government, they might consider putting the package itself into the mix of those discussions uh, in addition to whatever expenditure they might want to pluck out of other areas to be part of uh, the discussion about where they will vote. Finally, just one other issue, and, and uh, I draw attention to concerns around insurance. 
the Assistant Treasurer has talked much about the work he's doing on the definition of flood insurance. Well, I have another one for him that he's been less forthright in talking about, and that's where businesses take out business interruption insurance. Time and time again, businesses have paid handsomely to have that protection, recognising that the loss of their opportunity to trade is crucial. It would, would significantly undermine the viability of their business, and therefore they insure against it. I was in New Farm talking to a small retailer who got told by uh, Ergon, I believe it is, the Queensland energy provider, that you know we're really not sure whether we can help you. The Ergon link was when the business contacted their insurer, and their insurer said, "Look, you know, you talk about floods and water inundation and the fact that you've got." You know, ankle-deep water running through your business premise, but you know what really stopped the electricity? An ergon worker. It wasn't a natural event. It was turned off by an electricity worker. Now, what kind of moronic explanation is that as a reason not to pay business interruption insurance payouts? That with all that going on and the protection of substations in the new farm area, the, the concern about the electrification in the water and the impact on human life, that the energy authority rightly shuts down that risk, and then someone says, look, business interruption, it wasn't the natural disaster or the floods or the water inundation. It was some human that turned off the electricity. Now, the insurance industry needs to get serious about that. And I've raised these concerns with the insurance industry and I've been underwhelmed by their response. Another example, CGU. CGU, a Melbourne-based company where I've rung them, I've canvassed these issues with them, I've yet to receive a reply from a business that has had this business interruption insurance where the eligibility criteria related to the period of time, the inability of customers to access their work sites, all those things that would reasonably uh, go into determining whether the business was indeed interrupted. But no, no, they're wanting to go down some other pathway and say, well, you might have been interrupted, but we're going to muck around with this flood definition again and somehow link the two together. The government needs to engage the insurance industry on this question of business interruption and recognise these other quite serious concerns about the impact of these natural disasters on small businesses, the engine room of the economy, the lifeblood of the livelihoods of so many people, and making sure they get the support they need by a proper examination of the support package, by a proper engagement on whether business interruption insurance is being fairly administered, and also by making sure that there's not the imposition of a new tax that will further undermine consumer confidence at a time when these businesses need as much confidence in the economy as they can and they don't need consumers concerned about, well, if this is an extra tax today, what might be next and the direct impact that has on discretionary spending. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the Deputy Speaker, Member for Fisher. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, and let me say how pleased I am to be able to join the debate this cognate debate on the Tax Laws Amendment Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill 2011 and the Income Tax Rates Amendment Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill 2011. I think initially we ought to recognise that both sides uh, of the parliament do support uh, Commonwealth uh, assistance for those people who have been devastated uh, by the tragedies which have occurred recently in Australia. The flood damage in Queensland was estimated to cost $5.6 billion. The damage from Cyclone Yassi was estimated at a further half a billion dollars. And I just think that it's appropriate in 2011 uh, that the Australian government ought to, with other governments and with the community, work to make sure that these devastated towns and cities and businesses and families and individuals do in fact receive the support that they deserve. So the important principle is that both sides of politics recognise that we have Australians in dire straits, Australians in distress, uh, Australians who do need assistance, and I think that it ought to be made very clear that all sides of the parliament, all members of the parliament, support an appropriate response. Where we do uh, differ, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome you to the chair, uh, is that uh, we believe that the government ought to fund its commitments with respect to reconstruction from consolidated revenue, uh, whereas the government wants to introduce a flood levy which, according to the government's figures, 
uh, will raise $1.8 billion. That is, uh, in 2011-2012, uh, 1.560 billion, uh, and in 2012-2013, $235 million. Uh, honourable members uh, representing the government party uh, have uh, pointed out uh, that, uh, in their view, uh, there is hypocrisy on the part of the opposition in so far as the Liberal National Parties in government uh, did, over a number of years, introduce various levies for uh, quite desirable and worthwhile purposes. Uh, the difference, uh, I think, was outlined uh, very clearly by the uh, Leader of the Opposition uh, in his speech uh, when he said that—and I quote him— there is a world of difference between a levy imposed by a government striving to achieve and maintain a budget surplus and a levy imposed by a government that which has been recklessly spending taxpayers' money and has given Australians the biggest deficits on record. There is a world of difference between a levy imposed by a government that could be trusted with taxpayers' money and a government that cannot. Uh, end of quote. And I think that very clearly puts to rest uh, the suggestions made by uh, honourable members of the government party uh, that there is an inconsistency in the approach of the Liberal National Opposition. Of course, uh, we all know uh, that the Building the Education Revolution program, which has been lauded by government members, uh, is going to cost, or has cost, the community some $16.2 billion, and we've heard some quite uh, horrendous cases of how uh, the dollars, in many situations, have not been well spent. Uh, obviously, schools welcome the facilities, and as a local member, I'm always pleased to see uh, new facilities in schools in the electorate of Fisher on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, but I do get concerned when I hear of reports uh, that the private school system uh, has been quite appropriately permitted to engage with the private market. Uh, they have been able to obtain their facilities as uh, a commercial transaction. They have been able to uh, get uh, uh, good deals. They have been able to enter into commercial contracts, whereas uh, many schools in the government system have been compelled to deal with layers of bureaucracy, uh, and in various states there have been different rules. But I understand that in some non-government schools they are able to get a building at a cost of, I think, about $1,200 a square metre, but some government schools have paid up to $5,000 a square metre, and of course this effectively is a fraud on the taxpayer. It's also a fraud on the government school communities because if the same amount of money is given by the federal government uh, to a non-government school uh, as, as is given to uh, a government school, uh, the non-government school is getting something like three times the facility for the same amount of taxpayers' money. And I suspect that if the government were ever to look at a similar program, it would be very tightly managed because uh, if you are going to spend taxpayers' dollars uh, on school halls and on other school facilities, it's important that those dollars travel as far as they can and that they don't disappear into the pockets of people who overcharge and people who, as a result, uh, see uh, some of our more underprivileged schools uh, receiving a, a third of the value for their money uh, that uh, non-government schools are able to achieve. There has also been much debate in the community about the home insulation program. Uh, I'm told that so far that program has cost $2.45 billion and it's continuing to cost. Uh, as we know, sadly, there have been four confirmed deaths and some 202 house fires. So we, we support reconstruction, but we don't support this particular levy. Uh, now, I only have a limited amount of time to speak uh, in this debate, uh, and I will come back to some more general principles, but I just want to highlight what I see as an anomaly which the government, even if it's determined on pursuing this levy, uh, ought to look at. Uh, the honourable member for MacArthur, uh, in a question in the House on the 10th of February, uh, asked about a police officer 
uh, who resides in his electorate, and the police officer mentioned to the member for MacArthur that he would be retiring in the 2011-2012 financial year, and it calculated that simply through unfortunate timing he would be hit with a $6,500 slug on his super payout as a result of the requirements of the flood levy. Now, I'm sure that the government did not intend such a consequence, and I hope uh, that this matter is looked at very closely. Uh, it is one thing to say that it's not going to cost the average Australian more than a cup of coffee a week, but for this police officer who no doubt has served his community, has served New South Wales well for many years, uh, the fact that he is apparently going to be uh, hit to the extent of $6,500 must surely uh, be an unintended consequence, and I would hope that the Treasurer would look at that matter very, very closely. It is a considerable amount of money for someone who is preparing for life after the workforce, and uh, it is really, I suppose, uh, unlucky for him because uh, of the timing, both of his retirement and also of the tragedy. Realistically, he's facing a raw deal, and I hope again, I say, and I say again, that the government really ought to look at that case, and I suspect that there are uh, similar cases of other people who are in that situation. I don't know whether the police officer has any options, but uh, that one option he clearly should look at is deferring his retirement until such time as this levy uh, is out of the way. The other point that has been made by many members uh, of the opposition is that this was a tragedy uh, which, of course, engulfed our nation. Uh, we looked uh, in horror uh, on the television, and all of us were touched in some way, either personally uh, or through family or friends uh, or communities we knew well. And so many uh, members have assisted in every way that they can, and we've heard many contributions uh, which are extremely moving from members on both sides of the House. Uh, and so when we saw this tragedy, what happened was the people of Australia, in an unprecedented way, uh, they opened their hearts, uh, they opened their homes, they opened their wallets, and they made donations to assist their fellow Australians who had been so seriously disadvantaged as a result of this tragedy. And uh, it does seem to be a bit rough uh, that those people who have already contributed voluntarily uh, will be slugged again. Now, I know that uh, the, the government would distinguish the purposes for which the contributions have already been made by the community from the purposes for which the, uh, the money raised by the flood levy is to be spent. But ultimately, there's a double whammy. People voluntarily contributed, and then they're being compulsorily required to contribute again. Also, the criteria for eligibility to uh, receive uh, assistance uh, uh, from uh, the government and the receipt of assistance, of course, exempts the person from paying the flood levy. Uh, one has to wonder whether the terms uh, for receiving that assistance have been entirely well thought out. And uh, we all know what those uh, provisions are, but I have had some fairly hair-raising uh, examples uh, given to me, Mr Deputy Speaker, of people who received $1,000, uh, and what they did, of course, uh, they uh, went off to some big event. Uh, uh, they drank uh, Maui all the way, uh, toasting uh, the Prime Minister and the Queensland Premier, uh, and they were determined to, to all spend their $1,000 uh, uh, at that, I think, big day out, um, where it was a major uh, event. Uh, and of course, uh, this is clearly uh, something that the government wouldn't have foreseen, and uh, I believe that it's an indication of somewhat sloppy guidelines because there no doubt are people who have received assistance who shouldn't have received assistance, and no doubt uh, there are people who should have received it who indeed haven't. And I suppose that's always the difficulty that a government has when a program is thrown together quickly, as indeed it had to be because of the exigency uh, of the situation, but uh, it does tend to make a lot of people cynical and somewhat reluctant having contributed voluntarily to be required to uh, now contribute compulsorily. I mentioned uh, when I spoke on Cyclone Yassi uh, recently, um, the, the tragedy that Cyclone Yassi was for North Queensland. I also spoke about the situation of communities, 
not only in Queensland but elsewhere throughout the country, uh, who have been, which have been affected uh, by the floods. Uh, I have uh, sort of family uh, who have been affected. Uh, staff in my office uh, have uh, uh, family who have been affected. One staff member, in fact, had settled on the purchase of a house, uh, and um, uh, five days after the settlement, was told to expect seven metres of water uh, through his property. Well. Happily for his sake, uh, only about a foot of water went through the yard and the house wasn't affected. Uh, but there are lots of tragedies and lots of people, of course, know uh, others whose homes have been entirely inundated and entirely uh, destroyed in many cases. And the resilience of Australians is something which we can only admire, something that we can only support and something, of course, that we can applaud. I uh, believe, however, that we ought to focus on the need to support uh, Australian people and not on the fact that the government uh, has uh, brought in a levy, which is not the appropriate way to go. I mentioned initially that the flood levy will raise only $1.8 billion and flood damage is estimated at $5.6 billion with Cyclone Yassi's additional damage at a further half a billion dollars. So it's pretty clear that most of the reconstruction effort from the Commonwealth will indeed come from consolidated revenue. Uh, and so you've got to ask why have they chosen to bring in this flood levy which will slug Australians who have already contributed and in many cases uh, uh, be a levy which is imposed in an inequitable way. Uh, if the government uh, was a sound economic manager, we would not see the government bringing in a legislation, or this legislation uh, with respect to a flood levy. There is no doubt, as I think uh, other members have said, the Labor Party is a tax and spend government. Uh, this is not a desirable situation, and it is wrong that the initial or first knee-jerk reaction to a community need uh, is that there should be a new tax. And so, summing up, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think that it is something to applaud that every single member of this House and of the other place uh, do support the fact that the Commonwealth needs to be involved. Uh, we are the national government, uh, and uh, I just want to say that it's a pity, though, that the government has decided to impose uh, this new tax. In the few seconds re remaining to me, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I just want to say uh, and pass on the condolences of the residents of the people of Fisher and the Sunshine Coast to all of those people who have been so adversely affected by the Christchurch earthquake. Uh, we do live in very strange times. We have had fire, flood, we have had cyclones, and now we have got earthquakes all in this area of Australasia. Mr Deputy Speaker, I do ask the, the government in particular to reconsider the anomaly that I have outlined. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Capricornia. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I want to uh, speak today to uh, put on the record my total and strong support for this uh, Tax Laws Amendment Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill of 2011. Mr Deputy Speaker, the last time we were here in Parliament, just a couple of weeks ago, members tried to put into words our shock and our sorrow for what so many communities had suffered as a result of the flooding and other disasters that wreaked havoc on our country over the summer. As local members, we tried to put into words our admiration for the acts of courage and community spirit that we saw time and again throughout those weeks when ordinary Australians, emergency services workers and governments were put to the test. Through those words, we tried to give comfort and reassurance to the people who had lost loved ones or lost their homes or businesses or the foundations of their community life. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think we'd all agree that that was an important thing for the parliament to do. But now it is time for words to give way to action, and that is what this bill is all about. It delivers on the means to rebuild flood-affected regions. People have been out there cleaning up the mess and getting their lives back together. Councils have been assessing the damage to roads and buildings and counting the cost of the initial emergency response and the repair work to come. They need us now, us here in this parliament, to do our bit and provide certainty that the money needed to rebuild Queensland, northern New South Wales, Victoria and the other states that have been affected will be there. 
Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, that is exactly what the government has been doing. We have been making the tough decisions, finding savings in the budget, already $3.8 billion of saving to put uh, towards the reconstruction effort. And now we are asking those Australians who can afford to do so to make a modest contribution through this flood levy towards the cost of rebuilding our country. And Mr Deputy Speaker, that cost is enormous and uh, growing by the day. For a while there, uh, back in January, when the floodwaters were peaking in the Fitzroy River in Rockhampton, it looked like this was a rerun of floods we'd seen in recent years. Places like Emerald and Theodore and other parts of central Queensland were facing a massive clean-up and starting to talk to state and federal governments about what was available under the Natural Disaster Relief and Recovery Arrangements. At that time, back in early January, the costs looked big but manageable under the normal arrangements between the state and federal governments that carry us through uh, these times of, uh, of natural disaster. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, then Bundaberg flooded, and then Dolby and Condamine. Then came those dramatic days when whole towns in the Lockyer Valley were washed away and tens of thousands of people had to abandon their homes in Ipswich and Brisbane. Of course, uh, that wasn't the end of it. It went on to, to New South Wales and Western Australia uh, and Tasmania and Victoria. Unbelievable scenes of washed out bridges, ruined roads, buckled railway lines everywhere you looked. Mr Deputy Speaker, the nation and this government are facing a natural disaster of unprecedented proportions, possibly the biggest in our nation's history. The scale of damage and destruction is beyond anything that could be foreseen by government or funded out of the normal NDRRA processes. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, what uh, does one do in these circumstances? Well, apparently, if you're in the Liberal or National Party, you look to exploit any political opportunities that the situation might present and oppose for opposition's sake. And we've seen it time after time after time uh, as uh, opposition members have uh, contributed to this debate. You look to further your own party political interests ahead of the national interests and the needs of those people affected by floods, even as communities are picking up the pieces after the floods and wondering how long their future has to stay on hold. Well, no surprises there, Mr Deputy Speaker. But what would you do if you cared about those flood-affected communities and were economically responsible and actually focused on what is the best for this country and those parts of it that want to get back to normal as quickly as possible? The government did what a constructive and responsible government should do. We immediately committed ourselves to the rebuilding task. You can see the commitment there in the Prime Minister's speech on 27 January just a day after she witnessed the damage to Toowoomba, one of the worst affected communities. The Prime Minister said, I see what needs to be done and I will do it. We will rebuild. Mr Deputy Speaker, right there is the commitment, the pledge to Queenslanders and other states that we will stand beside them while they get back to full strength, which is where our nation needs Queensland in particular uh, and its growing industries to be. We can't afford for Queensland, its agricultural and resource industries and tourism industries to be held back by damaged infrastructure. That doesn't serve the national interest in any way. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, this debate here today uh, is now the chance for individual members to commit to that rebuilding task. By supporting this legislation, this fair and modest levy, members are saying that we get it. We get the size of the rebuilding job and we get the importance of the rebuilding job. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, it's important to note, as uh, many speakers on the, the government side have already noted, that this uh, temporary levy um, that we're asking taxpayers to pay is, uh, as I say, temporary. It's from uh, July 2011 to June 2012, just that one year. It's also important to note that it is only one part of uh, the government's flood package that has been announced so far. The government uh, did the hard work. People were talking about you know, knee-jerk uh, reactions uh, when that clearly is not the case. The government sat down, went through program by program in our budget to see where savings could be found, where uh, priorities could be changed to get this reconstruction effort underway. And, uh, as part of that package, as part of that $5.6 billion package, we are asking taxpayers to make this uh, modest contribution towards it. 
The savings so far are $3.8 billion. Uh, that is a big amount of uh, a big uh, slab of savings in uh, in anyone's language. Uh, and this le levy, on top of that, is $1.8 billion. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this levy is a fair levy. Uh, we are asking people to pay according to their capacity to pay. It's a progressive uh, levy. It's uh, an amount of uh, money that we're asking people to pay uh, only where they are earning over $50,000 uh, in that next year, that uh, two, July 2011 to June 2012. So about 60% uh, of, uh, of taxpayers will only be paying uh, $1 each week towards uh, this reconstructive effort. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, in detail, it's 0.5 per cent for, people for uh, earnings between $50,000 to $100,000 and then 1 per cent uh, applying to earnings over the $100,000 mark. Someone on the average income of $68,000 per year will pay $1.74 per week. Now, members have talked um, quite a bit, members on the other side have talked uh, about the fact that people have um, spontaneously and, uh, and generously given uh, to the, uh, the flood relief appeals, the, the disaster relief appeals uh, around the country. And, uh, and no one is denying that, and every member in this House um, is proud of the way that uh, our fellow Australians have responded to these disasters, proud of the way uh, that people have um, voluntarily and, uh, as I said, you know, immediately given uh, of themselves uh, both in time and, and money to their uh, fellow Australians who have been affected by the floods. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the money that, is going, that, that we are talking about here today, the, uh, the money from the, the tax levy, oh, sorry, the flood levy and, uh, and the, the savings that the government uh, has identified and will continue uh, to identify to put towards the reconstruction effort, uh, is of a completely different magnitude and uh, will serve a completely different purpose. Those donations have quite rightly gone to people to rebuild or to, to, uh, uh, to get their, their households back together. It's gone to those very uh, you know, personal and, uh, and, and things that happen at a family and a household level. Levy, uh, level. No one can seriously suggest uh, that we are going to rebuild highways and uh, railway lines and bridges and town halls and community sports centres um, off the back of, uh, of volunteer effort and donations. So that is uh, a furphy really on the, on the part of the opposition, uh, which is uh, really just another excuse. Um, the opposition so far uh, in this debate, uh, since this started back in January, while the government has been uh, seriously addressing um, the needs that this country and particularly those flood affected communities are faced with, We've been getting down, finding the savings. How are we going to find the money uh, in our budget to do what is needed to be done? That's the task the government's been about. In the meantime, the, uh, the opposition has really been all about uh, finding excuses, um, as I say, you know, putting up this furphy that uh, somehow uh, donations are, uh, are capable of, uh, of meeting, this, uh, meeting this task. And they've been putting up you know, sham, you know, the, the usual sham uh, savings. Uh, measures. I think they ran around for three weeks saying, "Well, you just do it out of savings. You just, you know, don't you don't need a levy. You just do it out of savings." Uh, and when they actually came forward with their package, uh, there was nothing like the uh, the genuine uh, savings that would uh, would get this work done. So the opposition uh, has been uh, behaving very irresponsibly and opportunistically. Talk about opportunistically. I mean, the classic was uh, was the uh, Liberal Party email that was going around. Uh, asking for people to donate to the Liberal Party in the midst of all this. So, uh, on the one hand, uh, the uh, the opposition want to hold up, you know, the, the virtues of uh, of uh, those millions of Australians who have uh, donated in good faith towards the flood appeal, but at the same time want to, uh, you know, milk that kind of uh, spirit uh, for their own purposes in getting people to uh, to donate to them in the midst of uh, you know this time of great need for our nation. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said, it's a fair levy and, uh, and a progressive levy. People will pay as they have capacity to pay. Importantly uh, for people in my electorate, um, there will also be an exemption for those people who have been uh, most directly affected by this, these floods. So if uh, people received uh, an Australian government disaster recovery payment uh, or people who, uh, while not uh, actually accepting 
uh, that relief payment are nonetheless eligible um, on the on the uh, on the uh, criteria, eligibility criteria um, will not have to pay this levy, which is uh, a fair and reasonable way to do it. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I've already talked about the, uh, the furphy and the, the excuses that the, uh, the opposition has put up, and certainly in this debate so far, um, the opposition have not been able to argue against uh, this, uh, this very fair and reasonable and responsible flood levy on the basis of any principle or logic. Uh, we know, we know from as a fact that uh, the opposition, the Liberal and National parties, are not opposed to levies. Uh, we, saw them, um, we saw them impose levies on Australian uh, people time and time and time again uh, during the course of the, uh, of the Howard government. Um, and it's important to note, um, I noticed uh, in one of my uh, colleagues' speeches he went through it in greater detail, but there were times when those levies were imposed when the government budget was actually in surplus. So uh, the, here the opposition is giving us lectures about finding savings and making tough decisions. Um, they, in their time uh, during the Howard government, were imposing levies uh, when the budget was in fact uh, in surplus. So classic example of them uh, you know, giving lectures, very opportunistic lectures, and uh, when they were given the chance they dodged uh, any kind of uh, hard decisions and just put it back on to, to taxpayers. In contrast, here we are facing um, what is the biggest uh, series of natural disasters and the biggest reconstruction task that our country has faced at a time when we are not even um, three years um, on from the global financial crisis. So in the space of you know, three or four years, this country has had, well, the government has had to steer the country through the global financial crisis, which everyone uh, acknowledges around the world uh, we did better than any other uh, advanced economy. Uh, and now, less than three years later, we're being uh, asked as a government to stand by um, flood-affected communities, flood-affected people uh, to rebuild this country. This legislation is asking Australians to, Australian taxpayers who earn over $50,000 to make a modest contribution towards that. I think uh, it is in the, uh, the spirit of the Australian people to understand that and to uh, want to be, uh, you know, be part of the reconstruction of our country uh, in that way over, the, uh, over that next year, cutting out in uh, June, June 2012. Uh, so far, all we've had from the opposition is, uh, is our excuses, sham savings and uh, con continual seeking of political opportunity. We are serious about rebuilding. Uh, this legislation is part of that. And, uh, I support it, and I ask uh, members of the opposition to uh, uh, go back to their electorates, particularly those from Queensland, and explain uh, why they don't have any answers uh, for the reconstruction of this country. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Fairfax. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, member for Capricornia, whose uh, electorate was devastated by the. Uh, floods in central Queensland and um, many of us in a little bit further south from her watched the, uh, the, uh, on television as the uh, floods unfolded and the Fitzroy River um, devastated Rockhampton and, um, and that, uh, that storm then moved out to sea and then rejoined the coast uh, about Wide Bay in between the Sunshine Coast, then moved on to Toowoomba and then inland again and, and Grantham, we all know what happened in Brisbane. In, but um, my, I was lucky that my area was uh, relatively unscathed. We had uh, a little bit of local flooding, but nothing like the devastation of central Queensland and <coughs> Grantham and Toowoomba and, and Brisbane. But to give some uh, indication of the, um, uh, of the seriousness of the floods, we, uh, between the Sunday afternoon and the Tuesday morning about 11 o'clock, when all this devastation was underway, the rain gauge that I have in my backyard showed that we had 505 mils of rain. That's an amazing amount of rain that uh, um, was, was dropped on South East Queensland. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the only reason that this bill is before the House today is because 
of a fiscal irresponsibility of the Labor government under Prime Minister Rudd and Prime Minister Gillard. In my memory, no government has imposed a special tax to finance a recovery after a natural disaster. When Cyclone Tracy destroyed Darwin um, on Christmas Day in 1974, the natural disaster organisation swung into action. And uh, I happened to be in Canberra at the time, and I went to uh, the NDO headquarters in Northbourne Avenue uh, for the morning to, to uh, help set up the, the, uh, the rescue effort. And I finished up actually getting home three days later. But even the Whitlam government, who, who were in power at the time, and they were the basket case of fiscal irresponsibility, did not introduce a new tax to fund the reconstruction of Darwin and, and the Darwin Reconstruction Commission. Prime Minister Rudd inherited a healthy economy and a $20 billion surplus, and that is an, on top of the savings of uh, accumulated surpluses and proceeds of asset sales and other things that put $60 billion into the Future Fund. Now, I can distinctly remember Peter Costello telling this House and telling uh, people outside the House that it was necessary for Australia to put money away for a rainy day, hence the establishment of the Future Fund. The fund was set up to uh, fund the unfunded liability, contingent liabilities of the Commonwealth uh, public service superannuation and um, other things. If the Queensland floods don't qualify as a rainy day, then I don't know what does. Mr Speaker, the point I want to make is that coalition governments traditionally have a savings culture. We on this side of the House argue that flood reconstruction should be funded out of savings, not by tax hikes. But how does the government produce savings? In simple terms, it is very simple. Don't spend more than you earn and live within your means. Don't waste the money you have earned. Other speakers have talked about the devastation of the floods and Cyclone Yasi and, and uh, the human and physical loss, uh, losses of the victims. The coalition has clearly stated that the um, government should do whatever it takes on reconstruction and recovery and rebuilding of Queensland. There is no lack of compassion on this side of the House towards those affected by the devastation. I was uh, Minister for Territories in 1998 when that uh, huge flood devastated Catherine. And I walked among the ruins of small businesses and saw the despair on the faces of, of small business people. I saw the difficulties encountered in restocking this remote community which relied on, on uh, Adelaide for stock. Howard government did not have a tax to rebuild, to rebuild, uh, rebuild Catherine. The debate is not about compassion. It is about the realities of hard-nosed economics. Before the 2007 election, Prime Minister Rudd told the world that he was an economic conservative. Sitting at his shoulder with his loyal deputy, the now Prime Minister, nodding furiously, saying, me too, I'm an economic conservative. It was only a matter of time before the old Labor way emerged, deficit and debt. And Prime Minister Rudd actually used the figure in this House of the need to borrow $315 billion. And I'll, I'll tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, that figure rocked the socks off um, this, side, this side of the House, off the coalition. That sort of borrowing was completely foreign to those on this side of the House. We were told that this was, money, this was money that was required for economic stimulus so that Treasurer Swan could avoid the R word. We opposed the uh, spending spree that followed. I and others on this side of the House warned taxpayers that the $900 that the Prime Minister was handing out to people eventually would cost them $4,000 by the time they paid it back through their taxes and interest. We saw a succession of failed government programs 
where there was, much, there was so much waste of taxpayers' money. We now have school halls, beautiful as they are, being opened by government members that are monuments to waste. I never miss the opportunity of telling an 11-year-old student in grade seven that the student will be 35 before the debt on the new building will be paid off, as beautiful as that building is. With this record of careless, incompetent and wasteful government, why should we agree to introduce a new tax to get the, get the Gillard government out of the fiscal hole that they have dug for themselves? The shadow treasurer, the member for North Sydney, mentioned Kerry Packer when he appeared before a Senate committee. Well, actually, that was a House of Reps committee, not a, not a Senate committee. And I was on that committee when a Labor member um, asked Kerry Packer about the extent of his personal taxation. And Kerry Packer uh, denied that he, he, he had a tax problem, and he said that he paid his lawful tax, not a penny more and not a penny less. He added that, uh, given the way Labor wastes money, no one in their right mind would want to pay more tax than they, than they had to. By opposing this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, we on this side of the House are putting a challenge to Labor. Fulfil your broken promise to be an economic conservative government. Live within your means. Show Australians there will be no more waste and your government can live within its means. Don't bring in the flood tax, but find savings to end Labor waste. Mr Deputy Speaker, I oppose this bill and the unnecessary labour tax it imposes on, on uh, Australians. The, the Labor government, uh, <laughs> sorry for the interruption, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker. <laughs> I, I do recognise the tune. Uh, but it, it, if, you, if you have a look at um, the amount of money that the Labor government is borrowing, is $711 million per week. Now, at that rate of borrowing, the money, needed, the money to be raised by the levy is $1.8 billion. You know how long it would take to raise that money under the current borrowing program? 2.5 weeks. $5.5 billion is needed for the total reconstruction. At $700 million per week, that would take 7.7 .7 weeks of borrowing. The Prime Minister says that this new tax is needed to bring the budget back into surplus by 2012-2013. Until, until then, the borrowing, this borrowing that I've mentioned continues. We are told that then all our troubles will be over. We'll be back in surplus. That's right, but it's wrong that our troubles will be over. This is the great Labor spin. If Labor ever achieves a surplus, that is when they will start to pay off the debt that they have accumulated. In the meantime, the interest payments continue. This is why we are saying on this side of the House that, that the uh, reconstruction of the uh, Queensland after the floods should be paid for by savings by the government and not by a new tax. I oppose this bill. Uh, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Flinders. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, along with other members of the coalition, we support the reconstruction, but we oppose the tax which has been levied and is being levied in order to address reconstruction. Reconstruction in the face of natural disaster has always been core business for Australian governments. We have a contingency reserve. We provision. We make savings. We do the difficult things precisely so as that at the moment of need we are ready. What this bill represents is not support or opposition for reconstruction, and it is, it is inappropriate for anybody on the other side to misuse this debate to indicate that there is not absolute unanimity for reconstruction in the face of the terrible hardship that Queensland has faced. 
but what this bill represents at its core is the fundamental work to provision, to prepare, to protect and then to make sure that our nation's finances are ready for the inevitable range of natural disasters that are part and parcel of Australia's landscape, our history and our future has not been done. So I want to make two simple points uh, in uh, this statement. Firstly, there is an increasing pattern of using a good purpose as a justification for a bad means on, the, on behalf of this government. And secondly, I want to run through a little bit of the financial history and current practice, which has led to over 200 and, uh, uh, to about 209 and a half billion dollars of accumulated debt over the last eight Labor budgets uh, and the next proposed budget. It's not a one-off global financial crisis. It is a pattern over eight successive budgets which have been carried out with a ninth budget to come. And I think it's very important to recognise that this is not just being unlucky. This is a systemic pattern of gross misuse of Australian finances. And all the time there's a better way, which is to be more responsible through making the difficult cuts. We've made them and, most intriguingly, the government has effectively conceded that it could also make them. So let me run through the facts firstly about the increasing pattern of applying a good purpose, a moral purpose, for justification of a very bad policy which can frequently have deep human consequences. I begin with my own portfolio areas and I list the names of the home insulation program for which we were told it was a moral imperative that we had to support it. Only that package could, so they alleged, save Australia and be efficient, as well as make inroads into reducing Australia's emissions. It failed on uh, the value for money test. It failed on the fraud test. It failed on the, uh, the test of public safety. Uh, and then, most ironically, uh, the overstatement in relation to emissions reductions was about 300 per cent. Uh, and so it was a catastrophic policy, but it was a policy which we were told was for a good purpose and therefore it was our moral duty to support it. We opposed the home insulation program. We attempted to prevent it coming into being. We foresaw the impacts it would have on the industry. We foresaw the risks to public finance and we foresaw and forewarned about the absolute flawed structure which would inevitably lead to rotting and risk on a grand scale. But that's not the only example. The Green Loans Program was such a misconstruction right from the outset that we knew that there was no way uh, that it would be successful. In the end, over $200 million spent to generate 1,000 loans, more than $200,000 processing fee per cost of loan. I mean, that is incredible. And if you designed uh, a program like that and took that to the public, you would have been laughed out of every form of government in Australia. Uh, then there was the Green Start program, the successor, also failed. But also, we were told, was a moral imperative because only this can help make the efficiency savings. We were, we were told similarly that the Citizens' Assembly was a moral imperative, uh, but it had a half-life of about four weeks. Uh, we were told that cash for clunkers was a moral imperative, uh, in, whereas instead it was a fiscal insult to Australians. Uh, and the same people who devised the Home Insulation Program, the Green Loans Program, the Green Start Program, the uh, Citizens' Assembly and the cash for clunkers are now telling us that it is a moral imperative to use a tax to pay for the reconstruction right in the face of the Australian history that pre provisioning for natural disaster, relief, repair and reconstruction is core business. So against that background, that pattern of misusing a good purpose to justify a bad mechanism, I want to deal with the broader parameters that there is a better way uh, than raising a tax which will be one of three major taxes moved within the coming year. 
Um, the second one, of course, is the mining tax, and we now know that the figures on that are so bad that uh, there has been a $100 billion variation over the coming years of that which is actually going to be delivered compared with that which was uh, promised, leaving an enormous gap because they have spent all of the proceeds, but they will have a, a, a much lesser proportion of receipts, whilst also creating sovereign risk in the mining sector and dampening future investment. So that's the second of the, the taxes, is the mining tax. And today, the Prime Minister has just confirmed that there will be a carbon tax, which he expressly ruled out on the, the election eve on the 20th of August, which he expressly ruled out on the 16th of August, which the Treasurer expressly ruled out and called hysterical uh, uh, twice. In, or he, he called it hysterical once and ruled it out twice in the week before that. And so that tax will have an enormous impact on electricity and, as of yesterday, petrol prices for Australians. So against that background, um, let me make this point. When you do the analysis, and I've recently gone back uh, to the published budgetary figures and the most recent updates from the governments, uh, from the, uh, the government, and you look at the spending habits and practices of the last eight Labor budgets and the coming budget. And you run over the final four budgets of the Keating era, uh, final five budgets, I apologise, of the, uh, the Keating era, uh, and you see a deficit of 12 billion, a deficit of 18 billion, a deficit of 18 billion, a deficit of 14 billion, a deficit of 11 billion, for an accumulated total of 74 billion of deficit. Interestingly, things began to turn around immediately, and over the uh, the coming period of the Howard government, there was then an accumulated $95 billion of uh, budget surpluses. And the last four years were plus 13, plus 15 billion, plus 17 billion, plus 19 billion, and then miraculously back to a Labor government and minus 27 billion, minus 54 billion, minus 41 billion, minus 12 billion uh, for the next proposed budget. And so over those eight current and ninth proposed budgets, uh, we see a total of $209.5 billion of debt. And it's extraordinary that you go from minus, 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 minus to a reduction uh, in the debt and then plus, plus, plus all the way through the Howard years. And then as soon as the Howard years finished, we go back uh, to a position of $135.5 billion of debt in the next four budgets alone. And the answer? Bad luck. We are just unlucky. Uh, we had to spend uh, the $74 billion of additional expenditure in debt uh, and deficit over the last uh, five years of the Keating government, and then we had to spend uh, the additional $135 billion of debt and deficit uh, over the first four years of the Rudd and Gillard governments. So to understand this, that there is a systemic pattern of failure in relation to fiscal responsibility that there is a $209 billion pattern of debt uh, over nine consecutive budgets. Uh, and this is not bad luck. This is not inadvertence. This is fundamental and systemic. Uh, and that's why we say that there are huge savings to be made, which would be about fiscal prudence as well as the correct way to provision for the rightful reconstruction uh, of Queensland and Brisbane and Ipswich and Toowoomba in particular. Uh, and we know that the government knows this as well, because the Prime Minister was asked, what if the costs are additional? We'll find the savings. What if the, uh, uh, and then when Cyclone Yasi came along, which was not known at the time that the levy was announced, uh, what of the costs here? Well, we'll meet those through savings. Uh, and then we saw a third example, um, that uh, in order to get the bill through, they had to negotiate uh, either deferring or axing uh, over $400 million of their savings. So they will either have to increase the tax, increase the deficit, uh, or um, find those additional savings. Now, we're led to believe that they will find those savings. So subsequently, on three different fronts, they indicated there were more savings to be made. So it's absolutely clear uh, that there are extraordinary savings to be made. Uh, the, none of these savings, of course, are real or desirable, they are all opposed until the moment that the government reverses position and embraces them. That's the pattern. 
And so we see in some, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, that there is a misuse of moral purposes to justify bad policy. And secondly, we see that when you look at the last eight completed Labor budgets uh, and the proposed budget for next year, nine consecutive deficits all over $11 billion per annum, rising as high as $54.5 billion. That's not bad luck. That is bad management. It is systemic. It is real. Uh, and it has resulted in a net loss to the Australian taxpayer of $209.5 billion. Uh, it is recklessness on a grand scale, and we do not want to compound this recklessness with supporting this levy. Here, here. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Cunningham. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to take the opportunity today to support the bills before the House, that is the Tax Laws Amendment Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill 2011 and the Income Tax Rates Amendment Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill 2011. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I, like, I imagine everybody in this House um, was both shocked and awed by uh, the events that uh, occurred over the uh, New Year period and, in particular, the devastating impacts that uh, those floods had on the populations of Queensland. Um, I think there would be very few of us who uh, didn't feel our hearts go out to the people in those tr very traumatic and um, extraordinary circumstances. And certainly for those in my own area of the Illawarra, um, it took us back to the floods that we experienced in 1998. Uh, when again uh, there was significant uh, damage to property, but not the loss of life uh, that we sadly saw in the Queensland circumstances. And so, of course, these particular circumstances then confront the government with a, um, a decision on how we will undertake our responsibilities in responding to those flood circumstances and to our um, our responsibilities, but more importantly our desire to assist with the reconstruction efforts, and that's why we have the bills before us as they are today. Uh, the bills clearly are intended to impose a temporary flood recovery levy uh, on Australian resident and foreign resident individual taxpayers, and it should be indicated that uh, it is a progressive form of taxation. It applies to those with taxable incomes of 50,001 or more in the 2011-12 income year only. Uh, the levy will be applied at the rate of 0.5 per cent of taxable income for those earning between $50,001 and $100,000 in the 2011-12 income year. And of course, uh, being progressive, it will then apply at a rate of 1 per cent for those earning a taxable income of um, $100,001 or more in the 2011-12 income year. Uh, it should be also indicated that the bills do make provisions for exemptions, obviously uh, a common sense exemption from the levy for the people who were affected by the natural disaster. Uh, and this will be the leg a legislative instrument. This instrument will provide an exemption for, from the levy for, firstly, people who received an Australian Government disaster recovery payment for a natural disaster in 2010-11, and for people who met the Australian Government disaster recovery payment criteria for a disaster in an NDRRA area in 2010-11. So this will mean, in effect, um, Deputy Speaker, that the proposed levy in these bills uh, will see about 50 per cent of all taxpayers not required to pay anything because they are uh, under the, the limit. Uh, over 60 per cent will pay less than a dollar a week, and about 70 per cent will pay less than two dollars a week. I should indicate. Uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, that I've had some conversations with people in my local area when this temporary flood levy was first introduced. 
Uh, and one of the issues that people raised with me was the fact that they had made personal donations, particularly to the Premier's flood appeal, um, but also donations to other of the classic uh, organisations that people uh, support, who then go on and support communities in areas such as this. And, uh, the, I think the important thing in that conversation with them was to indicate that, as I did myself, as many of us do, when we make those personal donations, they go towards supporting and helping families in the crisis situation, that is you know, purchasing uh, replacement clothing, replacement household goods, uh, money to live on. That's the intention of giving that uh, donation, is that it goes directly to that sort of support, whereas the levy and the government's responsibilities is around reconstruction efforts and so it's around putting the infrastructure back in place that allows communities to recover. And uh, certainly uh, I know when I talked to a lot of the charities in my own electorate at the time and said, look, how can we best help? Uh, they, their advice to me was to encourage people to make financial donations, not goods in kind at that time because of the whole issue about transport infrastructure no longer being in place, quite clearly because of the nature of the disaster, and that uh, they would find it particularly problematic to be moving items around. So the, the infrastructure being re, um, rebuilt and uh, put back into place is really, really important, particularly for these communities to get back to some normality. That's the role that the government takes on, and that's what the levy monies are, are utilised for. So it's quite a different task to that which people undertake when they make a personal donation. These particular bills um, uh, will have a financial impact of about $1.8 billion over the forward estimates periods, that's 2011-12 uh, to 2014-15. And that, of course, takes into account that there are exemptions for some taxpayers from paying the levy. Uh, I should indicate too that um, it does recognise that <coughs> the size of the, the recent flood events uh, are quite unprecedented and the impacts are significantly uh, greater than we have ever seen before. At the, at the point of time uh, in putting these bills together, the uh, estimate was somewhere around $5.6 billion, and that of course is a significant responsibility to be taken on in rebuilding that infrastructure to that cost. The government put a package together to address that, and it's a balanced package. It balances the every one dollar of levy that is raised in these uh, measures through these bills is also balanced by uh, two dollars in savings cuts made in broader pro programs more broadly. And so it's a balance between finding savings within the budget but also having a one-off levy. And it recognises the significant and unprecedented level of these events and the responsibilities that they bring on to the government. Uh, and of course, it is a one-off levy for one year, uh, not an unprecedented circumstance uh, as a levy. Uh, certainly, we have seen numerous levies. And under the Howard government, we saw numerous levies introduced for specific one-off um, purposes, and uh, this is, I think, a sensible way to approach addressing this particular problem. Uh, it should, uh, the point should be made that um, whilst the, the flood impact is devastating, we have to make sure that we, we retain an ongoing fiscal responsibility not only for the uh, importance of uh, the balanced budget to our economic well-being, but also the importance of balanced budget uh, to the longer-term economic growth and opportunities in our communities, including in the communities that have been affected by um, these events over, over the January period. Uh, we are going to see, obviously, a growing demand, uh, particularly as uh, the minerals industry continues to expand, for infrastructure growth in order to deal with the growth in the, the economy. And in order to keep uh, those pressures balanced within the economy more broadly, it is important that the government continue to sustain a balanced budget approach. And so, in these circumstances, the view has been taken that um, the best way to achieve both the immediate uh, requirements of the government to meet its commitments under reconstruction and the longer-term requirements 
that the budget stays in balance and that uh, inflationary pressures are kept off in the economy, including those created by uh, potential, uh, well, real future growth in uh, some of the main areas of our economy, is to deal with costs as they arise and to manage them uh, in the budget cycle. And that's why this approach has been taken, and I think it is a sensible approach that balances the responsibilities of the government immediately with our more longer-term solid foundations for managed growth into the future. It is an important challenge. It's a critical challenge. Uh, nobody can predict to any significant accuracy the sorts of events that we saw uh, unfold with these flooding disasters. And uh, I think it is incumbent upon governments when they respond to do so in as practical but also as uh, long-term view as they can. And that's what these bills are seeking to do, and that's what this response, fiscal response to our responsibility seeks to do. Um, the government, of course, will be um, involved in uh, funding this infrastructure uh, being put back in place through uh, the the reconstruction authorities, and so uh, I'm confident that uh, that will be carried out in an exemplary and efficient manner. I just want to uh, take a, a few moments uh, in this debate also to touch on a, a broader issue, in Mr. Deputy Speaker, in terms of the flood reconstruction efforts. To say that, um, and to put on the record of this place, that I've had some other conversations with people in my community um, and some of um, uh, people more broadly who have emailed me uh, around the issue of people raising the view that our overseas aid program should in some way be curtailed people use different terms freeze it for a while cut it whatever it may be in order to meet our commitments to um, our fellow Australians in flood affected areas and uh, I have to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was a bit disappointed that one of my colleagues in this House, a member for Hume, um, made that call publicly, uh, on the, and I was contacted by the local ABC for a response for it. At the end of the day, Deputy Speaker, I have said this to people, I think that, as a nation, we have no problem meeting our financial commitments to each other and our financial commitments to those most in need in the international community. They are not in competition, and I think it is unhelpful, to say the least, for people to argue that there is a competition between these things. There has been much discussion about the importance of our overseas aid, beyond the fact that um, I work with many church communities in my area around programs like the Five Past Five program to make sure that children in developing parts of the world actually live to the age of five. There is beyond the compassion and, I would think, common humanity of ma many, many people, and I would hope most in this House, to see support for the most desperate and needy, and particularly for children uh, in the rest of the world, there's also a really hard-nosed, pragmatic importance to what we do with our international aid program. And that is about the fact, and I alluded to this in my contribution in this House to the debate on the Afghanistan war effort. There is a transformative and important role for education in making the world a more peaceful and harmonised place to live in for all people. And I think that many of the things we do with our aid program in targeting health and wellbeing, in targeting women, in targeting the education of children, have hard-nosed economic and um, peaceful benefits for us as a nation. And in particular, I think that uh, it was very, very saddening that many of those comments targeted the program that was implemented under the Howard government of funding schools in Indonesia as an important, if you like, soft approach to uh, addressing the issue of terrorism in our region. I think that that is a commendable initiative. I'm sure that um, the government under John Howard when they introduced it at the time, saw it not only as a compassionate move and a value of uh, delivering education to those children, but also as a hard-nosed, sensible approach to addressing terrorism in our region. That has not changed, 
and I think that there was a very sad underlying tone. You can, you can um, legitimise it away in any debating format you want, but there is no doubt the underlying tone was we are giving money to uh, Indonesians at the expense of our own people, and it was whistling at um, the least attractive aspects of our personalities. And I think that's always a very, very sad thing when you see it. My view is, and I said this straight to people who spoke to me from the local area, we can do both, we should do both, and we should not be pitting one against the other. And I really was particularly saddened that um, that was an aspect of the debate that came out. I think there is always room to argue how you fund things. I think there's been some contributions across the chamber in this debate, which are actually pragmatically arguing about how best to fund things, and that's legitimate. But I would hope that we uh, do not see a return to those sorts of um, pitting of principles against each other that are unnecessary, unhelpful and I don't think progress um, this place and its reputation at all. So I just want to add those comments in supporting these bills before the House, Deputy Speaker, and indicate that I think the government's taken a sensible approach in this. The question is the bill read a second time. All those of that the minister. Mr Speaker, I would like to thank all members who have contributed to the debate on the Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill 2011. I also believe it is only right to begin the summing up of the debate by acknowledging and thanking all those members of our Australian community who have contributed and will continue to contribute to the floods relief and reconstruction effort. Of course, so many of our fellow Australians are continuing to do their utmost, day after day, week after week, month after month. There is much to be done. During these times ahead, the relentless recovery workers will have their sleeves rolled up and their minds intensely focused on the physical and emotional effort of rebuilding. We include, of course, the engineers, the bridge builders, the asphalt crews, the council workers. We're talking about the electricians, the plumbers, the carpenters, the gardeners and the concrete pourers. We're talking about our modest, ordinary fellow citizens who will literally pick up the pieces and put the flood and cyclone devastated parts of our country back together again. Mr Acting Speaker, we are talking about our farmers. Our farmers went through six major rain events between November and January. This resulted in widespread flooding to an almost unprecedented extent. Vegetable crops, grain, cotton and sorghum have all been affected. The cash flow of our farms has been hit hard. Sugar volumes, while still too early to measure, have been significantly affected, with some estimates are upwards of three to five million tonnes. Banana Central has been hit very hard. We won't know the extent of the livestock losses until the second muster in May, June and July, but we should be prepared for hard news. What is especially frustrating is the decimation of crops has occurred at a time of high commodity prices. So whilst I recognise that higher yields may compensate for reduced crop size, it's tremendously disappointing for literally thousands and thousands of farmers who have experienced many years of drought that they can't get the boom which was so close on the horizon for them. At the same time, our farmers are seeking to have equipment finance contracts waived, loan repayments deferred, temporary overdrafts arranged, access to financial facilities without fees and even second mortgages. Times, uh, times are tough for those on the land, especially for those who are under duress before these floods and storms. Our flood-affected farmers are focused on the physical, cleaning up, restoring fences, collecting stock. At the same time, the vital transport links to market have been sorely hit. Many railway line foundations were washed out. Highway surfaces have been torn up and great slabs literally washed off the roads. Great, gully, great gutters have been gullied out underneath the foundations of our highways, the arterials and country roads. Key transport arterials, like the road down the range from Toowoomba or the rail line from Toowoomba to Brisbane, we have seen the foundations literally washed away. The volume of water was unimaginable, the damage impressive. Clearly, our farmers and primary producers and commodity producers have a major issue with road and rail damage. They cannot move stock and crops. It is a big impact on their cash flow. It's reported that slaughterhouses are 85 per cent down on last year because stock movement is curtailed. We need to line up our farmers' confidence with commodity prices, and there is real stress in the transport sector. Smaller transport operators have to take longer routes with higher costs and indeed travel on roads, lesser roads with lower, lower limits. 
The extra distances mean extra cost and delay. As I've said, the times are tough and the landscape's not like anything that we're used to. But all sorts of Australians are going to help fix this up, indeed make it better. This piece of legislation is our government's contribution to backing up our people. It's about ensuring the country as a whole can give the hard-working builders of Brisbane's future, of the builders of Ipswich's future and of Toowoomba's future and the Lockyer Valley's future and Tully's future and so many other places in Queensland, Victoria and northern New South Wales. This bill is about making sure the national government can give them the full funding support to get the job done and done quickly. So in backing the recovery effort through this progressive and balanced levy, we unequivocally back all of our people engaged in recovery from all walks of life who are building Australia's future. And we thank them profoundly for what they're doing. The natural disasters, of course, of this wretched summer have hit many Australians hard. The worst, of course, has been the tragic loss of life in the most heart-wrenching and most difficult and heartbreaking of circumstances. Every death resulting from the floods has saddened, or saddened us all. And we've seen the widespread damage, but we saw also the widespread damage after the Black Saturday Victorian bushfires. And we've seen how people rebuild, and we can do it again after these storms and floods. Australians are a resilient lot when times are tough. And I think that we've all been impressed and inspired by the sense of community and shared spirit that's been so evident in the story of natural disaster. So tough Australians deserve a federal government that has their back. And that's what this levy legislation is about. In addition to the enormous human impact, the impact on public property and infrastructure has been massive. The total rebuild estimate is in the order of $5.6 billion. This is, a, this is a significant promise which Australians should honour to those who have been affected. We will need to rebuild a remarkable amount of public infrastructure that has been destroyed or severely damaged by the floods. This bill will substantially help with the rebuilding of that public infrastructure through the imposition of a one-year flood reconstruction levy. And it's important to distinguish this levy, with all, which will be used to rebuild infrastructure, with the charitable donations that many Australians have already generously made. In recent weeks, many Australians have donated to charitable funds to assist people affected by the floods to help them with their personal costs. An extraordinary $220 million has been raised so far in charitable donations, a fact which speaks volumes about the generosity of ordinary Australians and the Australian spirit of helping out your friends. These funds held by charities will help individuals and families affected directly and personally by the floods, help them rebuild their lives, their homes and indeed replace some of their possessions. The flood levy, on the other hand, will help rebuild essential infrastructure damaged by the floods, such as the schools and the bridges, the hospitals, the parks, and the Warrigo, the Carnarvon, the Bruce, the Capricorn and the Cunningham highways, to list just some. As I've said, the total estimated cost to the Australian government to help communities recover and rebuild infrastructure in flood-affected regions is estimated to be around $5.6 billion. There were calls by some witnesses to the House of Representatives' inquiry that we should take the full cost of the government share of reconstruction onto the budget by taking debt. This is not what we will do. We will pay as we go. This is the right thing to do in an economy that is approaching capacity. We have a mining boom that is driving sustained terms of trade, the likes of which we haven't seen in many, many decades, and a huge investment pipeline. In those circumstances, it is the right thing to do to bring the budget back into surplus in 2012-13. I say again, in an economy that's growing strongly, it is important that we pay as we go. The government will therefore fund, fund around two-thirds of this reconstruction bill through spending cuts and the deferral of infrastructure projects. This includes $1 billion of infrastructure deferrals that will free up not only money but workers and equipment. The remainder of the cost will be met through a one-year flood reconstruction levy, and this levy will end at midnight on the 30th of June 2012. The levy will be paid through the tax withheld from regular wages and salaries, like personal income tax and the Medicare levy. The levy is modest, the levy is progressive, meaning that those that can pay slightly more will do so. It is based on taxable income earned by individuals, that is, assessable income, less allowable deductions. Taxable income is what is used for the Medicare levy. And taxable income is what, is what was used for previous levies, such as the gun buyback levy and the proposed East Timor levy under the coalition government. And the flood levy is modest in terms of the amount required from any one individual given their income. Anyone with taxable income in 2011-12 of $50,000 or less will not pay the flood reconstruction levy. Taxpayers with taxable income between $50,000 and $1 and $100,000 will pay half a per cent of their taxable income over $50,000.
taxpayers with taxable income over $100,000 will pay half a per cent of their taxable income between $50,001 and $100,000 and 1 per cent of their taxable income over $100,000. It is modest in that a person on average wages, which is around $68,000, will be paying $1.74 per week. For a person on $80,000, it is worth $2.88 per week. That is less than the cup of price of a cup of coffee. And that is about a tenth of the $29.81 weekly tax cut they've received from the first three years of this government. A taxpayer with taxable income of $100,000 will pay $250 in 2011-12, or $4.81 a week. And that is just 12 per cent of the $41.35 weekly tax cut that they've received from the first three years of this government. Importantly, taxpayers affected by the recent disasters, not just the floods, but also Cyclone Yazi and the West Australian bushfires, will not have to pay this levy if it meets certain criteria. There will be an exemption from the levy for many taxpayers. For those who received an Australian Government disaster recovery payment for a disaster that occurred in 2010-11, there will be an exemption for those who were ineligible for an Australian Government disaster recovery payment but have been affected by a disaster declared under the National Disaster Recovery and Relief Arrangements and meet at least one of the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment criteria. Well, finally, there will be an exemption for those who are a New Zealand non-protected special category visa holder who received an ex gratia payment from the government in relation to a disaster that occurred in 2010-11. Employees who are exempt from the levy will be able to ask their employer to not have the levy withheld from their regular pay with other tax withheld. Alternatively, at the end of the year, the Australian Tax Office will assess taxpayers' tax liability, taking into account their exemption from the levy. I might add that the Australian Tax Office has implemented a range of support strategies for those affected by the floods. Over the last month or so, those affected by natural disaster have had more to worry about than sorting out their tax affairs. So, where necessary, the ATO has provided extra time to pay debts and lodge business activity statements. The tax office has helped reconstruct tax records where documents have been destroyed, as well as providing an emergency support information line. The government is also supporting flood-affected businesses and primary producers through assistance under the Natural Disaster Relief and Recovery Arrangements. These arrangements provide concessional loans, clean-up and recovery grants and freight subsidies for primary producers. In addition, the government has activated the disaster income recovery subsidy for individuals, including business owners whose income has been affected by a recent disaster event. In recognition of the exceptional nature of tropical cyclone Yazi and the damage it has caused, we have activated additional assistance for businesses and primary producers in these affected areas. This includes concessional loans of up to $650,000 and a grant component of up to $50,000. Wage assistance for employers, including primary producers, has been made available to help maintain the viability of businesses and the local community. And a $20 million Rural Resilience Fund has been established, jointly funded by the federal and Queensland governments, to help fund business and community support measures such as farm cleanups, counselling and social support measures. As part of the debate on the bill, we have heard a number of comments that go to demonstrate that those opposite have a long way to go before they can offer a responsible alternative. We have heard those opposite say that the levy is too big. I mean, the Coalition conveniently forget that their extravagant spending promises at the last election required them to campaign on the back of a levy that was $3 billion per year and had no end date. We have heard those opposite say that they just wish the global financial crisis had never happened. It would be so much easier if revenues hadn't been downgraded by $110 billion because then Parliament wouldn't have had to make a hard choice. In government, we understand the global financial crisis was real and Australia needed to respond. The fact is that the opposition opposed the measures that helped keep Australia out of recession. So if they had their way back then, we would have been in a much worse position now to respond to these disasters today. They've claimed it's easy to find savings, but then they pitched up $700 million of savings that they'd already counted to offset their other spending. In government, we understand that a saving cannot be counted twice. It is inconceivable to me how any Queenslander in this place can line up against a bill designed to help rebuild their homeland? How can there be MPs who would rather go for some fairly unsophisticated politics over soundly developed policy? 
It is as strange as it is disappointing. This levy is an important part of rebuilding after the natural disasters that we've seen over the last few months. I believe it's part of the Australian way where everybody chips in to help a neighbour who is in distress. I believe that those citizens who are most affected by the floods want this parliament to get on and make its decisions so that people can concentrate on their recovery. I think that people in other places affected by the flood expect the people in this place to do their part to help them move through the natural disasters which they've seen in the first part of this year. Once again, I'd like to thank those members for their contribution to the debate on this bill, which is of such importance for Australia's response to the recent devastating floods and storms. Order. The question is that the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion, please say aye. aye. Against? No. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Pak de doors. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Point the honourable members for Shortland and Fowler tell us for the eyes and the members for Parks and Barker tell us for the nose.
Order. The result of the division is I 72, no 71. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Order. The House will now consider the bill in detail. I understand it is the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole. There being no objection, I will allow that course of action. Order with members, if they are leaving the chamber, do so quickly and quietly. Otherwise, they should resume their seats and sit there quietly. The question is that the bill be agreed to. The Assistant Treasurer. Supplementary explanatory memorandum to the bill and to the income tax rates amendment. Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill 2011. I ask Leave of the House to move Government Amendments 1 to 12 as circulated together. Is there any objection to Leave being granted? There being no objection, Leave is granted. Assistant Treasurer. The amendments change the name of the levy. The, to the Assistant Treasurer will move the amendments I move formally. The and I move the Government Amendments 1 to 12 as circulated together. The Assistant Treasurer. The amendments change the name of the levy to the Temporary Flood and Cyclone Reconstruction Levy. This change reflects the levy will contribute to rebuilding across multiple disasters in multiple states. Members will be well aware of the devastating impact of Cyclone Yazi in particular. Uh, I would submit this to the House. Order. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that this bill, as amended, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill, as amended, has been agreed to. Assistant Treasurer. I ask Leave of the House to move the third reading immediately. Is there any objection to Leave being granted? There being no objection, Leave is granted. Assistant Treasurer. I move that this bill now be read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. The Government business. Clerk. Orders of the day number two, income tax rates amendment, temporary flood reconstruction levy bill 2011, resumption of debate on the second reading. Well, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Income Tax Rates Act 1986 and for related purposes. I understand it's the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith. There being Assistant Treasurer. I move that this bill now be read a third time. No. Um. Okay, sorry. I need to get the sheet. Okay. Thank you, pardon. Um, I ask leave of the House to remove government amendments one to six as circulated together. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move government amendments. Assistant Treasurer. I beg your pardon. I move government amendments one to six as circulated. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes. The member for Kennedy. We just want to say we appreciate the government's uh, concern and sensitivity on this issue. Thank you very much. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that this bill as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill as amended has been agreed to. Assistant Treasurer. I ask the Leader of the House to move the third reading immediately. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Assistant I'm, Treasurer. I move that this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Fowler tellers for the ayes, and the members for Parks and Barker tellers for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is I 72, no 71. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Income Tax Rates Act 1986 and for related purposes. Order. I have to report that the Screen Australia Transfer of Assets Bill 2010 has been fully considered by the main committee. A Governor-General's message recommending an appropriation for the purposes of the bill has been reported and the bill has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Speaker, I ask the Leader of the House to move the third reading immediately. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to change the name of the National Film and Sound Archive and to transfer certain assets and liabilities of Screen Australia to the National Film and Sound Archive and for related purposes. Lord, I have to report that the Statute Law Revision Bill No. 2, 2010, has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Parliamentary Secretary. I ask the leave of the House to move the third reading immediately. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to make various amendments of the statute law of the Commonwealth to repeal certain obsolete acts and for related purposes. The clerk. Government business, order of the day number three, water efficiency labelling and standards amendment bill 2010, resumption of debate on the second reading. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The member for Murray in continuation. I thank you, Mr Speaker. And now, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, in continuing my contribution to the debate on the Water Efficiency Labelling and Standards Amendment Bill, I will move on from supporting the move to streamline the consumer advice about water consumption of their household appliances to a call for a similar rating system to apply to on-farm water use efficiency measures, or at least for this government to understand how important it is that every irrigator has the support to introduce measures that will save water and increase productivity. It is, of course, vital that both those things occur. No farmer, who is, of course, a business person, is going to be able to invest in uh, reduction in water consumption if it's at the cost of his own capacity to earn an income or improve productivity. Australian farmers, unlike most others in the developed economies, do not receive massive government subsidies to help them feed the nation. Australian farmers, along with their New Zealand counterparts, are some of the world's most efficient and effective growers, particularly of arid zone cereals, but also in horticulture, sheep and meat production and dairying and fruit production. Over the last 50 years, there's been an absolute revolution in the way water use efficiency has been the centre of particularly irrigation farming thinking. There has been massive investment, particularly in my electorate in northern Victoria, in whole farm planning, the introduction of reuse systems which capture every drop of, water, of rain as well as surface uh, rainfall in order for it to be reused, pumped back up to the um, top of the paddocks to be reused again and again. There's been laser grading to facilitate that process. There's been subsurface irrigation installed, particularly under row crops. There's been new fast watering techniques introduced, which require different technologies. Pressurised systems for horticulture and orchards are now commonplace, and in fact, where they're not in place is because the irrigator can't afford to make the conversions. There's no argument any longer about the importance of pressurised systems for orchards and for some um, other crops, like, for example, tomatoes. The point about all of this, of course, is that it, at the moment, the Murray-Darling Basin uh, Authority has before it 
a guide to a plan. It's a, a guide to a plan they produced over, la over the last two years, which says that the way to find further savings of water for the environment is not primarily through encouraging water use efficiency, in particular from irrigators, but in fact to buy back water from so-called willing sellers. This so-called buyback from willing sellers is non-strategic. It comes at a time when farmers have just survived, most of them, seven years of drought. Many, of course, fell by the wayside because of the financial pressures of not having sufficient water to continue their uh, agricultural production. At the end of those seven years of drought, we've had the worst floods on record. And so, just at the time when their financial pressures for some are just too much for them to remain viable, just at the time when they have the lowest fun, uh, emotional um, resources as well to carry on, they have just put into the system another of these non-strategic water buyback tenders placed um, into the marketplace by the Commonwealth Government. Of course, we have, as the Regional Australia Standing Committee, uh, which is charged with the review and analysis of the Murray-Darling Basin Guide to a Plan, we have put in an interim set of recommendations just some 10 days or so ago. Our chairman, the, um, uh, Mr Tony Windsor, placed those recommendations before the minister, and the first of those was to be more strategic in relation to water buybacks. I'm personally disappointed that that advice, while it appeared to be um, taken seriously and supported by the minister, and yet we've had another announcement that the roll-on of water buybacks, the non-strategic roll-on of water buybacks from so-called willing sellers is to continue as if there'd been no recommendation at all. Now, non-strategic buyback of water has nothing to do with water use efficiency, unfortunately. It's about financially stressed farmers bending to the will of their lenders and putting the last of their liquid assets in fact of course it's a bit of an ironic term but the last of their easily disposed of assets their water on the market so they can pay back some of their borrowings we don't have unfortunately sufficient investment from this government into on-farm water use efficiency nor is there sufficient investment into the irrigation systems themselves some of which like Goulburn Murray water are over 100 years old in places and certainly need to be smartened up in terms of their own water use efficiency i'm very concerned that at a time when our farmers most need support to get back on their feet after first a drought but now the devastating floods, this is a time for the government to announce that there will be support for farmers to be able to improve their water use, to be able to then at the same time as a consequence of that improve their productivity to put them back on their feet financially for the future. I have to say that in northern Victoria, in my part of the uh, Murray-Darling Basin, the southern parts, we have been acknowledged as world best practice in tomato growing, in dairying, to name just two of our particular industry sectors. Both of those two types of, in, of agricultural production were particularly hard hit by the floods. We have virtually wiped out our tomato crops for this year. This is manufacturing tomato growing. And tragically, that means that our multinational manufacturers of food product are reaching to imports to replace that what was before locally produced tomato ingredient. Unfortunately, um, that can't be helped this year, but we are very, very concerned that it will become the habit of these manufacturers as they find the dollar supports them and it's easy for them to reach to the overseas market for things like tomato paste and diced tomato when our own locally grown product was world best in quality and indeed the prices they were being paid meant that there was absolutely not much fat at all in the system for the growers. So we need that on-farm water use efficiency investment from the Commonwealth as well as from the states. And having made that investment, I think it's more than in order to suggest that farms which can be shown to be most efficient in water use have a rating or a um, standard that is recognised by the consumer that this product was produced in a way that was friendly to the environment, particularly in relation to water consumption. These sorts of improvements can be readily identified and measured. 
And let me say to you that in our part of the world, again, farmers have themselves invested literally billions of dollars in these measures. In the past, they have received some support to help do things like whole farm plans and reuse systems in order to try and indeed successfully manage to stop groundwater accessions, which of course led to salinity problems in the past. We are now concerned that all of this water, some of it will be lying on parts of my electorate for another 12 months, that all these floodwaters will again exacerbate the groundwater um, levels, the salinity levels, and we need right now some Commonwealth investment to make sure that irrigation systems on farms are repaired as a consequence of the floods um, destroying them, and that we have, instead of uh, the quick and dirty buyback of water from uh, financially stressed farmers. Instead, the government understands the problems of water price distortion in the markets. It understands that that does not lead to more efficient production. Instead, it focuses on putting the billions of dollars that the coalition had in fact in place of this investment. It puts at least $5 billion into on-farm water use efficiency measures. The dividends will be absolutely magnificent. The country's food security will be improved. We will have the farmers able to continue to manage the environment as they want to. The jobs that spin off from agricultural production will be there and will be multiplied. There is a win-win in every way that you look at the investment in on-farm water use efficiency. So I commend this bill, which began by uh, making sure that a labelling of domestic uh, appliances that are water users, that that labelling is as efficient and transparent as it can be and helps consumers make the right choices about purchasing things like dishwashers, washing machines um, and so on. But I suggest this government could look at also water use efficiency standards and um, assessments and labelling in relation to on-farm water use efficiency measures, and I think that will serve the nation very well. I thank you. Question, the, order. the question is that the bill be read a second time. The honourable member for Kingston. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I do rise today to speak in favour of the Water Efficiency Labelling and Standards Amendment Bill 2010. This bill is about conserving our most precious resource, which is water. Uh, by refining the way we provide information to consumers about water efficiency or various plumbing products. By passing the bill, we can reduce confusion and empower consumers. We can provide greater certainty for industry and ultimately we can promote the adoption of effective water use to assist with, water con with our water conservation efforts. The Water Efficiency Labelling Standards Scheme, established by the Water Efficiency Labelling and Standards Act 2005, aims to promote the use of water-saving technologies by require, requiring specific products are labelled to indicate uh, and assess their water efficiency. As with energy rating labels on electrical appliances, a six-star rating system is used to demonstrate the performance of the product, with six being the most water or energy efficient. This is a simple concept designed to empower consumers to select a product on the basis of, basis of its efficiency. Since its introduction in 2005 and since it became mandatory in July of 2006, there has been a, fish, a significant evidence suggesting that the scheme positively influences preferences. The Minister for Environment determines which product must comply with the scheme, and some of the products which are currently covered include showers, toilets, urinals, taps, dishwashing machines and clothes washing machines. In addition to meeting the requirements of this scheme, these products are subject to the Watermark Certification Scheme, which operates under state and territory plumbing regulations. As Watermark Certification is concerned with protecting the water supply by ensuring the products are fit for use. It is only required for products to be illegally installed. On the contrary, the wells re registration and labelling is required before a product can be sold. And so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this creates an anonymity. anonymity sorry, our consumers are unwittingly purchased wells plumbing products, which are legally available but not legally able to be installed. Furthermore, some consumers may misinterpret the Wells label as an endorsement for the product by the government that, is, that it is fit for use. 
It is this situation that has led the House of Representatives Standing Committee on the Environment Environment and Heritage to recommend in its 2007 report, Managing the Flow, Regulating Plumbing Product Quality in Australia, that the watermark certification be made a prerequisite of the compliance with the Wells Scheme. If this bill is passed, it will do just that. The proposed amendment will introduce a general provision enabling the minister to include additional uh, plumbing requirements, such as those established by the states and territories, and from time to time as requirements for registration under the Well Scheme. Naturally, the minister will retain the right to remove any additional requirements should they be no longer appropriate. And so once the bill is enacted, the watermark certification can be made a prerequisite for all well scheme registered plumbing products via ministerial determination. There is a strong support for the introduction of a general provision of this kind within the industry. It will create greater certainty for both consumers and plumbers, and ultimately it will mean more water conservation. Mr Deputy Speaker, this government is preparing Australia for a future that has less water as a result of climate change, as a result of drought. Water is one of our most precious resources, and I know that acutely as being a member from South Australia. And we must do everything in our power to secure our supplies for future generations. We need to act now not only to protect and restore the environment, but also to secure the health of our rivers so that all Australians can continue to enjoy this vital resource well into the future. And it's been this government that's been getting on with the job with doing with conserving our water resources. Since coming to office, this government has, has made significant and uh, has introduced significant initiatives to ensure that uh, supply, uh, securing our water supplies is our top priority. We've introduced a number of initiatives aimed at restoring the balance in the Murray-Darling Basin, one of our most valuable river systems, and our nation's food bowl. We looked at initiatives including water buybacks, which I was disappointed to hear the member for Murray uh, uh, criticise so acutely in her report. We do know that the opposition has been uh, quite quite flippant when it comes to water buybacks in the election period. Uh, we saw the uh, Leader of the Opposition come down to South Australia and say that he would implement the Murray-Darling Basin uh, re report immediately. And in fact, I think he indicated the time frame would be about two weeks after the election. He would implement it in full. Now we've seen uh, an enormous backflip from the Opposition, uh, where they now are scrapping the water buybacks. Well, what, what the Leader of the Opposition has clearly given a slap in the face to every South Australian that actually believed his commitment when he came down to South Australia. So it is disappointing, but this government is getting on with the job with water buybacks, investing in water saving infrastructure, and, and working with uh, the in, having the independent authority come up with a plan and working through the parliament as well to ensure that we do have a Murray-Darling uh, river system for the future. Because the thing that the member for Murray missed in her statement is that a river that is dying, that is dead, that is, uh, has salt problems, <laughs> that is destroyed, is of no use to anyone. It's no use to the farmers. It's no use to the environment. It's no use to people that rely on that river for water. It's of no use to anyone. And I hope that the uh, member for Murray will consider that as she goes around opposing water buybacks. But, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, um, the government is also working in a whole range of other areas. In, in my electorate in particular, there has been significant investment of how we actually start to use water in a better way. And I was very pleased that this government provided money to the local uh, council, the Onkaparinga Council, providing three uh, $34.5 million for waterproofing the South Stage 1. This program looks at how we can recycle water to use in different areas, including irrigation in the McLaren Vale region, but also how we might use uh, recycled water to water our parks, our gardens, a whole range of different areas. And this uh, program has been going very well. Uh, we use the uh, um, sewerage water from the Christie's Beach wastewater treatment plant, and we re recycle it, actually ensuring that we get some, a, a great outcome and, and fresh water that can be used uh, for a whole lot of different, different purposes, including on, on private properties, on, uh, on their, their 
gardens and, and alike. So that has been a very successful project. But I was also pleased that this government has also uh, backed up their commitment by investing $14.97 million for stormwater harvesting in the Onkaparinga River. This is a joint project with the city of Onkaparinga, the state government and the federal government, looking at how we can harvest stormwater, not just let this stormwater go out uh, into the into the river, which causes uh, into the sorry the sea, which causes its own problems when it comes to uh, the local ecology, but how we can use that water to capture it uh, and then to reuse it uh, in a way that uh, is uh, that we uh, on parks, gardens, and and alike. This is um, really really important because uh, the city of Adelaide does rely, especially in years of drought, on water from the River Murray. So the more that we can conserve water, whether it's rainwater, whether it's recycled water, uh, the more that we can do that, it, it does lessen our pull on the River Murray. And I have to commend the City of Onkapringa for doing a great job in this area of really putting this forward for ensuring, for example, the McLaren Vale region that does provide a huge amount of uh, um, wonderful wine and a, a wonderful agricultural region uh, is starting to really uh, ensure itself against drought by being able to use recycled water and, um, and also the storm water. So um, it is a, a very visionary project. It is preparing um, the city and the suburbs for less water in the future. And I'd like to commend that. Um, the government has also recognised significantly that individuals can also play a big role in conserving water. And uh, this has been fantastic to see families and residents in my local community take up rebates offered by the government to subsidise the installation of water tanks and, and install grey water systems. And we recognise that these small changes to household water use can make a big difference when put together. And I'd like to particularly uh, commend uh, a couple of the surf lifesaving clubs in my area who have successfully um, obtained money under the National Rainwater and Greywater Initiative, uh, and that is the Aldinga Bay Surf Club and the Southport Surf Club, that have used it to install rainwater tanks and other water efficiency measures because they know uh, very well surf lifesaving might not seem connected too much to the environment. But it's those surf lifesavers that are down on the beach every day. They see what happens uh, uh, when uh, stormwater goes out into the sea, uh, especially when a lot of um, debris uh, goes out into the sea and then is washed up on the beach. So these surf lifesaving clubs are acutely aware of the impact uh, that uh, um, different uh, elements of stormwater can have on their beaches. And so they've been very keen to take up these water initiatives. And I know that there's a real focus from the surf lifesaving clubs in my area to be eco, very eco-friendly, and so they're taking up these types of initiatives to really make an impact. And I'd just like to also mention, take this opportunity to congratulate our Southport Surf Lifesaving Club, who did win the cleanest beach in Australia, uh, and uh, they do a great job down there. They get school children coming in and uh, trying to uh, trying to um, help with cleaning up the beach, and you know, really making this a, a a wonderful destination. So, if uh, you haven't been to Southport Surf Life Saving Club or Port Nalunga South, as it's sometimes known, come on down. It's a, a beautiful place to come. But they are doing their bit in being water efficient. So, we in my local electorate, there's also a number of other initiatives. Um, including the Green Precincts, which is the Woodcroft Green Precinct at the, uh, uh, neighbor, the Combined Library and Neighbourhood Centre. This is a very exciting initiative, which is um, incorporating best practice design features in water uh, conservation, water recycling, a whole range of areas. But they're not just doing that at, for the community uh, uh, centre that's being used there. They're actually putting it on as a demonstration hub. So they're putting it on as a demonstration hub so that families and uh, individuals can come in, have a look at what they, they're doing and get some ideas and take them back home. And I think this is a very exciting project. Um, the Commonwealth has contributed $750,000 to this. The Council, again, is contributing money to it. And I'm looking forward uh, to the opening of that uh, um, Woodcroft Green precinct earlier uh, uh, in, in the coming months. So I would certainly uh, think, once again, another exciting project. So there's another Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's a number of very exciting projects happening in my local area, 
all focused on conserving water, ensuring that uh, we are, are as efficient as possible with this very important resource. And so, certainly, this bill uh, is a, a very important bill as part of the government's agenda, ensuring that we take the issue of, of using our water in the most efficient possible way very seriously. And I commend the bill to the House. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, uh, I rise in support of this bill, uh, the Water Efficiency Labelling and Standards uh, Amendment Bill 2010, and the Commonwealth's efforts in increasing consumers' opportunities to make uh, informed choices of household products to help minimise the water that is used by our households. Now, Deputy Speaker, we've had uh, energy ratings. Uh, on appliances for many years, and I'm sure that we all agree on the merits of such a scheme. Uh, we also have had the Water Efficiency Labelling and Standards Scheme, giving us a similar, in, a similar insight into the uh, merits of uh, one appliance over another regarding water consumption. Uh, this bill before us simply enacts recommendations put to the government for the more efficient and effective functioning of this scheme in giving the minister the ability to make determinations on additional plumbing requirements, such as those established by the states and territories who regulate the um, plumbing industry. Uh, since the World Scheme was introduced in 2005, uh, there has been evidence, uh, I understand, that consumers are taking note of the water efficiency advice contained in the product labelling and making their consumer choices uh, with this in mind. And that's a good thing. We've seen a substantial shift over recent years in the deployment of systems that reduce the need for water. New systems have been popping up uh, in public and private uh, washrooms alike. Deputy Speaker, rainwater harvesting systems have made a very, very large impression on the public and also businesses who build their uh, custom offices or showrooms. People have become much more water-wise uh, on a residential level as well. Uh, a commercial level and in other areas of public lives. Uh, this is all clearly a very, very good thing and uh, a, mo a motive I would hope that uh, opposition would support. I welcome the further development and uptake of initiatives such as the Well Scheme and our Rainwater Harvesting Scheme in particular as they apply to households and other premises within South Australia. Uh, South Australian residents, residents of Adelaide and beyond have been doing their bit for water conservation over several years, uh, just as we continue to do so today and we will continue to do into the future. Deputy Speaker, historically Adelaide has sourced most of its potable water from uh, the River Murray, uh, though uh, through the early years of this century it was uh, sourcing over half of the 200 plus gigalitres per year consumed to keep the city going as it then was. In more recent years, through the drought, we have consumed much less, but the Murray has continued to be the lifeblood of Adelaide. Deputy Speaker, we strive, as we have striven over the years, to reduce the volume of water we use and consume. We try to pare back our water consumption, be it by 5 gigalitres, 10 gigalitres, 20 gigalitres or more from our historic levels of consumption. Now, a city with a population of well over a million people like Adelaide has striven to cut its consumption and its drain on the River Murray by 20-odd per cent. Over a million people are cutting back to save 30 gigalitres a year, year after year after year. And I'm glad that we've been able to do this, um, because the 30 gigalitres that Adelaide residents bend over backwards to save helps sustain the river system. Sadly, our river system within South Australia needs almost 2,000 gigalitres of water more than has typically flown down the Murray in, uh, in the last few uh, years. Uh, in this context, Adelaide's consumption of 140 gigalitres per year and our 30 gigalitres of saving might not seem like much, but the effort we make in Adelaide is very, very substantial as a proportion of the water we've taken in the past. Uh, while Adelaide's one million people and businesses use 140 odd gigalitres, uh, for example, the Goldburn region uses up to 1,700 gigalitres per year. Murray and Bridgie region uses up to 2,600 gigalitres per year. So the draw on the River Murray itself upstream from Wentworth is up to 3,500 gigalitres per year. Adelaide residents know what it means to save water. We know what it means to cut our consumption, to have some of our trees die, our gardens die, 
our parklands die. We've made these cuts in the past, and we know how much it hurts. And so I find it a bit uh, of a stretch when we uh, read from uh, the Basin Plan Community Consultation Minutes that some commentators um, argue that uh, the sustainability of the River Murray and the Basin generally would be improved if Adelaide simply uh, installed more rainwater tanks and took less water from the Murray. Now, the numbers I've already given show, I believe, how marginal a volume Adelaide takes in comparison to some other regions. Uh, when people raise their voices against the prospect of there being reductions in the total water taken out of the river system for other than critical human need purposes, I suggest they remember that they aren't the only regions that are affected uh, by variability in water availability. I also suggest they remember that any reductions in the maximum draw on water through the buyback scheme will be totally voluntary. Only those who wish to sell and engage in the sale of their licence will have the, their rights affected. Only those who have decided themselves to take up offers to sell their water licences uh, have had their water licences affected by the increase in environmental water. Uh, this is the case over the past few years, as it will be the case in the future. It's their choice and it's entirely up to them. The fact of the matter order, is— Order. It being 1.45 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 43. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Are there any member statements? I call the member for Fraser. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Amidst the hurly-burly of busy lives, it's sometimes easy to forget the transcendent power of the arts. Great art can inspire us, remind us of what truly matters in our lives. It can take us to new places and evoke strong emotions. The work of Fred Williams and Arthur Boyd, Cl Clifford Possum Chapeljari and Sidney Nolan can be truly breathtaking. For artists, producing artworks can bring enormous pleasure and fulfilment. On the north side of Lake Burley Griffin, there are a plethora of hard-working artists and small art galleries. These include Craft ACT, the Canberra Museum, Canberra School of Art Gallery, the Watson Arts Centre, the Chisholm Street Gallery, the Helen Maxwell Gallery, the Canberra Contemporary Arts Space, the Australian National Capital Artist Gallery, Megalo Access Art Studio and Gallery, the Strathnairn Homestead Gallery, the Am Aboriginal Dreamings Gallery, Arwen Gallery, the Graham Charlton Gallery and the Belconnen Arts Centre. And apparently there's even some good art displayed on the south side of the lake. I'm proud to have in the public gallery here today my mother-in-law, Anna Marie Newman. She's here today with my father-in-law, Robert Newman. Anna Marie is a talented and prolific artist, and the critters she makes bring great joy and admiration from others. I want to pay tribute to her and to all the artists and craftspeople whose work enriches our lives. Order other members. Uh, I call the member for Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to bring the attention of the House to the tragic death of 17-year-old Shanice Perry Shepherd, a beautiful, bright young girl who drowned at Bowling Green Bay National Park near Alligator Creek in my electorate on Sunday, the 12th of December last year. Shanice was with friends, having fun at the popular swimming hole, when a foot became trapped under a rock. It was raining heavily that day, and she was trapped in the rising water. Her friends tried frantically to free her foot and, kept her head, and keep her head above rising water for over an hour, but sadly Shanice drowned. What is so tragic about this story is that her friends trying to save her are also using, trying to use their mobile phones to call for help, but there was no mobile phone coverage. It is an absolute disgrace that here we are in the 21st century, in an area south of a major regional city like Townsville, can have such poor mobile phone coverage, a basic service that people in capital cities take for granted. And this sad story is an example of what can happen if the problem is not fixed. Unfortunately, we have a government hell-bent on building this multi-billion dollar NBN project, but I have to say people living and visiting Alligator Creek need adequate mobile phone coverage first. I call on the Communications Minister and the government to get the basics right to fix the problem of mobile phone coverage in this community, and maybe we can prevent a tragic death like this from ever happening again. Call the member for Canberra. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the people of Canberra for coming out in their thousands—1803, to be precise—yesterday morning to take part in the Donate Life Walk 2011. The walk was launched by the Parliamentary Secretary for Health and Ageing, Catherine King. This is the fifth year of the walk, which was named in honour of Terry Connolly, a former ACT Supreme Court judge, a former ACT Attorney-General and an organ donor. Terry was a much-loved member of the Canberra community who died of a heart attack while bike riding up Red Hill. He was only 50. 
Terry's daughters, Lara and Maddie, were students at St Clair's, and the school has always been a strong supporter of the work. Walk, rather. Yesterday, the girls were out in full force again, and they were the only ones to make the sun hats look glamorous and cool, much to, our chagrin, uh, much to the chagrin of everyone else. They were also supported by Dara Marlin and Mara's Colleges and the Boys and Girls Grammar Schools. Teams from the Australian Electoral Commission, Australian National University, National Health and Medical Research Council, Department of Health and Ageing and ACT government departments were also walking and running. I'd like to thank the members and senators who joined us for the walk this morning, yesterday morning, rather, particularly those new members of the Parliamentary Friends of Organ and Tissue Donation that the member for Brisbane and I established a few weeks ago in time for Donate Life Week this week. Finally, I'd like to congratulate the Parliamentary Secretary for yesterday's appointment of four well-known Australians as Donate Life Ambassadors. The new ambassadors, Amanda Keller, Denise Drysdale, Darren Hinch and Tanya Major, join the Governor-General, who is the inaugural ambassador. Order. The call the member for Ryan. Mr Deputy Speaker, I speak today in praise of an initiative of the CHILD Association in Ryan, the Glen Leiden School. The school is the only one of its kind providing invaluable support assistance and education for children with a serious disability. Catering for children with severe speech and language impairment, they provide a multidisciplinary program involving a range of specialist therapies within an educational setting. The Glen Eden School works in partnership with the Let's Talk Speech and Language Professional Centre and has recently launched a campaign to raise awareness of primary language disorder and have it recognised by the government as a disability. PLD is a developmental disorder that affects how a child thinks about, understands and uses language. The difficulties children with PLD face in dealing with the complexities of language impact drastically on their overall development, particularly their capacity to access an educational curriculum. PLD children struggle with learning, can be easily distracted and readily given to frustration, and be reluctant to learn new skills. In short, it is a disability that has a significant lifelong effect on a child, not being able to communicate, to understand others, and being unable to deal with the complexities of life in general is a very serious disability. That is why the Glen Eden School was founded. Their approach is to address a child's problems individually, to provide them with an opportunity to be able to speak and use language properly, greatly improving their outlook and chance in life. Under their structure, many of their students are able to transition into mainstream schools. The work of the Glen Eden School is truly life-changing. As an independent special school, the organisation must proactively seek out any support that it requires. The Executive Principal, Ms Ricky Rose Graydon, and the CHRD Association are currently seeking to have PLD included under the Better Start for Children with a Disability initiative. I commend the efforts of the Glen Eden School. Order. The member for Ryan's time has expired. The Foreign Minister? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I seek leave to make a short ministerial statement on Libya. I understand as to which of the House to grant leave. Leave is granted. The Foreign Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the House. Uh, the Australian Government condemns without reservation the use of violence in Libya against its population. Reports are that about 300 lives have been lost, but some estimates are as high as 1,000 lives having been lost. Colonel Gaddafi's threat to purge Libya house by house and inch by inch of the protest movement is a despicable act. The international community has a responsibility to take firm action in response. These are serious matters. I warmly welcome the call by the UN Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, for an international investigation into possible human rights violations. The Human Rights Commission will meet this Friday, and it is critical that the Council give careful consideration to how best to respond to Libya's crisis. I will travel to Geneva to attend the special session of the Human Rights Council early next week, and will urge prompt and united action by the international community in terms of these human rights violations in Libya. The Australian Government also welcomes the Arab League's strongly worded statement yesterday following its emergency talks and the League's decision to, dispend, uh, to suspend Libya from the Arab League. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, the UN Security Council met yesterday and in its statement called on the Government of Libya to meet its responsibility to protect its civilian population. This is an alive doctrine in international law which the Libyan regime should pay close attention to in terms of its impl implications for the future. Mr Deputy Speaker, I also note with concern that the Australian government has received reports that an Australian citizen may have been detained by Libyan officials on the evening of 21 February 2011 in Tripoli. The Australian Consul General in Tripoli has requested confirmation of the reported detention by diplomatic note and is seeking immediate consular access. No response has been received from the Libyan authorities. 
A dual Australian Libyan national was also reported to us on 6 December 2010 as being detained. Australia's Consul General has also requested by diplomatic note that Libyan authorities confirm whether this person has been detained and request immediate consular access. Libyan authorities have confirmed his detention but have not provided consular access. Mr Deputy Speaker, today I called in Libya's ambassador to Australia. I reminded the ambassador that under the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations that Libya has a, has a responsibility to advise of the detention of a foreign national and, furthermore, to allow consular access to Australian consular officials. I conveyed to the Libyan ambassador Australia's expectation that immediate consular access be granted to these men in accordance with Libya's international obligations. We are also in close contact with this man's family or these men's family and are providing them with consular assistance. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Australian government currently has 47 registered Australians still in Libya. Another 12 are on board a ferry waiting to depart Tripoli. Another four are on a privately organised charter ferry in Tripoli, which will leave around uh, this time. Of those still in Libya, 35 wish to depart, and we have been able, unable to contact 12. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we call on the Libyan government to immediately facilitate visas for our Australian consular staff to enter Libya to assist with the evacuation of Australians. At present, no such visas have been issued. Our Consul General, backed only by local staff, is managing this consular crisis on his own. He is doing an excellent job on Australia's behalf. Order the, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, a member for Curtin, has a question. Yeah. On indulgence. On indulgence. Or seek so, leave. Seek leave. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, the situation in Libya remains grim and chaotic. The final outcome remains uncertain and unpredictable. Uh, we join with the international community in fearing that the brutal response of Colonel Gaddafi may well continue. The Libyan government has forfeited its right to govern the people of Libya. In particular, particular, Colonel Gaddafi has failed in his fundamental responsibility as the leader of his people to protect his people. We note that the United Nations has issued a strongly worded condemnation against the Libyan government, and we support that condemnation. It now appears from the statement of the Foreign Minister that Australian citizens have been caught up in the chaos that is occurring in Libya, and we support the government's efforts to ascertain the current status of all Australian citizens. And in the case of citizens who have been reportedly detained, we certainly support the government's attempts to provide whatever consular assistance they are able to at this time. And we appreciate the foreign minister's efforts to keep us informed. Thank you. Are there any members' statements? Member for Reed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the uh, Sri Lankan community that I represent in this place, and particularly the Tamil community, um, I express my grave concern at the foreshadowed appointment by the Sri Lankan government of the ex-Navy Commander uh, Admiral Sama Saringe as the next High Commissioner to, uh, for Sri Lanka to Australia. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, we are all concerned about. Uh, his uh, involvement as the Director General of Naval Operations towards the end of the Tamil conflict and the indiscriminate shelling on innocent civilians during that um, phase of the war, and he would seem an entirely inappropriate person to be High Commissioner of Sri Lanka to our country. And also, um, I call on the government to independently investigate uh, Dr. Palitha Kahona, who was an Australian Sri Lankan uh, citizen and a former DFAT uh, official who uh, negotiated uh, the uh, surrender or participated in the surrender of the, of the Tamil Tigers in the last days of the war. And um, on the 18th of May 2009, uh, the day after, um, several innocent Tamils were just uh, slaughtered holding a white flag. And just finally, um, I support the move by the uh, member for Wera for, for his, prime minute, for his um, uh, private member's Order bill on the Monday to support time has the member's statements. I call the member for McPherson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
The southern Gold Coast accounts for much of the manufacture of surf craft in Australia. I have spoken about this industry previously in this place, and I now have to inform the House that this industry is struggling. I have spoken at length with representatives of the industry, including Michelle Blau, a local board manufacturer who has been instrumental in the establishment of a steering committee to set up the Australian Surf Craft Manufacturing Industry Association. Michelle Blau advises that the current losses being experienced by the industry fall into three categories. Firstly, a downturn in the export market due in part to the high Australian dollar and increased competition from other manufacturers overseas. Secondly, the beginner intermediate surfing market, which has been affected by imported boards primarily from China. For example, a board made with a polyurethane base and a fiberglass resin outer imported from China retails at $350 to $450. A similar board, manufactured and shaped in Australia, retails for $650 to $750. The wholesale price of the Australian manufactured board is greater than the retail cost of the imported board. Thirdly, keen surfers who have traditionally bought Australian hand-shaped boards and would normally turn them over every six months are now keeping their boards for about two years as they tighten their belts. This is a very significant industry to the Gold Coast. We cannot afford to lose it. I pledge to support the surf craft manufacturers in any way that I can, and I call on the government to assist. The uh, member for Aston. Uh, last Friday, Mr. Speaker, a significant announcement was made in my electorate by the Victorian Transport Minister, and that is that the Roville Rail feasibility study would soon be underway. The Roville Rail project has been talked about it for being decades. Two p.m. <laughs> it being two p.m. Me members' statements are interrupted, and I think we all wait with bated breath for the other minute and 15 seconds. Oh, is it his oh well, if I'd known. For everybody that's having a birthday today, happy birthday, including the member and other very important people in this place. Um, questions without notice? The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer the Prime Minister to her repeated promise before the last election, uh, including on the very day before the election, I rule out a carbon tax. How can she justify Order. today's the members will move those How can posters. she justify Mem the, mem the Leader of the Opposition will resume his place. The member for Goldstone. <laughs> order. The order, the, order the House will come to order. Whilst I've tolerated and not encouraged the use of props by the questioner and others, that sort of display is outside the standing orders and unruly. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister, uh, and I repeat it. Uh, given her repeated promises prior to the election, I rule out a carbon tax. How can she possibly justify today's betrayal? And if the Australian people couldn't trust her on this, how order, can they trust her on order. anything? The honourable member's time has expired. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. Because what the Leader of the Opposition may have noticed following the last election is that the Australian people Member have voted for, for change. They voted for a carbon price, and this Parliament gives us the opportunity. This Parliament gives us Order. the opportunity to price carbon the and to deal Member with the issues that Australia needs Wannan to for the future. Warned. And Mr Speaker, let me explain this to the Leader of the Opposition bluntly, without the Leader of the Opposition's characteristic spins and slogans, the characteristic use of words that we associate with the Leader of the Opposition, Deputy where he Leader seeks to destroy and wreck and spin and mislead. Let's be really clear about what we need to achieve here. 
climate change is real. I believe that. I Order. believe that it's caused by human the activity. We need to act on climate change and build Member a low Fister. pollution economy for the future. We need to do that because other parts of the world are acting. It is not in our interest to be left behind. We are a confident people. We are a people who have achieved change before, and we will achieve it again. And, Mr Speaker, in achieving that change, we will make sure that we act fairly and have a fair carbon price. The carbon pricing mechanism that I've announced today, arising from the discussions of the multi-party climate change committee, is a carbon price mechanism that would start on the 1st the of July 2012. It's a scheme that would start with a fixed price for a fixed period, effectively like a tax. It would move to a cap and trade emissions trading scheme following that fixed price period of three to five years. The carbon price would exclude agriculture, though we would have our farmers able to participate in initiatives like our carbon farming initiative. We will design a carbon price that meets these requirements. And in doing so, because we are a Labor government, we will make sure that we act fairly towards Australians and they are treated fairly as they adjust to carbon pricing. Mr Speaker, now is the right time to act, the right time to modernise our economy into a low-pollution, clean energy economy of the future. What Australians expect from the people that they send to this place is that they will work together for positive change. I Order. actually believe the Order. vast majority of people in this parliament came to this place wanting to be associated with changes that are positive for Australia and will make a difference to our future prosperity and future opportunity. Member Unfortunately, Tangney. the Leader of the Opposition came to this place hoping to make his name on what he can wreck, stop and destroy. Well, we will continue working through the multi-party climate change committee to price carbon. It's the right thing to do by Australian prosperity, by Australian jobs, by a clean energy future, by doing the right thing on climate change, we will keep working to price climate change and treat Australians fairly. The the Leader of the Opposition. Yes, a supplementary question to the Prime Minister. I remind the Prime Minister that one member of this House, just one, was elected promising a carbon tax. 149 members of this House, including every coalition member and every Labor member, was elected ruling out a tax. I ask the Prime Minister, since when does one vote trump 149 votes, uh, unless the real Prime Minister of this country is Senator Bob Brown? The Prime Minister. Well, heavens above, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 member, the member for Wentworth Order. was elected ruling out a carbon price, was he? The member for Wentworth was elected ruling out a carbon price. I don't Those think so, Mr. Will Speaker. Come to order. Have a look behind you. The member you for Have a look Canning. at Lightline line last night, because you probably should have. Uh, the, let's have a look at the coalition and its promises to the Australian people. Prime Minister Howard, who I disagreed with across many long years, but who I would say this about, he came to this place wanting to change Australia and make improvements for his fu the future of Australia. He wanted to be remembered for the things he had created, not the things he had destroyed, unlike the Leader of the Opposition. Prime Minister Howard went to an election promising emissions trading. Then, of course, there are the members of the front bench who engaged in negotiations with the government and endorsed carbon member pricing every step of the way. The member for Groom, who was there talking about the importance of carbon pricing. The member for Wentworth that led the discussions on carbon pricing. He was reinforced by people on the coalition backbench who go to their electorates and try and clothe themselves as people who care about climate change and want to to act on carbon pricing. 
So let's not have any of this hypocrisy. Let's not have any of the hypocrisy that's just been on display by the Leader of the Opposition. Effectively, this comes down to a decision as to whether you believe in Member acting and land. making a difference for Australia's future, whether you believe in listening to what the Australian the community is Cowan telling is us, warned. whether you believe in using the opportunities that this parliament has given us to make a change for the future of this country, a change that will be better for prosperity, better for jobs better for a clean energy future, better for climate change and will be a change that's delivered fairly, or whether you decide that your politics is about destruction and you want Australia to miss the change in the global Order. economy to a clean energy future. No new jobs stuck in the past. That is what the Leader of the Opposition is advocating. Well, can I say to the Leader of the Opposition, now is the time for him to put aside the brutal politics he has played with climate change, his weather vane politics of believing climate change is real one moment, climate change is not real the next, carbon should be priced one moment, carbon Member price Foster. shouldn't be priced the next. Now's the time for the Leader of the Opposition to actually try and do something right for this country. Now is the time for the Leader of the Opposition to put away his slogans, put away his spin put away his uh, propensity for political destruction and actually work with the rest of the parliament to do the right thing by this country. It's time he looked inside himself and, see, and tried to see Sturt. whether there are any convictions in there about the nation's future, because I can't identify one from this behaviour. The member for Karangamite. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on the recovery and rescue effort following the earthquake in Christchurch? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Karangamite for his question. Uh, the member for Karangamite was actually born in Christchurch and lived there until 1988, something I must admit I didn't know myself until uh, talking to him about Christchurch and the uh, earthquake in New Zealand. He has a younger brother there and a grandfather there, and I'm very pleased that yesterday he got the news that they were all safe and well. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, as members of the parliament would know, uh, that news hasn't been brought to a lot of people because rescue and recovery efforts are still underway in Christchurch and in the surrounding districts. We've seen on our TV screens the pictures of how this is grim and difficult work. And I want to pay tribute to the courage and the professionalism of the many individuals who are going about doing this grim and difficult work. The search and rescue teams, the police, the fire authorities, the ambulance workers, the volunteers and ordinary citizens alike who are there pitching in and doing everything they can in what remains the very urgent task of looking for people amongst the rubble. The death toll now stands at more than 70. And, Mr Speaker, many more are missing, and uh, uh, that obviously is uh, bearing very strongly down upon their families as they wait for news. And as time goes by, we know that the uh, likelihood of survivors being found diminishes over time. But Prime Minister Key has stressed that this continues to be a rescue mission, and I'm sure everybody wishes that we still continue to find people alive and able to be rescued in that rubble. I've been in contact with Prime Minister Key today, and he has thanked me and thanked Australia for our efforts to assist New Zealand to date. And we are working side by side with New Zealanders in this rescue effort. The overall Australian effort will shortly reach 500 people in number. Uh, we've got a medical assistance team there, we've got search and rescue teams, we've got emergency management Australia personnel, uh, we've had our defence force involved with its aircraft uh, and also with a medical field hospital, and we've got 300 police officers who will depart soon for New Zealand. Uh, Mr Speaker, it is uh, something of a miracle that so far we have only seen uh, this impact upon one long-term Australian resident. Tragic, tragic news for that family. But given the scenes of devastation and destruction, 
and how many Australians we know were in the area, uh, we are relieved that we have, uh, haven't seen that toll rise at this stage. But it does remain possible that that toll will rise uh, as the work continues with search and rescue and as the work continues going through the rubble. Mr Speaker, appeal funds have been set up to help the people of Christchurch, and I know Australians are going to be very generous in their support. In that regard, I warmly welcome the news today from Cricket Australia that tomorrow's Australian-New Zealand World Cup match will be broadcast live by Channel 9, Fox Sports and ABC Grandstand. Players from both teams will be showing their respect by wearing black armbands and having a moment's silence before the match. The earthquake appeal will be promoted and there will be ways of donating uh, for cricket lovers as they watch that match. Mr Speaker, inevitably there will be some very, very difficult days ahead uh, as the search and rescue continues in Christchurch and our thoughts are with the people of New Zealand as this happens. Yeah. Order. Before calling the member for North Sydney, I inform the House that we have President in the gallery this afternoon, members of the United States Congressional Delegation. On behalf of the House, I extend to them a very warm welcome. Yeah. The member for North Sydney. Here, here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is Order. to the Prime Minister. <clears throat> Will the Prime Minister now finally concede to the Australian people that in the first year alone the carbon tax she ruled out in August and ruled in after the election will increase electricity prices for struggling Australian households by an additional $300 each year above any other increases? The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, this is an attempt to mislead and to engage in a fear campaign. What the Shadow Treasurer knows, what the Shadow Treasurer knows is that today from the multi-party climate change committee we announced a Those carbon on pricing my left mechanism. Will come to what order. the Shadow Treasurer knows is we did not announce a carbon Prime price today. Prime Minister will today. resume her seat. The Prime Minister will resume her seat until the House comes to order. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. What the, shadow the member for Treasurer. Flinders is warned. There's a man of conviction, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister <laughs> will what the, uh, go to what the, the shadow Treasurer question. well knows. What the Shadow Treasurer well knows is we Order. did not announce. The Prime Minister will resume her seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, given we are debating the Prime Minister's broken promise, I ask her to withdraw that statement. The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. There is no point of order, but I indicate to the Prime Minister that she will ignore interjections and she will get directly to the question. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. What the Shadow Treasurer well knows is we announced a mechanism today. We did not announce a dollar price to do today. Any, any attempt by the Shadow Treasurer Order. to make assumptions about figures is an attempt to cause fear. It's an attempt to mislead, and every Australian should recognise the opposition for what it is, an opposition with no policies or plans to make a real difference to climate change. Let me say this to the Shadow Treasurer. I understand pricing carbon Member will have Herbert. price impacts, and I want to be upfront about that. Member I want to be Sturt. very upfront about that with the Australian people. Indeed, the, the reason you price carbon is to have price impacts so that commodities that are high pollution economy, uh, commodities cost more and commodities that are low pollution cost less and then the market will adjust, people will innovate, there will be change to a clean energy future so that there are more low pollution solutions for our Australian economy and for the people of Australia. There will be price impacts. 
And because we are a Labor government, because we believe in fairness, we will ensure that this carbon price mechanism Member for works Herbert fairly. And every dollar that is raised by pricing carbon will go to assist Australian households make the adjustment, go to assist Australian businesses to make the adjustment, and go to funding climate change programs that tackle climate change. But if we are going to talk about impacts on Australian households, then let's see some political honesty Order. from the opposition for the first time. The opposition came into this parliament today Member and they Cowper. voted against a $1.8 billion flood levy, saying that they didn't think that the Australian people could afford to pay that. What they didn't tell you today is they stand for $10.5 billion of expenditure on climate change programs that will not work. $10.5 billion of expenditure that the Leader of the Opposition, if he was Prime Minister, would be Order. ripping out of the purses and wallets of hard-working Australian taxpayers. For so over warned. on that side, what they stand for is $10.5 billion of expenditure, which would be ineffective so that pollution would continue to rise and there would be no compensation. On this side of the parliament, we stand for the most effective mechanism to price carbon, which will transform our economy at the lowest cost, starting it on 1 July 2012, compensating Australian households so that the carbon price works fairly. Prime Minister will resume her seat. The member for McCullough on a point of order. Mr Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 78, I ask that an extension of time be given to the woman of no conviction to try and answer the question. The member for McCullough, the member for McCullough will leave the chamber for one hour under no order, Standing Order 94A. When the House comes to order, 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 order. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We will be working to deliver a price on carbon. We know those opposite have got no courage, no convictions, no plans for the future except to rip $10.5 billion off Australians to pay for their ineffective programs. Well, we will leave them mired in their divisions as we get on with the job. The member for La Trobe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister outline the importance of taking action on climate change and explain how the government's approach to introducing a carbon price will help create a clean energy nation? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I very much thank the member for La Trobe for her question. And in answer to her question and to the members of the parliament assembled today, I would say that pricing carbon and the carbon mechanism we have put forward today comes down to some very simple, very logical propositions. Proposition number one, that climate change is Order. real and caused by human activity. On this side of the House, we believe that the scientific consensus shows that on that side of the House, mired in division, and the Leader of the Opposition has had every position on that question it is capable for a human being to have. In favour, against, in favour, against, confused, doesn't know, in favour, against. Proposition number two, human history tells you, human history tells you when there is a wave of change that it pays to be on that wave. The Industrial Revolution, for example, the countries that prospered absorbed the change rather than lingering behind. 
the information technology revolution, the countries and people that prospered rode that wave of change. Bill Gates did not become a wealthy man today by saying, well, I'll sit around for 20 or 15, 15 or 20 years to see what happens next with information technology. He rode the wave of change. Our country, too, as the world moves to a lower pollution future, needs to be there moving with the world. We cannot afford to be left behind. And the world is moving, Mr Speaker. 32 countries have moved. 10 US states have emissions trading schemes. And as we move, as, we move, as the world moves Remember to a lower Sydney. energy future, we need to price carbon. Because we believe on this side of the parliament that market-based mechanisms work. We do not believe that the Australian economy is a Soviet command and control style economy. It is a market-based economy where market-based mechanisms provide the most efficient ways of changing. And so economists around the world and the government believes that a market-based mechanism will transform our economy at the lowest cost. And then, of course, Mr Speaker, it is just axiomatic that you will drive change if you price carbon. At the moment, you can emit carbon pollution for free. If you price carbon, then people will innovate and people will change. At the end of the day, it all comes down to whether or not you have got the courage to face and shape the future. And yes, it does take courage, Mr Speaker, to shape and face the future. It took courage when the Hawke Labor government dealt with tariff reform in this country. And when they dealt with tariff reform, what they were doing was sending a price signal to industries in this country that they would have to innovate and they would have to change. And let's look what happened with that tariff reform. There were all sorts of fear campaigns at the time about job losses, the end of Australian industry. But as a result of that kind of reform, we are prosperous and stronger today. We will send a price signal on carbon. We will hear the same fear campaigns from the opposition today, and people should remember those fear campaigns end up amounting to naught. We are a creative and confident people. We will get this done. Order four, calling the Leader of the Nationals. The member for Mitchell might explain to the member for Herbert what a warning is a precursor for. It's 24 hours or one hour possibility. Member for Herbert should be careful. The Leader of the Nationals. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is also to the Prime Minister. Now that the Treasurer has refused to deny that petrol will be included in the government's uh, carbon tax, can the Prime Minister confirm that a $26 per tonne carbon tax would add at least 6.5 cents a litre to the price of petrol? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. This is an attempt to mislead the Australian people, Mr Speaker, and we will hear more of it from the opposition. Order. An attempt to mislead. Shameless and the attempt to mislead. They Koo believe Yong in the born. politics of fear, and this is how they deal with the politics of fear. Well, let me answer the uh, uh, leader of the National Party's question. What we have announced today, and I'd ask the people on the uh, opposite side who clearly haven't read it uh, to do so, what we have announced today is a carbon pricing mechanism to start on 1 July 2012. What we have also made clear today is that there is further policy work to do, and we will be announcing as that further policy work is done. What the, deputy, what the leader of the National Party well knows is Member we have Dawson. not announced a carbon price today, and in making up figures, what he is trying to do is mislead the Australian people. But I would say this, I would say this to the leader of the National Party. Perhaps he should be honest enough. Perhaps he should be honest enough to say to the Australian people Order. that what the government has put forward today the is member a for system Forest in will which leave the every dollar for one hour under 94A. 
in which a system in which every dollar raised from pricing carbon will go to assist Australian households, assist Australian families with managing the change, assist Australian businesses with managing the change and to programs for tackling climate change. What the National Party leader actually wants to do, following the leader of the opposition, is rip $10.5 billion away from Australian taxpayers without a cent of compensation. Order. And what he should Let also do— Prime Minister do. resume his seat. Prime Minister. Order. The member for Braddon is warned. The member for New England will be very careful to encourage him. The, the Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much. And what the leader of the National Party should also be honest enough to do is to consult with the member for Groom, consult with the Order. member for Groom, who said very clearly before the last election that when you look at circumstances in the electricity industry, under any scenario, electricity prices are going up. That's what the member for Groom said. With the government's carbon pricing system, we will be in a position to assist Australian families, to compensate Australian families as the carbon price comes into effect. What the leader of the National Party is proposing to do is no compensation, $10.5 billion of tax the leader for of the programs that are ineffective. Maybe the leader of the National Party doesn't understand, but when you make a promise to spend $10.5 billion on programs that the member won't for work, Solomon that is money warned. has to come from somewhere and it would come from Australian taxpayers. So it is about time that the opposition, instead of using its slogans, actually went to the Australian people and told them the truth. Climate change is real. Order. We must price carbon in order to reduce carbon pollution. We must rely on our market mechanisms to do that efficiently. We must drive innovation and change to a clean energy, energy economy. We must get the jobs that come with that, and we must be fair to Australians on the way through. That's the future. You're the past. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Oh. S Mr. Speaker, I, I have the call, Mr. Speaker. No. Uh, I, The Leader of the Opposition has the call. I, I move that so much of standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving forth with the following motion, that this House censures the Prime Minister for her announcement today that confirms that she will introduce a carbon tax this year, breaking her solemn promise to the Australian people that there will be no carbon tax under the, under the government I lead. In particular, that the Prime Minister stand condemned for inflicting another new labour tax on families already battling to make ends meet because of the rising cost of living. Yeah. That the Prime Minister stand condemned for hitting pensioners and carers with another new labour tax at a time when they are already struggling with soaring power bills and increased grocery prices. Yeah. That the Prime Minister stand condemned for burdening small business with another new labour tax at a time when many of them are barely surviving, that the Prime Minister stand condemned for adding an extra $300 to the average household power bill with her new carbon tax, that the Prime Minister stand condemned for adding an extra six and a half cents per litre to the cost of petrol with her new carbon tax, and all at a time when there is no global agreement on reducing emissions and under this new labour tax Australia will bear an unacceptable economic cost that won't be shared by our economic competitors. Now, Mr Speaker, let's be clear of the extent of the betrayal. Before the election, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. Before the election, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, I rule out a carbon tax on the front page of Australia's major paper the day before the election. We even had the Treasurer, the Deputy Prime Minister, calling the claim 
that a carbon tax would be introduced post-election as a hysterical, yeah. an absolutely oh, no. hysterical oh, no. allegation. Well, that hysterical allegation has turned out to be cold hard fact. Yeah. Cold hard fact. The betrayal of this government. Now, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want you to listen, Mr. Speaker, to the words of the Prime Minister in full sincerity mode. This is the Prime Minister in full sincerity mode. She said, she said, and I'm quoting from an interview with John Fain, I think when you go to an election and you give a promise to the Australian people, you should do everything in your power to honour that promise. We are determined to do that. This is a government that prides itself on delivering election promises. We want Australians to be able to say, well, they've said this and they did this. Well, Mr Speaker, they said one thing and they did another thing. Now, Mr Speaker, we have heard a lot about real Julia and fake Julia. Was it real Julia or was it fake Julia that said we gave our word to the Australian people? Or was it real Julia or fake Julia who said there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead? I tell you what, Mr Speaker, nothing is more fake than making a promise to the Australian people before the election and breaking it after the election. Now, Mr Speaker, I am sure, I am sure that this Prime Minister, that this Prime Minister, in her heart of hearts, in those quiet moments of reflection, in the still small hours of the night when she considers what she has said and done, some, like some latter-day Lady Macbeth would consider this statement, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead, and this latter-day Lady Macbeth will be saying, out, out, foul spot, out, out, foul spot. But she said it, and she will be judged by it, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah. There has been no greater betrayal in recent Australian history. This is the greatest breach of faith with the Australian public since the LAW law fake tax cuts of, of, of another Labor Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I say, I say through you to the Australian people, if the Australian public could not trust the Prime Minister on this, how can they ever in the future trust her on anything at all? This is the truth, Mr Speaker. We have a Prime Minister who simply cannot be trusted on anything at all. The promise, the promise. I, I, I hear, just ask Kevin. The promise, the promise not to introduce a carbon tax was actually the second most solemn pledge that this Prime Minister made in the course of the last election. The most solemn pledge, perhaps, was the pledge to the former Prime Minister, I'm with you, Kevin. I'm with you, Kevin. I back you all the way, Kevin. I even back you, I even back you on your emissions trading scheme until it all gets too hard, and I'll stab you on the back in that. I'll stab you on the back on the leadership, and I'll ultimately stab the Australian people in the back with this broken promise. Yeah! She ratted on Kevin Rudd, and now she's betrayed the Australian people. Shame on this Prime Minister. Shame on this Prime Minister. And, and you know, she does feel some shame. We know she feels some shame. She wouldn't say the word tax. Carbon tax. The Prime Minister wouldn't say the word tax uh, in her press conference, but the shame is starting to get to her because she just half admitted that it was going to be a tax. In effect, a tax, she says. In effect, a tax. In total reality, Prime Minister, a tax, a hit on the Australian people's standard of living. But, Mr. Speaker, this is a Prime Minister who has raised breaking promises to an art form. This is a Prime Minister who holds the world record for breaking promises. Today, she has broken her promise not to introduce a carbon tax. 
already. She has broken her promise to have a citizens' assembly. This was going to happen before the election. That lasted until the day. It didn't even last until she was confirmed as prime minister. That lasted until she needed the votes of one Green in this parliament. There was the East Timor detention centre. That was definitely going to happen before the election. Will never ever happen after the election. There were the onshore detention centres that would never ever happen before the election and are now being built after the election. There was the Murray-Darling Basin plan that she was adopting sight unseen before the election, running away from at a million miles an hour after the election. There was the hospital takeover. Remember the hospital takeover? That was after climate change. That was the second greatest moral challenge of our time. She was definitely doing that before the election, dumped completely dumped after the election because she was beaten uh, by the Liberal state premiers. She says this is the year of decision and delivery. The only decision that she has made this year is not to deliver, not to deliver on her election promises. And this year, let me tell you, Mr Speaker, it will be the year of backflips and broken promises from this Prime Minister this inadequate, disappointing Prime Minister leading a government that has broken every promise that it has ever made. And Mr Speaker, what's her justification for this? What is her justification for this assault on the cost of living of every Australian? This $300 a year hit on power prices, this six and a half cents a litre hit on petrol prices, what is her justification? Oh. Oh, the parliament changed. Well, there's one member of parliament right up the back there who, who said before the election, he's not actually here, uh, he, there was one member of parliament before the election who said, who said, I will support a carbon tax. Every other, and I accept the Prime Minister's whispering, um, um, Every other member of this parliament went to the election ruling out a carbon tax. Every single member on this side ruled out a carbon tax. Every member on that side ruled out a carbon tax. And I say to the Prime Minister, by what tortured logic, by what bizarre arithmetic does one vote trump 149? This is truly the weirdest justification that we have ever seen, and the only explanation for the Prime Minister's backflip is that the real Prime Minister of this country is, in fact, Senator Bob Brown. Mr. Dep Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a Prime Minister who now has almost no credibility left. She has no credibility left. She has never seen a tax she didn't like. She has never seen a tax she wouldn't hike. This is a Prime Minister who has let down the Australian people order, no more so than today. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. Is the question seconded? The member for Flinders. Uh, I second the motion and reserve my right to speak. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And what we've seen on display from the Leader of the Opposition today is why Australians don't trust him to be Prime Minister. A performance of hysteria, a performance of the, of the ultimately hollow man, the man who believes in nothing and doesn't want to do anything to benefit the nation in the future. People come to this parliament wanting to work hard, wanting to make a difference, wanting to ultimately leave this parliament, ending up saying for themselves, I did that, I created that, I built that. That is only in Australia today because I was in the Australian parliament. The Leader of the Opposition is the only man I have ever met who came to this parliament saying, Order. I want to leave Order. the parliament with people able, able to say about me, I destroyed this. I stopped that. I ended something else. What he wants to do is destroy the capacity of this nation to deal with climate change. What he wants to do is destroy the capacity of this nation to have the jobs Member of the future Biden. through the NBN. 
What he wants to do is to destroy the capacity of this nation to have health reform. What he wants to do is to destroy the capacity of this nation to properly manage the mining boom and to get a proper return for the mineral wealth in our ground. What he wants to do is destroy the ability of Australians to even move from one bank to another freely. He'd rather have them charged unfair exit fees. What he wants to do is to destroy all of these things because in his hollowness and in his bitterness he has no positive ideas for the future. Now on this side we know why there is all this hysteria today because the leader of the opposition has clutched for his old slogans like a drowning man to a passing piece of wood. We watched the member for Wentworth on Late Line last night and we could read between the lines. Yep, it was on. It was on. Back to their old days of chasing each other round about the leadership. The member for Wentworth trying to distinguish himself as a man who believes in the future, who believes in positive propositions like a multicultural and tolerant Australia, and he wanted to leave the leader of the opposition like a dying man clutching onto Order. his One Nation emails. Order. That's member what is Goldstein. happening in the opposition today. And so, faced with that politics, the leader of the opposition has come in here and he has clutched to his old slogans like a dying man. But the problem with his old slogans is every time he says them, they ring less and less and less true. And every time he says them, they have less and less force in the Australian community. He is like the boy that has cried wolf too many times, Mr Speaker. He is no longer believed by the Australian community. Well, let's take away the hysteria, the carry-on, the assault that Mr the Leader of the Opposition has on any facts in this debate, and let's go through them calmly rationally and with some reason. I know that's not the Leader of the Opposition's strong suit, but let's just try and do it. Number one, do you believe in climate change? We do. We believe it's induced by human activity. What do they believe over there? Well, no idea, and I can see the ones who are dropping their heads now because they're embarrassed by the position of the Leader of the Opposition. Number two, if you believe climate change is real, then what is happening around the world? Well, people are moving to create clean energy economies. Should we be stranded on the sideline with a high-pollution economy? Should we continue to be the biggest emitters of carbon pollution in the world? Or should we act as the world acts? Should we act Order. as the world acts as that wave of change for clean energy goes through the world economy? Well, I say we should get on the right side of history and we should act now. And then once you have determined to act, you bring to the task your market-based principles. How can we best do this? Well, I believe we can best do it through a market-based mechanism that will give us the biggest transformation in our economy for the lowest cost. I believe we should do this fairly by looking after Australians who are impacted by the change, and we will do that, Mr Speaker. I believe we should do this by making sure businesses have certainty, and Mr Speaker, we will do that too. I believe we should do this understanding that we are a confident nation, that we have made big changes before, that we have made big changes even when there have been hysterical campaigns against them. And those big changes have led to the prosperity that we have today. The proud record of reform of the Hawke and Keating governments, something that transformed our economy for the future. Mr Speaker, that is what carbon pricing is about. It is the reform that we need now. And here we see the opposition wandering around like brown cows because they're actually so scared of this debate. They're actually so scared of their hysteria and hollowness being on display. They are desperately hoping they can distract from their shameful failure in this debate. Well, Mr Speaker, increasingly Australians understand that the Liberal Party under the Leader of the Opposition is part of the past, part of the past with no real policies or plans for the nation's future. What would the Leader of the Opposition have the nation do? 
$10.5 billion of more tax devoted to climate change programs that would not work, Mr Speaker. Any abatement through those programs would be at a higher cost than a market-based mechanism. Waste on an epic scale. That's what the Leader of the Opposition wants to do. And he wants to engage in that waste and that $10.5 billion of new tax, extra tax, with no compensation for Australian families. He wants to stand by idle as power prices go up, providing no compensation to Australian families. Well, that is the low road, Mr Speaker, the low road of more tax of higher prices for families, higher electricity prices and no compensation. That is the low road of having a high polluting economy where in the years to come we can no longer compete and keep our place in the global economy. Mr Speaker, we will not go down that low road. You get judged ultimately in this parliament by what you decide to do and what you deliver, Mr Speaker. The member for Coward has been warned, and he will be very careful. The Prime Minister has the call. You ultimately get and to judge the member for by Hughes what you be have very decided and take to do his place. and what you deliver. On this side of the parliament, we are determined that from the 1st of July we will price carbon. We are determined we will have a prosperous, low pollution economy of the future. We are determined that we will have the jobs of the future, Mr Speaker. We are determined to make a contribution to tackling climate change. We are determined to do that efficiently, fairly, with certainty for Australian business. The Leader of the Opposition can engage in his scare campaigns. He can engage in his politics of the past and inevitably we will see him do that. But let me say this to the Leader of the Opposition, who is so little interested in climate change that he isn't even paying attention to this debate. He is, as always, all about the politics and not at all about the policy. Can I say to the Leader of the Opposition, we will have this debate and we will win it. We will win it every day. We will contest every proposition. We will correct every attempt to mislead. We will have this debate and we will win it. And if any Australian is wondering what the Leader of the Opposition actually stands for, if they've listened to this debate, if they've listened to his hysteria, if they've listened to his carry-on, if they've listened to his misleading claims, if they've read his motion with misleading claims in it, then let me summarise what the Leader of the Opposition is on about. Let me use the words of the member for Wentworth. The Leader of the Opposition himself has, in just four or five months, publicly advocated the blocking of the ETS, the passing of the ETS, the amending of the ETS, and if the amendments were satisfactory, passing it and now blocking it. His only redeeming virtue in this is remarkable lack of conviction. Never a truer word spoken, Mr Speaker. Never a truer word spoken. A hollow man out of his depths. Order the Leader of the House. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, standing Order 62 is very clear. Um, a member in the chamber must a take his or he, her seat promptly. Uh, a and Section C not remain in the aisles. Oh. Mr. Speaker. Leader of the House. The Mr. Leader of the House. Speaker, order. We know that those opposite no, no. have turned their the back the on the future. The Leader of the House. The Leader of the House. The Leader of the House resume his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat on the point of order. That is why the member for Cowan is very lucky. It was what I was reminding the member for Hughes. And if, if naively perhaps it is that this was individual's action and not orchestrated, but if it is orchestrated, it will be remembered and there will be action taken on the next occasion on the next occasion. The question is that the suspension of standing orders moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The member for Flinders. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, this Prime Minister talks about conviction, but who said, I rule out a carbon tax? She did. This Prime Minister talks about conviction, but who said, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead? She did. 
And this Prime Minister today delivered a carbon tax, and that means three very simple things. Electricity up $300 a year, and she knows it. Petrol prices up six and a half cents a litre, and she knows it. Credibility down and staying down, and she knows it. What we have had today, Mr Speaker, is a fundamental breach of faith with the Australian people. Because there is no question, there is no question as to whether or not this Prime Minister ruled out a carbon tax. And there is no question that what she delivered today is a carbon tax. There is a question about courage because she doesn't have the guts to call it a carbon tax, but make it absolutely clear we have a carbon tax in every single element. She has broken her election promise. She's breached faith with the Australian people. She has betrayed the Australian people because the simple question is why did she make the promise on election eve? Why was she so ashamed of the concept of a carbon tax that her one leading pitch to the nation in the last 24 hours before the election was to rule out a carbon tax? Why was that the single thing that she went to the Australian people on in the last 24 hours? Because she knew that the Australian people did not want to face higher electricity prices and they did not want to face higher petrol prices. And that is why she also tapped the member for Griffith on the shoulder when he was Prime Minister and said, this whole ETS thing, I care so much about climate change, let's just put it off. Let's just put it off. She, ma she made sure that it was postponed. So, Mr. S Mr Speaker, there is a fundamental issue before the House today, and that's why this motion is important. It is about truth and honesty with the Australian people in your most sacred pitch for their support in order to form a government. It was dishonest. It was deliberate. It was deceptive. And it was dishonourable. And it was a betrayal of the Australian people, which has reached its a point at this moment today when she announced a carbon tax but did not have the courage to use the term carbon tax because she is ashamed of her breach of promise and she is afraid of the truth that the Australian people will discover that this means higher prices in electricity and higher prices in petrol. And let us look at this question of higher prices oh, in electricity secretary. and higher prices in petrol when there is a better way available, not just in Australia but around the world. Electricity prices will rocket up. We saw that this week with the Australian Industry Group report, where that report made it absolutely clear that over and above every other additional impact on electricity prices, there would be an increase of $300 per family in the first year alone. And from there it goes up. $300 per family is the price of perfidy for this Prime Minister. What well, we also know is that on the work of Professor Garno, not us, on the work of Professor Garno, <laughs> that if a $26 per tonne price were introduced, there would be a six and a half cent per litre increase in petrol. If you are honest, if you are serious, you will acknowledge those price rises today. You are raising the price of electricity for families who are already facing electricity price rises. And for a Prime Minister who has an argument about markets, let, let, you must answer this point. Order. If we've had a 62 per cent price Order. rise the time in electricity, for the debate has expired. if you've had a 62 per cent price Order. rise, member why will hasn't resume his this seat. The member will resume his seat. Remind the member that he should he address his remarks through the chair. The question is that the motion for the suspension of standing and sessional orders moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition for the suspension of standing and sessional orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Barker and Parks, tellers for the ayes, and the members for Fowler and Shortland, tellers for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 67, no 73. The question is therefore negatived. Would members under Standing Order 62A take their seats promptly and quietly?
Minister. Order. With members conferencing in the aisles, please desist or go outside and have the conference. Members, please take their places quickly. I call a very patient member for Denison. The member for Denison. Mr. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, the Tamar River pulp mill would be Tasmania's biggest infrastructure project, but it remains highly controversial not least because of the complete breakdown in the state government approval process. While the majority of Tasmanians appear to support a pulp mill, many, including myself, oppose this particular proposal also because it would be dirty and locally unpopular. Prime Minister, will you rule out any further federal financial assistance for the proposed Tamar River pulp mill, either directly or indirectly, including through the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation? The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Denison for his question. Can I say to the member for Denison on the uh, question of federal financial assistance, I'm advised that no application has been made for funding under the Export Finance and Insurance Co Corporation. Uh, on the question of the approval process, uh, it's important to remind the House that that isn't determined by Cabinet. That is actually the obligation of the minister under the relevant piece of environmental legislation. Uh, and that in, uh, legislation is, of course, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. I can also advise the House that guns have made public statements to indicate that if the pulp mill does secure that environmental approval from the minister, the company plans to meet conditions which are stricter than those set out in the approval. So if they get the approval, they have publicly stated they intend to do better. It's also important to note that the Tasmanian community is, at the moment, in a different position to the past. Uh, for generations, everything around forestry in Tasmania has been characterised by conflict, and the member refers to that in his question to me, that this has been a very divisive issue for the Tasmanian community. But as he is aware, uh, in an historic move, uh, just several months ago, the industry, unions and community representatives and environmental representatives started to sit down and work through a process to reach agreement on the future of forestry, and they have produced a statement of principles. Now, as I said in December last year, those involved have worked through a very complicated thing, a thing uh, very much characterised by division, and the fact they've patiently done so is a credit to all of them. And that statement does include a commitment to a strong, sustainable timber industry, including a pulp mill, and a commitment to the progressive implementation of a moratorium on the logging of high conservation value forests. Now, this is not a government agreement. It was brokered by community groups, unions, industry and stakeholder groups. Therefore, I view our role as a supportive role to bring that agreement into fruition and into life. And in that regard, uh, we've announced, working with the Tasmanian government, the appointment of Mr Bill Kelty as an uh, independent facilitator. And he has been working through as an honest broker uh, with the various stakeholder groups and is very well received by them. Um, now, on, on uh, the process from here, uh, as I understand the work involved uh, that Mr Kelty is now facilitating, these stakeholder groups are planning to consult further to resolve outstanding issues, and I understand that there remains a great deal of goodwill. So, Mr Speaker, it's too early to say whether or not the statement of principles will form a lasting settlement of these difficult and divisive issues, but I am hopeful, and to, to the member for Denison, I would say I think there is cause for some cautious optimism. The member for Canberra. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. 
Will the Prime Minister advise the House of the decisions that this parliament must now make in the national interest and how leadership is vital in leading the national debate? The Prime Minister. Prime Minister, resume her seat until the House comes to order. Order. <laughs> Member for Mitchell. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Canberra for her question. And I would say to the member for Canberra and I would say to the House that we stand here today in this House of Representatives in a peaceful, prosperous, multicultural nation, a creative and confident nation because of the reforms enacted by governments of both political persuasions over the last 30 years, Mr Speaker, reforms to ensure that our nation would be prosperous for the future and it would be a nation of peace and creativity and multiculturalism. If we go through the economic reforms, the great economic reforms of our age, of the last 30 years that have brought us here to this point, the floating of the dollar, the reduction of tariff walls, the embracing of free trade and an open competitive economy, banking competition to ensure that we had competitive, stable banks, Mr. Speaker, including the goods and services tax, a major reform to the taxation system in this nation. These major reforms of the past have enabled us to have a prosperous economy that has survived the GFC, the global financial crisis, and which today can offer Australians the benefit of jobs. And there are so many nations around the world where people lack the benefits and dignity of work, but in this country people can have the benefit of jobs. And because of the courageous decisions of governments past, we live in a multicultural society and we proudly have a non-discriminatory immigration program. And it hasn't always been easy, Mr Speaker. It wasn't easy in the days of the One Nation Challenge to the non-discriminatory immigration program. It wasn't easy. But both sides of the parliament worked together to ensure that we kept that non-discriminatory immigration program. Mr Speaker, we entered this week in federal politics, having had a divisive and ugly debate about multiculturalism. And the Leader of the Opposition faced a test of his leadership, a test to endorse a non-discriminatory immigration policy, a test that required him to get rid of his shadow immigration minister and parliamentary secretary, and he has failed that test, Mr Speaker. And we have ended this week with the Leader of the Opposition moving a motion he knew couldn't be carried in an act of absurdity to try and start a new fear campaign. Well, Mr Speaker, this is the year of decision and delivery, and we will bring our reforming heritage, our values, our Labor Order. values of reform from the past to the task of pricing carbon, to the task of implementing health reform, to the task of increasing opportunity for Australians through a better education system, to the task of ensuring Australians have the benefits and dignity of work, to the task of building the national broadband network to make sure we have the jobs of the future. And there the Leader of the Opposition stands clutching his increasingly hollow three-word slogans, a man with no ideas, no policies, no plans for the nation's future, a man who is skilled in the ability to wreck but lacks the ability to create. He has no idea 
how to drive the change that these, this nation needs. There are some members on his backbench who remember the proud reforming tradition of the Liberal Party. And we will wait to see those members come to the fore over the coming weeks because they don't want to be associated with the politics of the Leader of the Opposition. Order. And with Order. those words, Mr Speaker, I move that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Order the House will come to order. Order. I present the Auditor-General's Performance Audit Report No. 31 of 2010-2011, entitled Administration of the Superannuation Lost Members Register. The Leader of the House. Speaker, I move the report be made a parliamentary paper. Order. The question is that the report be made a parliamentary paper. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I present the Selection Committee's report number 15 relating to the consideration of bills. The report will be printed in today's Hansard. Copies of the report have been placed on the table. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, a, uh, a document is tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. A full details of this document will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. Uh, Minister, oh, the <coughs> Minister for Arts on indulgence. On indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I thank the, uh, I thank you. I just want to note, in advance of the uh, Academy Awards on Monday, a note of recognition of the inter Australia's international uh, screen industry. This year, 10 Australians uh, have been nominated for Academy Awards, the highest number that to have been nominated since the year 2000. So, on behalf of all members of the House, I want to congratulate all nominees and the production teams, Mr. Speaker, which have honed their talent to this level. I'd like to pay particular tribute to AFI Award winner Jackie Weaver, who's been nominated for Best Supporting Actress in Animal Kingdom and only the second acting nominee for a performance in a film financed and produced here in Australia. The first was Geoffrey Rush for Shine, and Geoffrey Rush is also nominated this time uh, for Best Supporting Actor in The King's Speech. But I also want to congratulate those people behind the filmmaking, not just those who appear on the screen. Producer, Emile Sherman, who has been nominated in the Best Picture category also for The King's Speech. Nicole Kidman um, for the Best Actress in The Rabbit Hole. Ben Snow, I did give you notice. Ben Snow, oh. George Brandis was oh. noted, uh, notified oh. and he said that he would notify you, the Deputy Leader. I understand that Order. The, and that is why he was notified. The Minister. Minister has the call on indulgence. Minister. Ben Snow, Tim Burke and Joel, Joe Farrell, each of them, each of them up for, several, uh, for separate visual effects awards. The artist and author Sean Tan for an animated short film, Kirk Baxter for film editing and Dave Elsie for makeup. And special congratulations to the team of four Australians including three from Rising Sun Research, which has already received an Academy Award for technical achievements in their Cinetech online collaboration software used throughout the international industry. Mr Speaker, these nominations demonstrate the respect and credibility that the Australian film and TV industry has won on the world stage. Our technical and creative skills are world class. Their success is a demonstration of this government's deeply held belief that a creative nation is also a productive nation. Yeah. And this is an industry that we must invest in and keep strong to ensure that the talents and skills continue to thrive. Last week, in fact, I released the report into the Australian independent screen production sector. It examined how the sector is faring and looking at the early impact of the three film tax offsets which make up the Australian screen production in, uh, incentive. In the past three years, the government has provided $412 million in support through the tax system, 
compared to $136 million in the three years previously. I look forward to working with the Australian screen industry, but most particularly, I wish all of the nominees the best. I wish all of the nominees the best for the awards, which will be announced on Monday. The deputy leader of the opposition on indulgence. Speaker, on indulgence, I wish to associate the opposition with the comments of the minister in relation to the Australian nominees for the Academy Awards, which will be announced on Monday evening. The uh, actors and producers and writers and artists, uh, a number of members of this House will have seen The King's Speech. What a fine film that was. We are also very proud of our fine actresses in, uh, or actors in Jackie Weaver, Nicole Kidman. But, Mr Speaker, I really do think that one nomination has been overlooked. I think that the Prime Minister deserves a nomination Order. for starring Order. in A Woman Order. with Conviction. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. The member for Bennelong. Uh, Mr Speaker, understanding Order. 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 The member for Bennelong has a question to me. And it would be fair that even though this is we've gone no no, but we went beyond that because I was trying to get things moving for reasons of discipline. The member for Benelong has the call. Uh, Mr. Speaker, understanding order 105B, I request uh, that you write to the Minister for Transport and Infrastructure to seek reasons uh, for the delay in answering questions in writing numbers 80, 81, 83, and 86 that appeared on the notice paper on 17 November 2010. I will write to the minister as required. The Leader of the House. Order. The Leader of the House has the call. Order. The Leader of the House. The member for Mitchell. Perhaps I've picked the wrong mentor for the member for Herbert. The Leader of the House has the call. I'm just waiting for order. Leader of the House. I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion for the appointment of a member of the House as a member of the Advisory Council on Australian Archives. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Order. This... No, this... The Leader of the House has the call. Let's move on. Order. The Leader of the House. What are the Can members shut for up Canning? Order. The, the Leader of the House is not helping, but it would help. It would help if the members on my left sat there silently for about the 15 seconds that it will take. Leader of the House. So, stop interjecting. I'll talk. Leader of the House. Order. The Leader of the House has the call. I move. The, the Leader of the House has the call. I move. The Member for Casey is warned. The Leader of the House has the call. I move. Well, I won't move it. I don't care. It's Shane Prentice. I don't care. I don't care. The, the leader of the house. No, the leader of the house has the call. Order. The house will come to order. I suggest, as painful as it might be for those on my left, if they sat there silently for 20 seconds, they would get on with business, including their MPI. The leader of the house. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. I move that, in accordance with the provisions of section 10 of the Archives Act 1983, this House appoints Mrs Prentice as a member of the Advisory Council on Australian Archives for a period of three years. Order. The question is the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. I ask leave it. I ask leave it the House to move a motion to extend the time for the Committee of Privileges and Members' Interest to present its report on the inquiry into a draft code of conduct for Members of Parliament. Is there any objection to leave being granted? 
There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the time for the Committee of Privileges and Members' Interests to present its report on the inquiry into a draft code of conduct for members of parliament be extended to the end of the budget sittings, 7 July 2011. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the minister for the extension of time to report be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. I have received a letter from the member for Wentworth proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the failure of the government's national broadband network to deliver taxpayers' value for money. I call upon those members who approve the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The member for Wentworth. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Over the last few days, the Prime Minister has regaled us with uh, lessons in economics. Uh, she's talked enthusiastically about the law of supply and demand. She's uh, talked about the virtues of competition and microeconomic reform. And it reminds us, too, of the way in which she described her approach to carefully analysing uh, government policy. We all remember when she was pinged for having uh, opposed any increase in the pension. Uh, she said, well, I look at it this way and that way. I hold it up to the light. I take it away from the light. I look at it from every angle. And that was her defence. So we've had a commitment to a methodical analysis of projects and an apparently a commitment to competition. And yet when we come to the biggest infrastructure project in our nation's history, when we come to the National Broadband Network, $50 billion of investment overall, what we, have, what we have is no scrutiny, no accountability and no competition. The hypocrisy of this government is extraordinary. This is the most extravagant, reckless undertaking of the most reckless and extravagant government we have seen in our lifetimes. This is a government that came into office and said that there would be no infrastructure project undertaken without a rigorous cost-benefit analysis. And a cost-benefit analysis, Mr Speaker, is an exercise that does no more than this. It says, what are we trying to achieve? Well, in this case, we assume it is to ensure that all Australians have access to fast broadband at an affordable price. That's fairly straightforward. And so, having defined the objective, the cost-benefit analysis would then ask the question and, and answer it, what is the most cost-effective way of achieving that objective? That is all that it would do. And of course, that is the vital question. And that is why, indeed, the government, the need for having cost-benefit analyses is the, why the government set up Infrastructure Australia, whose task it is to do exactly that. But in the case of the NBN, we have no investigation by Infrastructure Australia, no cost-benefit analysis, no attempt to seek to answer the question, what is the most cost-effective way of delivering uh, universal and affordable broadband? And of course, we think of the government's apparent commitment to competition and of private ownership and of the power of the market. We've heard a lot over the last few days about the importance of market forces and of the importance of government getting out of the way of private enterprise. We've had a denunciation from the Prime Minister. This must have hurt her to say it, a denunciation of Soviet-style command economics. Uh, and yet here with the NBN, that is precisely what we have. This is going to be a massive government-owned telecommunications monopoly. In an era when, for years, both sides of politics have said telecommunications needs more competition, we are going through the extraordinary process of establishing another government-owned monopoly. And as though we have learnt nothing about economics, instead of ensuring that there is going to be competition with this new government-owned telecommunications company in order to keep prices down, 
the government is legislating and contracting to prevent competition. Now, the wastefulness of this in terms of public expenditure and the absurdity of this in terms of government policy is well illustrated by the position of the pay TV cable network, the hybrid fibre coax network, which currently delivers Foxtel, uh, pay TV, uh, and is owned in large measure by Telstra and also by Optus. It passes about 30 per cent of Australian households. It currently delivers broadband and to some customers voice services. It is capable of delivering broadband at a speed of 100 megabits per second and is using the DOCSIS 3 protocol and is doing so in Melbourne and in other cities where Optus's cable is deployed. It is capable of delivering, in other words, Mr Deputy Speaker, precisely the high-speed broadband service that Senator Conroy tells us will be available through the construction of this fibre to the home NBN. But what are we doing with the hybrid fibre coax network that passes 30 per cent of Australian homes? It is going to be overbuilt by the NBN at the cost of tens of billions of dollars, and it will be prevented by a contract with Telstra and shortly with Optus and by legislation. It will be prevented from competing with the NBN. And the only reason for that prohibition the only reason stated by the NBN, stated by its advisers, uh, Greenhill, Caliburn or indeed McKinsey, the only reason is to protect the economics of the NBN. So this is what it has come to. After years and decades of microeconomic reform, in which both sides of politics have played a constructive role, and we take nothing away from the achievements in terms of microeconomic reform of the Hawke and Keating uh, era. We take nothing away from them on that. They did made great reforms, but now we have this latest Labor government that, far from promoting competition, is actually seeking to stamp it out. And it is not as though it is seeking to protect an existing government monopoly. It is actually spending $50 billion of taxpayers' money to create one. I mean, this is a script, a political nightmare that the most imaginative scriptwriter could not have conceived a few years ago. It, is, it flies in the face of all of the progress towards microeconomic reform in this country, and it will inevitably, inevitably result in higher prices for users of broadband services. I mean, let's be quite clear about this. If the government has a massively overcapitalized telecommunications monopoly. That government will be under pressure to generate revenues for it. And it doesn't matter whether that government is a Labor government or a coalition government. The Department of Finance and the Department of Treasury will be screaming at all of the red ink, screaming at all of the lost investment, and they'll be looking for additional revenue. And that is going to place in inevitable, inexorable pressure on that monopoly to increase its prices. The only thing that could keep that monopoly honest, keep prices low, would be if there were real competition, and the government is doing everything it can to stamp out any fixed-line competition. Now, in terms of the preparedness to allow this massive investment to be scrutinised by or accountable to the parliament, Let's look at what the government has done. Let's look at what the Prime Minister has done, who talks about holding everything up to the light and looking at it this way and looking at it that way. There will be no cost-benefit analysis. There will be no uh, scrutiny or oversight by Infrastructure Australia. We begged and begged and demanded the business case be published, and finally we got a redacted version of it. Uh, we got. Uh, uh, 400 pages business case was, was produced, of which 240 were kept secret. We have had for a century, a century, a public works committee of this parliament, which oversees the public works, the infrastructure 
investments of the Commonwealth. It's been doing that for a century. And only the other day, as a member of the Public Works Committee, we solemnly considered $50 million of investment in garages and training rooms by Defence, by the Army, and heard defence officials describe the cost-benefit analysis they'd undertaken. <laughs> but here, where you have $50 billion, the Public Works Committee, if the government has its way, if the independents in this House let them have their way, will be precluded from examining that investment. And the government has even gone so far as to seek to exempt the NBN from, freedom, from the operation of the freedom of information laws. Never has so much money been spent by a government with so little scrutiny, and the policy it is pursuing is one that is, that is absolutely contrary and flies in the face of all of the economic reforms of the last few decades. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are all committed, every one of us in this House, I believe, to all Australians having access to fast broadband at an affordable price. There is no question that most Australians do have access to fast broadband. There is also no question that many Australians do not, and there are a variety of reasons why they do not, which I won't uh, delay the House with today. A responsible government, a responsible government faced with that challenge, with that reality, would seek to ensure that those areas, whether they be in the bush or whether they be in parts of our big cities that do not have adequate broadband, are brought up to speed literally as quickly as possible. And there will be a variety of means of doing this. This is not a case of one size fits all. Australians do not care what technology delivers them their broadband service. They want to be certain that it works. To paraphrase Deng Xiaoping, and if the foreign minister were here, he could uh, give us the original. <laughs> to paraphrase Deng Xiaoping, it doesn't matter whether it's copper wire, glass fibre, or wireless. As long as it delivers broadband, it works. And that is the fundamental point the government is missing. We are seeing right around the world the explosion of wireless broadband. This is a, re a genuine telecommunications revolution. This year, 2011, will be the first year where there are more wireless enabled. I'm talking about smartphones and iPhones and iPads and devices of that kind. More of those devices sold than devices that are intended to be connected to the internet through a fixed line, such as desktop and laptop computers. That's, that is an extraordinary uh, extraordinary watershed. We see Apple, the leading company in this field, generates three times the revenue from its wireless smartphone tablet type devices than it does from desktops and PCs. Now, this is not to say that wireless is the complete solution, but equally it is naive to imagine that the explosion of wireless services is not going to have an enormous impact on the broadband experience and the broadband future of Australia. And that is why we say, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I say to the House, as someone who has been involved in the technology business for many years, there is nothing more perilous than trying to pick technological winners and putting all your bets on one. And there is nothing more perilous than for governments to do that. The appropriate approach for a government is to identify its policy objective, which is universal, affordable broadband, and then ensure that we deliver that or have it delivered in the most cost-effective way possible. Mm -hmm. And if that means wireless in many areas, in many applications, terrific. If that means upgrading HFC cable, terrific. If that means fibre, that's good too. It does not matter what the channel of communication is. What people want is the outcome. And the, 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 at right at the heart of this, Mr Deputy Speaker, and if I just conclude with this point, right at the heart of us we see the government 
referring to what it claims are the productivity benefits from having fibre to the home. They have not been able to produce, including in, in, uh, in responding to written questions, they have not been able to produce any evidence of productivity benefits from a fibre to the home rollout. There are many benefits from broadband, no question. But there is no evidence that there is a productivity lift in households going from, say, ADSL 2 plus to 100 megabits per second. Indeed, nobody can identify any applications for residential use that would require such high speeds other than, as the Prime Minister said recently, 500 channels of streaming television. Now, whether or not her assessment of the technology is right, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have to ask ourselves whether it is an appropriate allocation of scarce resources, $50 billion, to ensure that every household can stream 500 channels of TV simultaneously into their homes. The Minister for Infrastructure and Transport and Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, we just heard from the person who was appointed by the Leader of the Opposition, quote unquote, to demolish the national broadband network. That is the charter that he was given by the Leader of the Opposition. Because we know that he just spoke about how inadequate current services are. And there's a direct reason for that which is that he was a part of a government that had 20 failed broadband plans in a row. Australia fell behind the rest of the world when it came to broadband. Where did Australia rank when the, those opposite left office for optic fibre penetration against developed countries? Last. Dead, stone, motherless last. How many Australian cities ranked in the top 100 for broadband speeds? How many? None. Not a single one. Where did we rank on broadband speeds? 50th. 50th is where we ranked. As the rest of the world moved past us, the Howard government was frozen in time when it comes, when it comes to dealing with the national broadband network and the needs of tomorrow. And we just heard from uh, the shadow minister, who knows better than he says. He spoke about downloads of television channels. He knows that the national broadband network isn't about downloads. That's just part of it. It's the uploads that will transform the productive capacity of our economy in education, in health, in transport, in all of those areas. The NBN will deliver competition, lower prices and better services. It will bring a stronger and more productive economy—25,000 jobs a year on average. The NBN will generate tens of billion dollars of activity over the life of the project and boost national economic output by some 1.4 per cent. It will transform competition in Australia's telecommunications market. It will drive growth in our regions and overcome the tyranny of distance that exists within Australia, given our, our vast uh, geography and relatively small population, and also our distance from markets in the world. It will give us major economic advantages. But what we see, what we see from those opposite is an extraordinary campaign. We heard it again today, part of the dishonest campaign when it comes to wireless. Uh, he knows that the Gillard government will deliver both fibre to the home for 93 per cent of Australians and next generation fixed wireless and satellite services to remaining areas. We're speeding up next generation wireless so that regional Australia gets faster broadband sooner. NBN Co just last week acquired Spectrum in regional and rural Australia to start building the fixed wireless network. Experts agree that while wireless is one part of the picture, it isn't a substitute for fibre. If you're going to rely on wireless broadband, you need a fibre network to support it, 
and you need a mobile phone tower on every street connected up to each other in a system through the fibre network. That's something, that's something that the member for Wentworth would have an interesting time explaining to his electorate when those towers go up on every corner of every street, because that is the only way that it would work. That's why, that's why the experts all agree with our plan. Google chairman Eric Schmidt said last week, Australia is leading the world in understanding the importance of fibre. This is leadership from Australia. Eric Schmidt, Google chairman. Hugh Bradlow, Telstra's chief technology officer, said in November, could we wait eight years and not require high-speed fixed networks? The answer is no because of the capacity issue. It is simple physics. Fibre can deliver data at the speed of light directly to people's homes in ways that wireless simply cannot. Fibre is the future-proof technology. It's as simple as that. And, and the member for Wentworth actually, I believe, does understand that that is the case. We've had again arguments about value for money and assessments once again. We once again have Infrastructure Australia raised, the body that those opposite oppose being formed and the body that those opposite uh, have uh, continually tried to undermine. NBN, NBN will be value for money. You don't have to take it just from the government and from ministers. The McKinsey KPMG implementation study, with 543 pages of comprehensive financial analysis, was released on the 6th of May. We then had, when we reconvened uh, after the government's re-election uh, in August, we had uh, the call for the corporate plan to be released. Give us the corporate plan, show us what's in it, and then we can make an assessment. Well, we released the corporate plan on the 20th of December. And it found, it found that MBN will be an income generating asset. Like all sound investments, taxpayers will get their investment back in full with interest. A rate of return of 7.04% against an average 10 year bond rate of just 5.39%. The Greenhill Caliburn Review found that the corporate plan is reasonable, commercial, and contained, and I quote, the level of detail and analytical framework that would be expected from a large listed public entity evaluating an investment opportunity of scale. Alan Kohler, editor-in-chief for Business Spectator, had this to say, and I quote, not only will the NBN not be a white elephant, it will almost certainly prove to be a great investment. In fact, without wishing to get carried away, it could represent on its own a huge national savings plan. When it's finished, the asset will be worth several times the government's investment of $27.5 billion. Google Vice President Mr Vint Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet, said this, and I quote, I continue to feel a great deal of envy because in the US our broadband infrastructure is nothing like what Australia has planned. I consider this to be a stunning investment in infrastructure that, in my view, will have very long-term benefit. Now, the fact is that under the MBN plan, Australian taxpayers will own a world-class telecommunications asset. The industry understands, just like the Gillard government does, that the NBN will deliver real competition, lower prices and better broadband services for all Australians, especially in our regions. Certainly, certainly when I've attended as the Infrastructure and Transport Minister international conferences, our plan is highly regarded throughout the Western world. Our competitors, our competitors have taken note that after the sleepy era of those opposite, stuck in the past, 20 failed plans, nothing moving forward, that this government is making Australia competitive once again. Once again. But those opposite, 
those opposite continue, continue to run interference, run opposition, like they do for every single policy initiative of the government. Now, from time to time, uh, oppositions uh, will oppose government initiatives. But this opposition, so frustrated, angry at the loss last August, and we saw it today, the anger, the festering anger there, so, so angry with the Australian people, so angry with the Australian people. And we have it again. We have it again, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So angry they are with the outcome of the election campaign that they have decided to oppose everything. Oppose everything. They are totally divided, totally divided, as we have seen, as we have seen on full public display this week. I mean, the member for Wentworth who went out there and made statements last night on late line that a decent leader of the opposition should have made when he slapped down the comments of the parliamentary secretary to the leader of the opposition. When, when he did that, he did that out of desperation. Because all week, all week, have you noticed how many questions has the member for Wentworth had about the national broadband network or anything else. Indeed, indeed, they see him the Thursday MPI debate out of desperation so that he could make a single contribution to this House. Because everything that they do isn't, isn't determined by the Australian national interests, it's determined by their own internal political machinations. And that's what we've seen this week with the Leader of the Opposition, who is opposed by the member for Wentworth, the mover of this MPI, who is opposed by his own shadow treasurer. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has been busy backgrounding newspapers about uh, shadow cabinet discussions. The uh, shadow finance minister wants the job of the shadow treasurer, who wants the job of the Leader of the Opposition, <laughs> who wants the job of the government. Now, now the, 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 frustration, the frustration which is there which is there. And the, the, uh, the young guns, guns at the back there who yell so loudly, who come up to you in the corridors. I mean, the frustration, you can understand it, with people like the member for McKellar and the member for Menzies occupying the front bench because the Leader of the Opposition says that any day now the government might fall over, which is an excuse, which is an excuse, which is an excuse to keep to the honourable member the shell for Bradfield will there, remain silent. To keep the shell there. That is his excuse. So those opposite feel that frustration. Feel that frustration. But the only problem is that the leader of the opposition has this character flaw. The same people he wants to change their mind and help him form government, he's too busy abusing. He's too busy abusing and denigrating day after day after day. Not just here in Canberra, but they actually get on planes and fly up to electorates in order to abuse the independent <laughs> members of this parliament who they want, who they want to change their mind and swap over and uh, make Tony Abbott prime minister. Well, this is the year in which, uh, in which Tony Abbott uh, enjoys his period as leader of the opposition, because the only question is, will he make it to the winter recess? That's the question because I'm very confident he won't make it to December, to Christmas, when, of course, uh, one of his front benches thinks Parliament's sitting on Christmas Eve this year, the member from McKellar, <laughs> you'll recall. But uh, she'll, be, she'll, be here. she'll be here in Parliament, but uh, the Leader of the Opposition, the leader of the opposition won't, won't be. Because what we have is a dreadful record from the Coalition when it comes to delivering on national broadband. What you have from this government is vision when it comes to delivering on the national broadband network, like we have vision when it comes to delivering infrastructure across the board. This is a government that has doubled the federal roads budget. Doubled the federal roads budget. We have 87 of 120 major projects we've announced underway or complete. 
many of them running ahead of schedule. The Northern Expressway and Port Wakefield Road upgrade in South Australia. The Mandurah Entrance Road in Western Australia opened two months early in October 2010. The Kempsey Bypass, the Kempsey Bypass, on track to be delivered one year early. Those opposite did nothing about it. We provided the funds for it. We're busy building the longest bridge ever built in the history of New South Wales as part of that Kempsey Bypass. We've delivered an investment in rail by lifted by more than tenfold. In our first term, we've rebuilt more than one third of the interstate rail network. As the part of our stimulus plan, as part of our stimulus plan, seat. we've fixed 600 black spots projects. We've completed all 300 projects at high risk level crossings from our investment into boom gates. We have delivered. We have shown that we can deliver on budget and on time. And with the national broadband network, it is the most important infrastructure project to future-proof our economy. They know it. They just didn't have the courage or the vision to do anything about it over, over their 12 long years of office. And now they simply want to wreck the and oppose Honourable rather than Leaders build what the nation needs. Has expired. I call the honourable member for Cowper. Well, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I certainly welcome the opportunity to speak on this very important issue because it's all about allocation of resources efficiently and effectively. And I think all in this House see the need for improvement in broadband services. But the issue is how do you deliver it? Do you deliver it in a way that is efficient and effective and provides a return on investment for taxpayers' funds? Or do you deliver it in a way which is more about PR stunts and about uh, photo opportunities and about an endless waste of taxpayers' money without scrutiny and without reference to economic outcome? Because that is the path that this government is taking us down. And if we go, down to, go back to December 2007, and shortly after Senator Conroy, uh, gave, or certainly Senator Conroy gave a commitment on spending to ABC's late line program. And the senator said, and I'll quote him, he said, we are committed to spending no more than 4.7 billion. That was Labor's commitment on the day we announced the broadband network, and we've never changed it. 4.7 billion was their commitment back in 2000, December 2007. And in just two years, the price of Labor's network didn't go up 100 per cent, didn't go up 200 per cent, it's gone up 1,000 per cent. 1,000 per cent. He's broken his promise to the Australian people not to spend more than $4.7 billion. He's broken that tenfold. And he says, trust me, it'll all work out. Trust me. And, and how do we justify that expenditure when uh, he had to get on the plane with the former Prime Minister and they were in a bit of a jam because commercially they couldn't find it tender at commercial tender, they couldn't find an operator who could make it viable at $4.7 billion. So they needed to have a major announcement. So they said, well, let's, let's come up with something that's truly spectacular, something that will capture people's imagination, not something that's financially viable and not something that's actually going to deliver a return on investment. They come up with an announcement that was going to cloak the fact that they couldn't get a commercial operator to pay $4.7 billion. And so, in the true spirit of Labor, in the true spirit of the nanny state, they blow ten times that figure, ten times that figure in taxpayers' money, purely to provide political cover for their first failed proposal. And it, it seems incredible, Mr. <coughs> Deputy Speaker, that when you look around at what markets are doing, when you look around at what markets are doing, you see a decline in the use of fixed line. And in fact, the Senator Conroy has, for months. In fact, for over a year now, he's been quoting the, the benefits of South Korea, quoting how good the South Korean system is, that it is something we should aspire to. And when the, the Economist's uh, uh, intelligence unit puts out a report and unfavourably compares the Australia's proposed national broadband network, it unfavourably compares that with what's happening in South Korea, he says, well, that's comparing apples with oranges. Apples with oranges. So he, he seeks to compare us with South Korea when it assists his case. And as soon as there is the, the very clear 
uh, differences between the two systems are, are noted, then he seeks to distance himself from that. And it's interesting also to note that in South Korea, the use of wireless is outdoing the use of fixed line by two to one. So rather than looking at the overseas experience and gaining from that, looking out in the market and seeing what the trends are, he decides to dictate a solution. A solution that involves digging up 10.9 million backyards and providing fibre to the premise, whether that is economically justified <coughs> or not. It is all about pursuing a political outcome. And how do you achieve that? You don't achieve that through thorough analysis. You don't achieve that through finding the most efficient way to deliver the service. You achieve that through protecting the, pro the project from scrutiny. You achieve that by denying the productivity, the op productivity Commission the opportunity to investigate the matter. You achieve it by denying the uh, Public Works Committee the opportunity to investigate the matter. You do it by denying the opportunity for uh, documents to be sourced under freedom of information. You would expect that a project that was allegedly a world leader, that it was allegedly going to take this country into the, the 22nd century, you would expect that they would welcome scrutiny. You would expect that they would throw open the doors because this project should stand on its own two feet, Deputy Speaker. But instead, they fear scrutiny. What have they got, that, to, hide? Have they got to hide? Very good, Member for Riverina. What do they have to hide? They fear scrutiny. They fear the fact that the writing is on the wall. Young consumers today they don't want to be plugged into the wall. Young consumers want the flexibility that wireless offers. And that is shown out in markets around the world where we see declines in fixed line telephony, declines in the plug-in mentality to getting the internet where you are and when, when you are, the use of mobile devices. We see a massive shift. And any corporate director of, of operations would be looking at the markets carefully. He would be examining the trends. He'd be trying to anticipate what consumers want. But here we have a government that says, I know what's good for you. I know what the future holds here. We're going to cause you all to have to plug into the wall. Of course there is a use for fibre. It is a very effective medium, but it is just one of a suite of technologies that can deliver the appropriate outcomes for the Australian people. There is no need to dig up every single backyard in Australia to deliver high-speed broadband. There is no need to spend $50 billion. Rather, we should be focusing on fixing up broadband black spots, particularly in regional and rural areas. We should be focusing on the ways in which we can address the shortcomings of the current system. Why is it logical to provide a 100 megabit service throughout Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane to those properties that are already passed by the HFC network that can deliver 100 megabits a second that can deliver 100 megabits a second through DOCSIS 3 already. Why is it a good use of taxpayers' money to just ignore that existing technology? Why is it a good uh, government policy to actually legislate to prevent competition from that alternative medium that could probably provide broadband at a far cheaper cost than could be achieved if you have to dig up every backyard in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane? Absolutely outrageous, Deputy Speaker. Yet this government continues, protected by that veil of secrecy that is the only thing between them and total embarrassment, that veil of secrecy that is protecting this project from the scrutiny that this project rightly deserves. It's protecting this government. We've seen in New South Wales a government in place for 16 years, and they ran on a formula of spin. And you see the New South Wales people's reaction in the long term. They are seeing through the spin. And unfortunately, this government's using the same hymn book. They're, they're adopting exactly the same strategies, and they will fall foul of the Australian people. They will fall foul of the Australian people because this project doesn't stack up. This project is buttressed by anti-competitive measures. We have, we have a uh, Consumer and Competition Act that sees the need for competition as a major way of driving down costs, of providing efficient outcomes to consumers. But when we have this project, the largest infrastructure project in Australia, what do they do? They legislate against competition. They legislate against a driver of cheaper prices and better outcomes for consumers. They legislate to buttress their own political position, which is tenuous indeed. I mean, $50 billion, the largest infrastructure project in the country, and they need to protect it. 
They, they can't champion its virtues. They have to hide it from scrutiny. Deputy Speaker, we have seen endless promises from this government broken. We have seen endless cases of waste and mismanagement, and this is going to be the greatest case of all. We are going to see not just a few stray billion dollars wasted, not just a few stray billion, we are going to see $50 billion wasted and a huge capital loss that will have to be borne by the taxpayer. We are going to see countless opportunities squandered for alternative infrastructure projects because money is being poured down Senator Conroy's budgetary black hole. We see in Tasmania they've had to force people to opt out. With all of the promotion and all of the fanfare over the national broadband network, subscriptions were so, so low they had to encourage people by forcing them, by forcing them into the project. What sort, of, what sort of vendor has to force people to buy their product? Deputy Speaker, the minister responsible is the man who put the con into Conroy, and this project is falling apart like a leper on a trampoline around him. It's an absolute disgrace that they are wasting $50 billion of taxpayers' money. The, anybody, anybody who believes they're going to achieve an IRR of 7 per cent is living in a fool's paradise. The government knows it. They have to protect the project from scrutiny because they know when the facts are on the table, this project just doesn't stack up. I call the honourable member for Greenway. The Deputy Speaker, well, I would like to thank the member for Wentworth because just as the member for Casey, the uh, former shadow minister, gave me the most hilarious laughs during the federal election campaign with this policy, which remains, may I say, still coalition policy today, the member for Wentworth has followed it up with an article in today's Herald where he quotes Deng Xiaoping, no less, headed, let a hundred flowers bloom in broadband field. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, he's taken inspiration from Deng Xiaoping. I do believe he is leading a Maoist-like insurgency against the Leader of the Opposition. We welcome that on, Mr. on this side, Mr Deputy Speaker. And the other thing I would say while we're quoting Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping, what else did he say? What else did he say? Another one of his best quotes. To get rich is glorious. To get rich is glorious. Hardly the man, hardly the man who's going to deliver accessible and affordable broadband for all when he takes inspiration from Deng Xiaoping. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the other things that is so hilarious about, uh, about the article this morning in the Sydney Morning Herald and the member for Wentworth's comments is his assertion that Japan and Korea have shown no significant productivity benefits from having a fibre-to-the-home high-speed broadband network. Well, I think we should give him a hand. I think we should help him pack his Louis Vuitton case and put him on his Learjet, send him to Tokyo, send him to Seoul and see exactly the productivity gains are being made there. And don't take it from me, don't take it from me. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at the ITU and their case study of, of Korea. And they say, well, isn't it amazing that Korea has managed to do so well? In fact, they call Korea an economic miracle in growth thanks to ICT. This is despite the fact that Korea is not demographically suited to have the highest internet penetration in Asia. It's not demographically suited to have uh, the best communications with other countries because they have their own language. And yet they do have such a high rate of productivity growth, Mr Deputy Speaker. And why is that? That is because of their investments over many decades in having high-speed fibre broadband networks. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I continue to be amazed, continue to be amazed by those opposite who somehow think they can wade into this debate and think that it is a question of wireless versus fibre, that somehow fibre is not going to be able to deliver all the solutions that we need. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, as a short lesson, whilst a variety of technologies, as, I, as I've said in this place, a variety of technologies will be employed in order to deliver high-speed broadband, they all require one thing. They require a backbone that will be sufficient to be able to carry all the communications, all the communications on it. And I will quote from the Broadband Commission uh, who presented their case to the UN. 
And they say a high-capacity fibre optic packet transport backbone is the fundamental backbone infrastructure that countries need to deploy the growth in broadband services. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for those who are opposed to the NBN, who continually come in here and say that the government has picked one technology over another, this is an absolute nonsense. Because as anyone will tell you, and as anyone will know, when you go on to many of the of the blogs and other technology websites where intelligent people have been contributing to this debate, they would know that the NBN, a fibre-based NBN back backbone, augments all other technologies because it is a technology-neutral backbone. Nothing is faster than the speed of light. It alone has the capacity to be able to achieve what is absolutely needed to deliver ubiquitous high-speed broadband all around the world. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, you don't need to take, again, you don't need to take it from me. Even at the Comms Alliance, the Comms Alliance conference yesterday, each of, on yesterday and Tuesday, each of NBN Co, Telstra and Optus made this point. They said that wireless broadband and fixed broadbands are complements rather than substitutes to each other. And even Optus went on to say that you might group HSPA with ADSL and LTE with HFC as potential substitutes on a service-by-service -service basis. But there was no wireless technology that could be grouped with GPON, which is the basis of the national broadband network. And again, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have endorsement for what we are doing in this country from people like Eric Schmidt, the former CEO and now executive chairman of Google. And what he has to say is truly instructive. Let me start by saying that Australia is leading the world in understanding the importance of fibre. Your Prime Minister has announced 93 per cent of Australians will have gigabit or equivalent service using fibre and the other 7 per cent will be handled through wireless services of the nature of LTE. And this is important. He goes on to say, this is leadership and again from Australia, which I think is wonderful. That is from Eric Schmidt, one of the leading telco experts and communications experts in the world. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, it continues to also amaze me that uh, the Leader of the Opposition comes in here, comes in this place, not only in this place but publicly, and seems to always have an opinion on a topic that he obviously knows nothing about. And his latest effort over the break, where he was talking about the NBN, this is a special, it's pretty obvious that the main usage for the NBN is going to be internet-based television, video entertainment and gaming. Well, for the Leader of the Opposition to claim that the NBN will be only be used to watch TV and play, ga play games shows just how little he knows about the issue. And um, I couldn't have expressed it better. I mean, we had uh, a lot of people uh, make comments on what he had to say. And I think that this person, uh, one of the letters to the editor in the, in the Herald, captures it perfectly. The complete failure of the Leader of the Opposition to grasp the potential of next generation communications networks is appalling and unbelievably embarrassing for Australia were he to ever become Prime Minister. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself, Mr Deputy Speaker. And while we're on the issue of people who have a very limited understanding of technology, the member for Wentworth during the break was talking about his, uh, his iPad in the Sydney Morning Herald, and he was talking about uh, how good it was and how uh, you, didn't need wi you didn't need a fixed line because he had Wi-Fi. Well, again, a bit of telco 101 here, Mr Deputy Speaker. If you didn't know, Wi-Fi is actually processed through a wireless router, which is in turn connected to a fixed line connection. So, for these people who obviously have no idea, have no idea how the technology works to come in here and start lecturing us about how wireless should be the solution, it absolutely beggars belief. And I'm glad, I'm glad actually, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that um, that the member for, for Ryan is in the chamber because. You know, I always think it's important. Uh, I always find that listening to people, often you learn things in this place. And I've been very interested um, over the past couple of months to hear the member for Ryan talk about uh, a broadband delivery system that she says is happening in Brisbane, thanks to Brisbane City Council. And she says, you know, why do we need why do we need the NBN when we've got this fantastic, this fantastic partnership in Brisbane, which is going through the sewers and is delivering broadband far better than the NBN could ever, ever could? And it was great because she brought it up again on Monday, and the member for Ryan spoke in spoke in uh, the debate on my private members 
motion, and she said the city of Brisbane is delivering this, this being high-speed broadband, to every household and every ratepayer in the city, at no cost to the ratepayer and no cost to the city. Well, I thought that was too good to be true, and guess what? It is! Because yesterday you only had to look at Comms Day. Headline, Brisbane flushes sewer broadband plans. Brisbane City Council has reportedly washed its hands of plans to install a broadband network through its sewer system ahead of the MBN rollout, abandoning its relationship with I3Asia Pacific, the firm that was aiming to splash out $600 million on the scheme. According to the Brisbane Times, Lord Mayor Campbell Newman dumped the project. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for those opposite who have been holding up for so many months that this was a fantastic alternative broadband plan, I'll let that speak for itself, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And yet again, we've had those opposite stand up and say, "No, we need to, we need to let the market in. The market needs to be able to deliver." The member for Wentworth came in here and talked about how. 30 per cent of Australia enjoyed access to a, a, a cable network. Well, that's right, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's 30 per cent. It's a coaxial cable that goes down the eastern seaboard. Don't worry about anyone else. Don't worry about anyone else who can't connect to it. And by the way, by the way, as much as he would like to say that this is a substitute for fibre, another little technology lesson. Cable is the same as spectrum in terms of it being a shared resource. You will never, never get the capacity and speeds that you need for the uploads we need in the 21st century purely on cable. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, yet again, those opposite have come in here, again, purely attached to this policy that's over six months old. They haven't replaced it yet. Regardless of anything else that happens, their policy is to cancel the NBN. Yet again today, we see another appalling attempt to deny young people, to deny regional Australia and to deny the future to young Order. Australians. The Honourable yeah. Member's yeah. time has expired. I call the Honourable Member for Bradfield. Mr Deputy Speaker, the question before the House in this debate this afternoon is a very simple one. Are we getting value for money from the National Broadband Network, or is it a very large expenditure which cannot be justified? To put the question another way, is Labor's plan to spend $50 billion a sensible way to achieve the objectives which are uncontentious between the two sides of this House? It is uncontentious that we need to update and improve our broadband infrastructure. It is uncontentious that Telstra should be structurally separated to address the vertical integration problem. These issues are uncontentious. The issue of contention is whether the plan that Labor is pursuing is a sensible one to achieve policy objectives. And you would not have got a persuasive answer to that, that question from what we've heard this afternoon. The minister told us in wafty general terms that it would transform productivity, but he could not answer the precise question. What can be done for 100 megabits per second that cannot be done for 12 megabits per second or for slower speeds? so as to justify the massive increase in expenditure that is required. He gave us wafty generalisations that fibre was a future-proof technology. And then we heard from uh, the, uh, the second speaker from the government uh, that apparently Google says that the national broadband network is a very good thing. Well, I have no doubt that if you're in the business of delivering internet content, and somebody proposes at their expense to build a brand new network which you can use to deliver more content, that's an attractive proposition. But for those of us who are being asked to foot the bill, and that is every one of us, Mr Deputy Speaker, every Australian taxpayer, we probably want to give this proposition rather more detailed scrutiny. What I want to put to you is that, in fact, this is not good value for money for three fundamental reasons. There's a very large amount of money here at risk for essentially political reasons without the business case having been made out. It's very unclear what public policy problem it's designed to solve, and it's very, very wasteful. This is about politics, Mr Deputy Speaker, if I come to my first proposition. The reason that there is $50 billion proposed to be spent is because Labor got itself into a hole when its policy which it took to the 2007 election, which was to spend $4.7 billion on a fibre-to-the-node network, could not be delivered. The solution 
was political shock and awe. Pull a big number out of the air, $43 billion, be visionary, say that we're now going to deliver fibre to the home. The reason for this was not based upon any analysis of what could incrementally be delivered by fibre to the home over other technologies. It was not based on any analysis of productivity benefits or other specific benefits. It was based upon a political need. And if you look for the evidence of that proposition, look at the business case, Mr Deputy Speaker. $41 billion put at risk, and what do we get for it? A return of 7 per cent. Now, interestingly, Mr Deputy Speaker, the corporate plan of NBN tells us that the company's weighted average cost of capital will be 10 per cent. Let me make a basic proposition of corporate finance. You justify, you determine the value of a project by comparing the return to the cost of capital. Your desire is to have your return exceed your cost of capital. If your return is less than your cost of capital, you are destroying value. You have a project with a negative net present value. That is one of the most fundamental propositions of corporate finance. This project, on the admitted documentation of the National Broadband Network Company, is destroying taxpayers' money. It is claimed to be justified on commercial grounds, but as the corporate plan itself says, no private sector investor would be attracted to this proposition. It is based upon unrealistic assumptions about take-up, and it is driven fundamentally by political motives. And it is perhaps not surprising that a Prime Minister who stood in front of the Australian people in April 2009 and recommended that this would be a first-class investment opportunity for mums and dads is no longer with us, because what an unconscionably misleading thing that was to say. The second problem, Mr Deputy Speaker, which demonstrates why this national broadband network of Labor's is not good value for money for the Australian people. The second problem is there's a real lack of clarity about what public policy problem it's designed to solve. If the problem is that we want to increase broadband penetration, and if you read Minister Conroy's press release put out just before Christmas, in which he said that because the OECD statistics showed that we were 19th in the world for broadband penetration, that added to the case for building the national broadband network. If you believe, therefore, that Minister Conroy is putting to us that the objective of the national broadband network is to drive up broadband penetration, this raises the very obvious question. How is it that building a new network is going to drive up broadband penetration when, by necessity, you are then constrained in your capacity to offer lower prices? As Prime Minister Gillard correctly told the House last year, Australia has the fifth highest broadband prices in the world. What is the most powerful driver to increase broadband penetration? It is reducing broadband prices. When you go back and look at the data, as I have done very carefully, between 2000 and 2005, you saw a very clear relationship when Telstra, then the dominant provider of DSL, dropped its prices, penetration rose. But we now have a policy, Mr Deputy Speaker, under which Labor is spending $41 billion plus additional money. It has said there will be a commercial return on this, and to achieve this return, prices will have to stay high. In fact, the entry-level wholesale price that the NBN will be offering is $24. How does this compare to the band to unconditioned local loop service price, which is presently the basis on which competitive DSL services are offered to the majority of Australian households? That price, Mr Deputy Speaker, is $16. In other words, we are going to see a 50 per cent increase in the basic price, the wholesale price, which is the foundation on which retail prices are built. So Labor's policy does not address the fundamental objective which they say is inherent in the policy of increasing penetration, because in fact you are increasing prices. And perhaps the third reason 
to, which demonstrates beyond doubt, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this is not good value for money, is that this plan will see useful telecommunications infrastructure trashed. The copper network owned by Telstra will be trashed. NBN Co's own corporate plan says that more than one third of customers served by the copper network today can receive 16 megabits per second or more. And yet that infrastructure is simply to be trashed. The HFC network, the hybrid fibre coax network, which today can deliver 100 megabits per second in Melbourne and with simple upgrades can deliver the same speeds in the other four capital cities where the Telstra HFC network operates and the Optus HFC network operates on the same technology. These networks either today or very readily can deliver 100 megabits per second. They too are to be trashed. They are to be thrown away. They are to be squandered. They are to be shut down and we are to be left with a national broadband network which will be a monopoly. Indeed, to support its monopoly status, which Stephen Conroy, the Minister for Broadband and Communications, gleefully goes around reminding us all of, to support the monopoly capacity of the NBN, there will be legislation passed which specifically places impediments in the way of persons proposing to enter the market in competition with the National Broadband Network. This is a prof profound reversal of 20 years of bipartisan telecommunications policy, which has always been underpinned by a commitment to increasing competition in the private market, in the private sector market, so as to stimulate lower prices. We have seen a profound reversal of that policy. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, what we have is a policy which is designed for political reasons, an unconscionably large amount of taxpayers' money at risk with no realistic prospect of a return, a lack of clarity as to what policy problem is being solved and scandalous waste in the destruction of the existing Order. infrastructure. The honourable member's time has expired. I now give the call to the honourable member for Bass. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the motion put forward that uh, we, the Gillard Labor government, have not delivered value for money with the uh, broadband. The motion from Malcolm, Tambl, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, member for Wentworth today, demonstrates the Liberals' lack of understanding when it comes to broadband. And he was not even here to hear his own supporters. Is he out with Joe, sorting out who will be the leader by Easter? Malcolm said last year— The member for Bass ought to know that he ought to refer to colleagues uh, by their title or thank their you. electorate. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the member for Wentworth last year said that 12 megabytes should be enough for anybody. We, the Gillard government, feel that Australians deserve better. Today I want to put on record my absolute support for the National Broadband Network, and let me tell you why. Tasmanians have been putting up with some of the slowest, most expensive broadband in Australia, and the Labor, gov Labor government National Broadband Network is going to put an end to that. I am proud to be part of a government that is putting infrastructure on the agenda. After years and years of neglect by the high taxes, neglect and the, no part and the party of no, we are getting on with the job running the country and preparing for the future. Historically, Tasmania has the lowest proportion of households with broadband of any state and territory—49 per cent, compared with the Australian average of 62 per cent. But the federal Liberals have no plan to bring Tasmania up to speed with the mainland, let alone to give it world-class broadband. Shame. Even the state Liberals in Tasmania know the NBN is crucial. And I think it's high time the high taxes, the party of no, come on board. The NBN is going to transform Tasmania's economy along with the rest of our nation. I cannot overestimate the difference it is going to make to people in my home state. I am lucky that the first NBN services were officially launched in August last year in my electorate in the area of Scottsdale. Stage two includes other areas in my electorate, such as Georgetown. Under our national broadband network, the economy will be strengthened. It is the single 
largest infrastructure investment this nation has ever seen. It will modernise Australia and connect big cities and regional centres. The people in my electorate of Bass are very excited about the NBN. They are excited about the NBN because it will improve business productivity, allow businesses to be competitive on a national and international scale. The only concerns that my office has had about broadband is that constituents wanted to be connected sooner. I have not had complaints about waste of money, waste of taxpayers' dollars, not at all. My constituents know value for money. If those opposite were keen on accountability and value for money, they would have done a cost-benefit analysis of the Adelaide-Darwin Railway, the privatisation of Telstra. Where was the Productivity Commission of the cost-benefit study on that? Where was the, the cost-benefit study on the $10 billion water plan? Did you do a cost-benefit analysis on Opal Regional Broadband Plan? And what about the $11 billion black hole? Because the highest taxing party this nation has ever seen, the party of no, could not add up. The NBN will directly support 25,000 jobs. I ask those opposite to tell me their plans to create 25,000 jobs. I doubt they can. And the party of no, no's alternative, is to have towers, copper, which members of the op opposition have consistently complained about the NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Our plan gives better speed. The amenity of Australia is enhanced by the broadband fibre compared with towers and copper, which is the opposition's plan. The Liberal Party's attitude to the broadband reminds me of the time when the American, Americans were first embracing the Edison telephone system. Sir William Preece, engineer-in-chief of the British Post Office, decided the UK would not need a telephone system as they had a superabundance of messengers and errand boys to run telegrams. Tony Abbott and his colleagues want to send our country backwards by pulling the plug on the NBN. We heard during the election campaign that the NBN would be the first to go if they were elected. Australia is thankful they weren't. Australians can't trust the Liberal Party on broadband. I need a spare set of hands to count how many failed policies they have on broadband. Was it 19 or 20 failed plans? And still no decent policy. Order. It being 4.30, uh, the honourable member for Bass will resume his seat. I would also remind the honourable member for Bass of the provisions of Standing Order 64, and he should refer to the Leader of the Opposition by his title. It being 4.30 p.m., I propose the question that the House do now adjourn. I call the honourable member for Gilmore. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The much-awaited pilot NBN trial at Kaima Downs in Minamurra in my electorate of Gilmore has so far been a trial of deceit, misinformation and dismay of local residents. Kaima Downs and Minamurra are both very significant suburbs in my electorate, and many of its residents attended information days and were excited at the prospect of obtaining broadband where they couldn't access it before. Do you want to speak, or is it my turn? Thank you. There have been many problems and issues local residents have had with the installation, and yet another problem has come to light in the last few days. Perhaps it would be best if I explain the latest debacle with the trial by quoting page 6 of Wednesday, 9 February Australian newspaper. And I quote, Hugo and Olga Arnett live in Kiama Downs on the New South Wales South Coast, one of the five test sites for the government's national broadband network. Having been promised at an information session in August that all cabling would be underground and then gritting their teeth as their front lawn was dug up in September so the conduits could be laid, the Arnott's were stunned when contractors returned to hang cables overhead as well. They went down and up the road with the underground drilling and we thought at least we won't have an ugly cable in front of the house, Mr Arnott said. I couldn't believe my eyes when in January they started to hang an ugly black cable about a metre below the power lines. End of quote. But it's not only Mr and Mrs Arnott who've been duped by MBN. Mrs Lorraine Hardy of Kaima Downs has come to me highly distressed about being told she will have uh, wires on her power poles, which in the past have caught fire owing to salt build-up. And when Mr John Williams of Minamar invited me to his house to inspect NBN's work, I was overwhelmed by the stories from numerous other residents in his neighbourhood that have all been subjected to the same NBN bullying. 
Mr Speaker, most Kiama Minamurra residents have over the last few months watched NBN Company dig up their lawns and drive heavy machinery over their gardens, all for an underground installation of, of an optical fibre network. Despite the continuous digging and despite the big industrial manholes labelled NBN Company now in, in their front lawns, NBN has now gone to the residents demanding that they accept big black cables hanging off their roofs or get nothing. Despite there being completed conduit in the front yards of these houses in Minamar and Kaima Downs, NBN Company has refused to explain why these residents cannot receive an underground installation. All residents get is a final demand, let NBN hang the thick black cables in the air over your property or, I repeat, get nothing. Oh, and as soon as I started to ask questions of the NBN Company, Mr John Williams has been promptly offered an underground connection. Funny thing, that. So this begs the question, if underground installations are possible to the affected houses as shown by the NBN's backflip towards Mr Williams, then why is it dragging residents through this stupidity and arrogance in the first place? I have never seen a government project that has caused so many unnecessary problems. Wait, actually I have. There was the school halls or the BER projects and the Pink Bats program and the housing stimulus debacle, with many of our subcontractors still not having been paid, and that's just to name a few. Shame. I can now see why the NBN is going to cost Australia $50 billion, because the NBN company is going to be digging empty trenches before putting up the NBN up on power poles. Or maybe they have gone beyond the tip point. Is that why they won't answer the questions? One resident, who was again was promised underground, who spoke to me, now has three thick black NBN wires crossing her property, only one of which is hers. One resident has had to have a strengthened support bracket attached to her roof because of the weight and thickness of the black NBN wires that were supposed to be sent underground in the first place. Mr Speaker, this installation of NBN so far has been simply absurd. Last time I raised the issue with my constituents that my constituents were having the NBN uh, problems they were having with the NBN network, Julia Gillard, or the Prime Minister, personally labelled me a Luddite. Well, Prime Minister, you can label me whatever you want, but that's not going to stop me from bringing to her attention the significant flaws with her grand NBN scheme or taking to her any of my constituents' concerns in the future. I just hope the Prime Minister can have the courage this time to actually ask NBN Company just what is going on in my electorate. The member for Wills. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I call on the Victorian Government to make available to the Federal Environment Department all the information it needs to assess whether the introduction of around 400 cattle into Victoria's Alpine National Park has breached the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. It has apparently so far not provided information or explanations about what it is doing to limit the impact of cattle grazing in the Alpine National Park. This is not good enough. It would appear that the Liberal government in Victoria, wagged by the National Party dog, is stalling for time. They know this is a shocker and ultimately it will have to stop. But like the Japanese whaling program, they're simply trying to get away with it for as long as possible. In January, I wrote to the Environment Minister Burke, urging that his department investigate this issue pursuant to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation legislation. I did so following a meeting with the Victorian National Parks Association, which is very concerned that the Victorian state government has introduced cattle grazing into the Alpine National Park. I share the VNPA's concerns about the environmental impact of cattle in this sensitive area. I'm further concerned that the state government seems to be somewhat duplicitous in its handling of this issue, claiming to some people that it's only conducting a trial while saying to others that it's implementing an election commitment. Scientific grazing is as dodgy as the Japanese government's scientific whaling. The use of cattle grazing to reduce fire risk in alpine environments is not supported by science. After the 2003 Alpine fire, a study of the fire by Dr Dick Williams, Dr Ross Bradstock and Dr Henrik Warren, published in 2006, found no statistically significant difference between grazed and ungrazed areas in the proportion of points burnt and concluded that the use of livestock grazing in Australian alpine environments as a fire abatement practice is not justified on scientific grounds. Furthermore, Grazing was not recommended as a strategy by the Victorian Royal Commission into the Black Saturday bushfires. After the 2003 fires, the Howard government gave the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre, the CRC, an extra $3 million for research. The National Party MP Peter McGoran claimed at the time 
uh, press release of 8 September 2004, that the bushfire CRC research will provide a clear indication to the state government that grazing for fuel reduction needs to begin immediately to avoid another bushfire season like last year. No evidence to support the theory that alpine grazing reduces blazing ever emerged from this research. Not a skerrick. Furthermore, if further research is warranted, which is doubtful, there is land outside the Alpine National Park which could be used for this purpose. On the other hand, there is a wealth of evidence over 60 years from the CSIRO, University and other scientists that cattle grazing damages fragile alpine environments, cattle damage soils, spread weeds, trample moss beds and watercourses and threaten rare native flora and fauna. The Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act was enacted to ensure that matters which have real potential to impact on the environment are considered at a national level. There are a number of endangered species and communities listed under the EPBC which could be affected by the introduction of cattle. These include the alpine tree frog, spotted tree frog and a dozen species of EPBC listed flora. The National Parks Association believes, and I agree, that this is a matter which requires investigation. But really, this is not about what the federal government should do, it's about what the state government should do. It should withdraw those cattle. Putting in those cattle was a crude political reward for its supporters. The six so-called research sites, chosen without consulting the Department of Sustainability and Environments or Parks Victoria's own research departments, were chosen so every cattle player would get a prize. Why were no on-site surveys to ascertain the presence of threatened species conducted before the cattle were introduced? Why was no baseline monitoring done for this so-called research program? Mr Speaker, the Alpine National Park is a park, it's not a farm, and the Victorian government needs to respect that. The member for Paterson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Less than two hours' drive from Sydney, you will find a town at the foothills of the magnificent Barrington Tops. The people are friendly, the air is fresh, the cafe food is hot, the beds are comfortable. While you're there, you can learn about cattle or dairy farming, visit the nationally recognised Dungog Film Festival, watch an event at the beautifully manicured showground, buy a new outfit at the boutique or just walk the heritage streets. That little town is called Dungog. This little town is now facing the biggest challenge of its existence because of the actions of or inaction by our state and federal Labor governments. However, the great thing about challenges is they present an opportunity for growth, and I have no doubt we can emerge stronger than ever with the right support. The Dungog business and residential community has been in a flux of turmoil since 2006 when the New South Wales Labor government announced plans to build the $477 million Tilligra Dam just north of the town. Many believe the announcement served only to divert attention away from Milton Orkopoulos, the child sex scandal. It took until November 2010 for the Premier to see sense and cancel the project. This was on the back end of four years of uncertainty and a massive campaign spearheaded by local people themselves. By that time, the state Labor government had already wasted $100 million of taxpayers' money on the project, jeopardised local investment and left a town in limbo regarding its future. Now the people of Dungog have come together to plan on how best to revitalise their home. Their focus on roads, community infrastructure, employment and tourism is supported by the coalition. Other priorities include ensuring hospital and rail services are retained and maintaining Dungog's independent local government status. I was saddened to read that the Dungog Shire Action Initiative felt dismayed after a press conference with Hunter Minister Jodie Mackay in which she suggested that the community was not adequately prepared to work towards revitalisation. Ms Mackay must not have spent much time in Dungog. For in my time as federal member, I have found the people to be some of the most sincere and hard-working I've ever encountered, and it's a shame Ms Mackay had no representative at the community meeting held in Dungog on the 15th of December, where hundreds of people worked together to discuss a renewal plan and suggested dozens of viable, workable solutions. I'm pleased that the state coalition today has pledged $20 million to upgrade Main Road 301 which is desperately needed to kickstart all other areas of the town's renewal. It would be a boost for tourism, business and residents. 
And I've always said that when you build a road, you create a highway to opportunity. On behalf of the Federal Coalition, I re-pledged my own roads package last year, and it remains coalition policy to deliver $20 million to upgrade Main Road 301 and $5 million to fix Main Road 7778 Gresford Road to be delivered in addition to the state funding. Continued health services in the Shire are also vital. That's why, after community consultation, I lobby Federal Health Minister Nicola Roxon to redirect the $7 million she has promised for the GP super clinic in Raymond Terrace and instead invest $3 million in the Health One clinic already planned for Raymond Terrace, with the rest to be split between Madawi, Saltash region and the Dungog area. I urge all, all residents to register and attend the government's consultation meeting on 7 March at Raymond Terrace Bowling Club at 6 o'clock to help convince Ms Roxon to invest in Dungog. Testament to the community's proactive and resilient nature, residents have not waited for a solution from government. Instead, they've organised a community sporting challenge, the GP Stakes, which will raise money to attract a new local practising GP. The target fundraising goal of $20,000 has already been reached thanks to the overwhelming generosity of the local community. This should not be necessary. Former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd promised that when it came to health, the buck would stop with him. Despite this, Dungog has lost a GP and residents have had to fund a public campaign to secure a replacement. It isn't good enough. The Gillard Labor government needs to start a proper dialogue with the community to get the outcomes it well and truly deserves and look forward to working together to achieve the bright future I know is possible. To my Dungog community, I say this. You are not forgotten and you will not be forgotten by either me or the coalition. The member for Fremantle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity to talk about the issues related to the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara and the implications of this conflict for Australia. But first, I thank the member for Page for the notice of motion she put forward on Monday night on this topic, and I thank all members who spoke in support of the motion. I note that the debate has been welcomed by the Australian Western Sahara Association, which will be celebrating Saharawi National Day this Sunday, 27 February. I also want to thank the MUA and the AWU for their efforts to raise awareness of the plight of Western Sahara. That's the kind of broader social and humanitarian engagement that is typical of organised labour in this country, and I applaud it. The Western Sahara is a territory on the northwest coast of Africa bordered by Morocco, Mauritania and Algeria. It is one of 16 remaining United Nations created non-self-governing territories whose status has remained fragile in the aftermath of the colonial empires in Africa. In 1975, the territory then known as Spanish Sahara was divided between Mauritania, which subsequently renounced all claims to it in 1979, and Morocco in a treaty with Franco's Spain that was strongly opposed by the local Sahrawi people and against the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, which all concerned nations had previously agreed to abide by. The ICJ held that while some of the region's tribes had historical ties to Morocco, these were insufficient to establish any tie of territorial sovereignty between the Western Sahara and the Kingdom of Morocco. Furthermore, the court specifically rejected the notion that lands inhabited by nomadic peoples may be acquired on the basis of occupation as terra nullius. This aspect of the ICJ's judgment was quoted by Justice Brennan in the historic Australian High Court decision in Mabo. Finally, the ICJ declared that the Sahrawi population held a right of self-determination and that any proposed solution to the situation had to receive the explicit acceptance of the population. That same year, 1975, Morocco invaded Western Sahara, ignoring the position of the United Nations and many in the international community who favoured a referendum to determine the region's future. Morocco's occupation led to a 16-year war, which ended in 1991, when the UN brokered a ceasefire between Morocco and the Polisario Front and set up a peacekeeping mission, MINURSO, to organise a referendum on self-determination, which has not yet taken place. The two sides remain deadlocked between Morocco's proposal to only grant Western Sahara some autonomy and Polisario's call for a referendum with full independence. This is a deep and protracted conflict, Mr Speaker, though it is little known, and it is a conflict in which certain Australian companies have, one way or another, taken a side. Despite being a poor, sparsely populated place, Western Sahara is rich in minerals and fisheries resources. The Moroccan government controls Western Sahara's coastline and most of its mineral deposits, which includes one of the world's largest exploitable deposits of phosphate, which is used in the production of superphosphate fertilisers. Currently, three Australian companies are importing that phosphate, 
namely West Farmers CSPP in WA, Instatec Pivot in Victoria and Impact Fertilisers in Tasmania. I note that a Norwegian insurance company, KLP, has blacklisted West Farmers on account of its trade with Morocco in phosphate pillaged from Western Sahara. These Australian imports hurt the people of Western Sahara in two ways. First, they effectively condone the circumstances in which the Sahrawi people are deprived of the income from their own natural resources. This, in turn, is an obvious impediment to their push for self-determination and self-sufficiency. Second, there is an implication that by allowing companies to import phosphate into Australia from Western Sahara, Australia is in some way condoning the current Moroccan occupation. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade website notes that given the status of Western Sahara as a non-self-governing territory, there are international law considerations with importing natural resources sourced from the Western Sahara. We recommend that companies seek legal advice before importing such material. Well, speaking of legal advice, Mr Speaker, the former United Nations Legal Counsel, Hans Carell, who incidentally was my ultimate boss for much of the time I worked as a legal officer in the United Nations, advised the Security Council in 2002 in a written opinion on the case of Western Sahara that it is against international law to exploit mineral deposits in non-self-governing territories without the consent of the indigenous people of that territory, and also that wherever such resources are developed, this must only occur for the direct benefit of those people. Neither, neither of these conditions is currently being met. Mr Speaker, I call on members to consider the role of Australian companies in connection with the exploitation and trade of Sahrawi resources and whether this is in keeping with our general commitment as a nation to support self-determination, to oppose oppression and to reject the transgression of fundamental human rights. Well, the question is to the House to now adjourn. The member for Murray. I thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to read um, parts of the contents of a letter I received from Cobram and District Health Services on the, uh, very recently on the problems they are experiencing in providing excellent aged care services for their community. And they write, as an aged care provider who is committed to provision of high quality care, I wish to bring to your urgent attention a matter of critical importance to our aged care industry. Older Australians, the people who have made this country great, are being let down by the federal government's failure to address the funding crisis in aged and community care. As the number of older people have increased over the past decade, funding to meet the real costs of providing services and accommodation has fallen. This year, the increase in subsidies for aged care was only 1.7 per cent, when the cost of living indicators have risen by 2.9 per cent. Utilities in some states have gone up by as much as 10 per cent, and the minimum wage has been lifted by 4.8 per cent. As an aged care provider, we cannot make these numbers work, and older people are the losers. On behalf of older Australians, we welcome the Productivity Commission inquiry into aged care and look forward to working with the government on major reforms. But significant changes take time, and older people don't have that luxury. I couldn't concur more closely with their uh, observations of how hard it is for country uh, community care and aged services, how hard it is for them to survive right now financially. No amount of volunteering and good intentions from a community can cover the costs of extra salary and wages, the higher prices of utilities, the higher prices of calling out medical support. And there is a crisis, in fact, in rural Australia in relation to aged care services being affordable and viable. That's particularly because a lot of these services are very small. And right across my electorate of Murray, I have some 52 towns with less than 1,000 people. And often the distance between those towns is a half an hour plus drive. Many of those very small towns have aged care facilities, and it's not right that they should have those, those closed and have their families have to drive, in fact, hours to a city to try and visit their older family members, their loved ones in their oldest age. But today we also, all of us, I believe, in Parliament, received a begging letter from Alzheimer's Australia, the Victoria Division, and they are stressing the fact that there is, in fact, an epidemic of Alzheimer's disease occurring. There are, in fact, 53 new cases of um, Alzheimer alone or dementia diagnosed in Victoria each day. That's 53, case, 53 cases each day in Victoria, and there are in total some 66,000 people in Victoria suffering from dementia and needing special care. But unfortunately, the uh, Productivity Commission report, which the Kyabram um, service referred to, did not 
in its 42 recommendations once deal with the issue specifically of dementia. We have dementia care needing the highest priority attention across Australia, but we haven't got the Productivity Commission focusing on the issues of dementia and aged care at all. I want to say too that the, not only are staff salaries increasing at a rate that makes it unaffordable for most of my aged care facilities, the point is they have a massive shortage of staff working in aged care as well. And we all know the fact that country students who uh, train to become professionals like the nurses, particularly Division One and Two, are most likely to then practice their skills in the country. If they're born and bred in the country, they work in the country, particularly mature age students who enter nursing uh, when they often need to uh, find an off-farm alternative income. Now, Unfortunately, as we know, this government has been unable to meet the needs of rural students through giving them an appropriate level of support in going to other places like a capital city to train. And only today, two months late, we've been given information about the uh, tertiary hardship support grants of just $3,000. Those $3,000 are meant to extend over the three years of a, an undergrad training. They will help a little, but no way will they compensate for the $20,000 a year that it costs to Member live away from home to study. So I need to remind the government opposite that we have a crisis in aged care. We have a crisis of funds needed that are not being met with the increases in support from this federal government. We've got a crisis in skilled staff being available to work in aged care, and this government is not doing the hard yards to make sure we have a new generation of trained nurses who can afford to train away from home initially, but who will come back to country areas if they've been born and bred Order. there to fill the needs. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. The member for Deakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today I would like to relate to the House yet a, another building the education revolution project that's been opened in my electorate of Deakin. This is uh, a continuing stream of good news projects coming up in the local electorate and there's many more to come. The one today I want to concentrate on was for a school in Ringwood. It's a Catholic school, a small one. It's called Our Ladies of Perpetual Help. It's been a icon in Ringwood for many years, but as I say, it's only a small school and so common to most schools and community infrastructure in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, it is old and outdated. And although part of the school is still quite old, they now have a wonderful new facility there. I had, uh, the, as I say, the great pleasure to attend the opening at the end of last year and what they did on their site, because it was quite constrained, they don't have a lot of space there, so they had to build up and they built a, a building with a new IT centre on the ground floor and new classrooms on the top floor. And for an, I, an IT centre is really a two to three times the size of a normal classroom. Gives the children of the school um, access to an area they didn't have before. The school simply didn't have a place to do that. And also with their, uh, with their funding under the program, they were able to uh, refit their assembly hall and build doors that open up onto the quadrangle to the courtyard of the school. Previously to that, the children had to walk around the side of uh, the hall and go through a very narrow entrance. And if you've got a couple of hundred kids trying to do that at any time, for those of you who've seen it, you'll know it can be quite chaotic. However, the opening day was not chaotic. It was, uh, it was a very good and fun day. And to be able to go there for the opening ceremony and have Father Joe from the church there to officiate and Andrea Lacey, the principal, to, to keep things running, and to hear from not only everyone involved in the project, those who helped design and build, but also the children at the school who'd watched it change every day as the job was done. And every time I'd visited the school over the last, uh, well, over the last year before it opened, uh, there was always something happening there. And there was always kids, as usual, lined up at the fence watching the machines, usually boys, I might add, watching the machines either lift things or take things down. And slowly but surely it started, and then it came on really quickly. And so now the two-storey building is there. Our Ladies was established in 1932, and it's one of the uh, oldest buildings, public buildings, left in Ringwood. Uh, it still looks like a, a very great school uh, from the outside, and I can certainly promise it is a great school from the inside. In particular, I'd like to talk about the design of the building, though, because one of the things that was done in many schools in my electorate 
was we didn't uh, use template designs that were provided by uh, either the state government or Catholic Education Office. There were actually individual designs, and although they took a little bit of time whilst we got the fine details right, the results are now standing there and the uses that the school can put it to are exactly what they want. The second story classrooms are, are truly modern. They're 21st century classrooms. They're not mid-1950s or 60s classrooms. Um, so most of the things at Our Ladies, there's been nothing touched there since 1970, uh, which is a long, long time for any school. Um, there was over 110 people from various trades at different times employed on this project, and although they weren't all there all the time, it was a particularly uh, handy, very handy thing for our local economy because during 2009, when this project was announced, and then into 2010, there was still not a lo lot of work around for local tradespeople or people employed or employed in the construction industry, and they certainly uh, en enjoyed and needed that work that came with a project like this. So I would really like to uh, congratulate the school for the hard work they put in in making the project uh, a better outcome for the school. It'll be there for decades to come, generations to come, and I know the school is growing in its attendance numbers, and with uh, assets like that on the books, I'm sure it's going to get even better. This is a great outcome, as I say, not only for our ladies in Ringwood, but also for the electorate of Deakin as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, 19 years ago, the declaration of Rotary District 9700 Peace Community of Wagga Wagga was made. The Rotarian who came up with the idea of Wagga Wagga being a peace community was Tony Quinlivan of the Karingal Club. His simple idea has today spawned 59 other peace communities in 17 countries. What a fantastic achievement! Peace, what a marvellous ideal! On Sunday, I had the pleasure of attending a special ceremony to commemorate this initiative, which was conducted, appropriately, in Wagga Wagga's Victory Memorial Gardens. This park honours the district's men and women who have fought the good fight in the name of peace over the decades. Representatives from the city's six Rotary Clubs—South Wagga, Sunrise, Wallundry, Murrumbidgee, Karingal and Wagga Wagga were in attendance. Representatives of local high schools told the large gathering of the initiatives being conducted in their schools to encourage peace, including International Awareness Days and anti-bullying measures. Awards to community members were also handed out, with the recipients being Patricia Harrod, Detective Inspector Rod Smith, Carol Gordon and an anonymous uh, person who won the award, who received the award sorry, for, um, uh, who is a youth at risk worker. And, uh, and Lex Bitar, a lifelong educational professional. To think my hometown was the first designated Rotary Peace community in the world makes me feel extremely proud. May the idea spread even Order. further, fostering friendship and hope the world Order. over, and may the spirit of peace pervade the Order. hearts and minds of all. Thank you, it Mr Speaker. Being 5 pm, the debate is interrupted. The House stands adjourned until 10am on Monday.